David Cardoza is with AMP, I believe, so he's good. We just don't want, in case others, an Alec uh, Viberal. Lost out. There were a few consultants added for these presentations, okay. Matt. Very good. Correct. Was Alec is Eric, a... was Eric's call able to hear us? Yep, Eric is able to hear us. I think we may be starting in a few seconds here. We need Tyler still, right? Tyler, are you there? That's not Tyler. I'm here. Oh, you are. Oh, okay. There he is. Hey. Did you paint that, the painting behind you, Tyler? No, no, no. You would see the color going out of the lines and. Oh. <laughs> It's not a fill in the blank, huh? No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All going out of the lines. And... <laughs> they, they it's eat. not a fill in the blank, huh? No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All going out of the lines. And... <laughs> they, they it's eat. not a fill Well, we're getting quite a few folks uh, joining our meeting, huh? Are we ready to go? So I think we should probably get started. Is David uh, doing our app today? I think if we're ready. Let's get started then. Uh, all right, we'll call uh, to order our meeting of Tuesday, April 21st, 2020. Uh, an another meeting done in the uh, with the shroud of the COVID-19 coronavirus hanging over us, which has required that we go to virtual electronic meetings. And I'm gonna ask our assistant city manager, Nat, before we uh, go completely into our agenda, we wanna welcome everyone who's watching this. And would you just remind folks, uh, one, where they can reach us, and then uh, on to watch the meeting, YouTube and AMP, and secondly, how they can participate, please. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the way that uh, members of the public can watch the meeting is on AMP channel 25. There is a 90 second uh, roughly delay on AMP. Um, the preferred method is to go online and watch us at youtube.com backslash city of Monterey, all one word. And that's an approximately no more than 10 second delay uh, to watch that. And throughout the afternoon and evening, we will be opening up public comment. And to make public comment, members of the public can call 831-225-0330 and enter 192-7648-POUND and they'll enter the uh, public, uh, our, our conference line. And to, uh, to raise uh, your hand, members of the public can dial star five, and that will give us an indication that uh, individuals are interested in speaking. Callers will be, on, uh, will be unmuted when it's their turn to speak. And we also ask that the members of the public please turn off their television or computer speakers or go to another room when they're connected by phone so that there isn't any background noise that will cause interference with the broadcast. That's very important. It's like uh, the old days when we called into radio stations. Yes. Turn, turn off the speaker and turn off the TV uh, when, when you're speaking. So uh, we encourage the public to do that. And uh, there is a, a short delay. So uh, we will, uh, it, it, we do encourage people to do follow us on YouTube. Yes, very good. We thank you so much. And so, why don't we, uh, I'm going to ask uh, our acting city clerk, Clementine, to do roll call, please, to introduce the city council. Certainly. Council Member Albert? Muted. <laughs> I see him. I see him, right. Visual, visual counts. <laughs> council Member Hoffa? I'm here. Council Member Smith? I'm here. Councilmember Williamson? Here. Mayor Roberson? Yes, I, I'm here as well. And Councilman Albert's here. Okay. I saw a, a good old fashioned Coke bottle. That, that was really great. What, what was the old slogan for? 
sharing a Coke, I forget. <laughs> it was a, it's, it's a Mexican Coke. We found them and it's, it's, what a surprise to find Mexican Coke in, in the US and they're delicious. Are they different? Yeah, they use um, sugar cane as opposed to that more artificial stuff that we use in the U.S. Got it. Yes, that that uh, corn syrup, huh? Okay. Uh, public comments would be anything not on the agenda. I, I know, that particularly this evening, we'll have a lot of public comment, a lot of public interest, and we're very grateful for that. Yeah, we're all grateful to live in a, a town that has so many caring people. And we're getting a flash on our screen right now, which is impossible to read, but so hopefully it'll settle down. But do we have public comment of anything not on the agenda, not on the agenda tonight or this afternoon? Do we have anyone in the queue? Uh, we don't right now, but we, we should uh, give people just a few moments to... Uh, to call in uh, for, for this period of the public comment. Uh, again, uh, we Matt, have it on Matt, screen. Matt, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you able to stop it from looking like that? I don't even know. It'd be hard for the public to, to, to read that. Oh, you, you can't see the screen. We can see the screen, but it's flashing uh, like if it's in, in flash mode. No, it's There stopped. you go. Thank you. Okay, that's interesting. Not sure what, what happened there, but um, it's uh, on the screen here is uh, the instructions on how to uh, join the call again 831-225-0330 and enter 192-7648 pound to join the public comment. Oh, thank you for doing a visual on that. That really helps. So we mm -hmm. haven't had any public comment. Not Mayor, no public comment yet. Mayor. Okay, why don't we go ahead to consent? We can always pick it up at the end of consent in case someone called in. Mayor, so, I, I have a question, if I may. Yeah, please, Council Member Tyler. I know this isn't the most convenient thing, especially in regards to trying to keep the meeting moving along, but I've heard a lot of feedback from several residents in regards to the way that we've been doing public comments since COVID-19 started and the way it's changed. And so I know that um, the city clerk has been doing a really good job at responding back to individuals that have submitted comments um, for, pu for public comment um, to let them know that they, they would need to call in. Um, but I fear that there's some concern over folks not fully getting that message. And so I'm, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can um, read comments uh, that were submitted for the record so that way people's comments could be shared publicly. Are you speaking about the open mic right now, public comments in general? I mean, I think the most important thing is in regards to the discussion around layoffs, but I think um, public comments in, in general. Got it. Okay. Well, um, we probably got 150 or more, mm -hmm. 200. If you do three minutes apiece, that's 600 minutes. That's 10 hours. Mm -hmm. if, I, so, if I could add, and I don't know if it, it's helpful, um, Council Member Williamson, but uh, the city clerk's office, we responded uh, fairly quickly to each of those comments to remind individuals that we were not going to be reading public comment and that folks had the opportunity to call to provide that feedback. Uh, and we also notified them uh, in the, on the agenda as well that feedback submitted in writing would not be read so that uh, it, it would give folks an opportunity to, to speak again. But if, if that helps. All right, let's proceed. Consent items, uh, did anyone in the public want to pull anything from the consent? And council uh, want to pull anything or have questions about the consent? Yeah, um, excuse me, number three and number four. Sure. You are the last party in the conference. You will hear silence until the conference begins. Uh, Tyler, did you want to go ahead and uh, ask your question about number three, please? 
So I guess I'm still trying to get used to all this technology. Um, and so how many screens do you have going? <laughs> I, have my, I have my phone that has my notes. I have my tablet that has the agenda packet and then the computer. Um, uh, so in regards to number three, so this is um, in regards to us receiving SB1 funding to do uh, some construction on Franklin. And I was hoping that we could receive um, if it maybe just at least the very least a oral report from staff in regards to what the plans are um, for the for the construction and the, and the work to be done um, on Franklin and um, I'll ask my questions up front too mainly being um, what are the plans in regards to bike lanes or making that space more bike friendly and and I I deal with that specifically myself because I live up the hill from where I think the proposed project is going to be. And um, I know that there's not a bike path along that entire space. So I just kind of wanted to see what the plans were and, and, and specifically in regards to um, bicycles. Good. Well, we'll then ask our uh, city manager, Hans Uslar, uh, if you could ask one of your staff members to give us a, a brief summary of the project and answer Tyler's question, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a project that is, uh, as Councilmember Williamson pointed out, part of the SB1 allocation. And SB1 requires us uh, to uh, nominate a project so that uh, there is some accountabilities for the communities that are put, that are beneficiary of the SB1 measure to allocate actually uh, engineering design and the actual work to that pro to that project. So what you're seeing in front of you right now is, is the actual allocation of dedication of a project and the reporting back to the state, which is uh, supervising and implementing SB1. And with that, I turn it over to our uh, esteemed public works director, Steve Whitry, who can talk about the um, uh, details of that project. It is uh, over a thousand feet away from council member or at least 500 feet away from Council, council Member Tyler Williamson's uh, home address. So we are we are safe there that uh, Council Member Williamson can vote on this project as well. And with that, I hand it over to uh, Steve. Thanks, Hans. Uh, so what we have is the, the uh, identification of the street. The limits of the work essentially are from Alvarado Street to Washington Street, uh, that section of downtown. Um, we don't have a firm design for it yet. We do know that the work will at least do an overlay, if not a reconstruction of certain portions. Uh, to be considered for the uh, SB1 funding, you need to do a, an improvement that will last upwards of 20 years, and that, that level of improvement will happen in that area. Um, in terms of the actual configuration for bike lanes, parking, and those kinds of things, those determinations have not been made yet. Uh, we have not done the design yet. We do know the pavement situation will require or at least an overlay, like I said, but the actual configuration, we haven't worked out those details with our traffic engineering firms, or not firm, but Andrea, uh, to make sure we have that uh, multimodal effort to go through there. And so my final question is, I'm assuming this would this project would come back to the council once the uh, final project proposal is prepared? Yeah, so so basically what we're trying to do is identify this for the state to meet our requirements for the SB1 funding. Um, we did this last year, I don't know if you recall, we identified Casa Verde as that project from Highway 1 north to Fremont Street or over to Fremont Street. Um, that design is in the works as well. As we progress the design on Franklin Street, we'll bring it back towards council so they can understand what's happening in that area. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Mayor, I have a question. Dan? Steve? Um, yeah. When it comes to reconstruction, uh, is that uh, is that uh, like materials? So if you're tearing up uh, concrete, you, you lay concrete back down, or asphalt, lay the asphalt back down? Uh, basically, the choice of materials comes to our recommendation. Uh, if we choose to go with a concrete street, we can go back with concrete. If we choose to replace concrete with asphalt, we can do that as well. Um, this particular granting fund doesn't um, require you to stay with a like surface. Um, typically, though, we would stay with a like surface over there. Okay, thank you. Good. Then item number four, again, Tyler, that you... Uh Want to ask a question, or would you like to ask, have the staff give a brief summary? 
Yeah, so I, I talked to Hans about this and, and for the public, this is in regards to um, granting the city manager administrative approval for short-term license agreements. Um, and so I, I'm gonna ask the same question again, just to give context for the public. Um, I, I'm just asked what is happening during COVID-19 that staff feels would be uh, that would be delayed if we wait until council a council meeting for the council to make a determination. This is, um, I think, a, a measure that we are asking council to approve that just reduces administrative burden on staff. Um, we we are very focused on uh, on other priorities. As you know, we have a rent deferral program. We have later on, hopefully, a rent assistance program. And uh, what came to our attention was that someone uh, on on in our uh, some of our tenants, one tenant wanted to rent on a short term basis. Uh, additional space that happens to available be available right now adjacent to their business and in order to make the determination and allow us to say yes go ahead use that um, we we uh, we are suggesting to the council not to go through a four-week process in writing an agenda report in going to the uh, efforts of, of explaining everything to the council and then have the council uh, add this to the to the already uh, strenuous agenda that the council has and uh, these are uh, short-term license agreements not to exceed six months um, they they just allow us to to bypass a, a lengthy approval process because the need is there in this concrete example it's it's uh, it's the need on wharf number two for uh, an operator who right now is uh, out there fishing squid and uh, it will allow us to extend the uh, the space next door to have more capacity and storing bins etc and being available for that again it's it's short term it's month to month it's for a period of up to six months and if it doesn't um, if the council uh, feels it is uh, not appropriate um, the council can directly intervene and we, we bring this item in front of council or you can also say no. We we like to to be involved with those type of decisions as well, and it's it's your pleasure how you want to deal with it. But we as staff feel it it makes uh, us um, more responsive to the need of our tenants and uh, reduces administrative burden in an area where we think we can afford it. All right, Tyler. Anything else? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just. Not, I'm not as sure on that one, and I just kind of want to get a sense of for my colleagues. But I'm not sure if anybody else is feeling any hesitancy with that one. Not that I uh, don't trust staff. I'm just not seeing that as being necessarily something that is um, urgent or or, or an, an emergency per se. And um, I, I do understand and acknowledge, though, the need to to limit an, an administrative burden. But I guess I guess the same could be said on other things. So why aren't we looking at all administrative things? I, I'm just not as comfortable with this item. So I'm, I, I'm interested in hearing from my colleague, uh, Mr. Mayor. May I uh, may I make a yes, comment? Yes, Council Member Ed. Yeah. Before we go to the public, I wanted to make the comment that what I liked about this was it was uh, short term, no more than six months. Um, I think the city manager is in an excellent position to evaluate the merits of the requests that do come in because certainly he would use uh, his staff that's already intimately um, involved in the property management. They know the values. Uh, they could they could quickly get to uh, short term, month to month um, negotiations that won't take on uh, very much time. And I think uh, the example that Hans gave is a is a perfect example of why. Uh, we would want to give him this authority. Uh, one, it's temporary. It's only six months. It's going to be additional revenue to the city of Monterey because it's leased space that's uh, not currently being used. Uh, maybe a, a prop up uh, or pop up business or pop up uh, type of use that's needed. So uh, I don't see any um, downside of it. And I and I think that the judgment of staff would be that. If it gets into the negotiations and it's sticky, then they probably bring it back to the council because they'd realize it's kind of going outside of this realm of short term. Um, and it may be bringing us additional revenue right now, which would be good. All right, any other council input? 
No, did, did we get any public comment on this one, Nat? We have uh, public comment. Uh, I think uh, it's it's hard to tell which item uh, folks are uh, are want to comment on, but uh, it's either general or regular. We can just take one at a time. We have uh, three members of the public who are here. All right. Well, let's find out if uh, <laughs> if uh, it's we we can certainly have general public comment because we said we would, would defer that. And then if someone wants to speak specifically to item four, they can do that as well. Okay. So now Sounds let's uh, go ahead and have uh, have the folks join us. Okay, first one. This one, we'll unmute them. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Nina. This is Nina Beatty. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I did want to comment on item number four. Um, I'm opposed to having um, short-term licenses administratively approved. Um, there are many, uh, it can be put on the consent agenda if it's something to get through quickly, um, such as the example that uh, the city manager gave. Um, but these things should go through the normal process because there are many short-term licenses that could be, or permits that would not be necessarily in the public's interest. And I think that they should be left in the situation that they are now in the process, the, the, um, the, the way it's, they're approved and that the city uh, council reviews these things. Again, the consent agenda is a perfect way to offload things that could be um, quickly dealt with and would require the uh, staff time to do a you know, full agenda report. And if there were, they got it sticky or intensive, then they could cut be delayed to another city council meeting. But um, that's, uh, I just, uh, I hope that you'll keep things as they are now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for that, uh, that feedback. Uh, we'll go on to the next caller. Yes, um, could I ask the council to address if they have been involved with the governor on when we can open Monterey County, considering that our numbers are so low with the COVID virus? Okay. And uh, do you have any other public comment? No, I'd just like the council to address that, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, if uh, <clears throat> our viewer is still on uh, line, um, we can get that information from, well, it, it's a difficult question. It's not one we can answer tonight. First of all, we can't answer it tonight because of the Brown Act, because it's not agendized. But secondly, it's uh, something if our caller could leave a, a contact, we can certainly provide all the information that we have so far with respect to the uh, public health official, Dr. Moreno. I know the governor's come out with sick to the uh, public health official. <laughs> and, uh, the, the governor's come out with a six point plan. The governor just appointed a uh, um, economic recovery business council, which Teddy Ballesteri from Cannery Road Company and chair of the Hospitality Association has been appointed to it. So if someone wants uh, that information, we could give it to them. But at this point, we have no, as a council, any more idea of what's when Governor Newsom is going to open the state as anyone else. So thank you, Nat. And we have another comment. Yes, we do. Uh, I will go ahead and unmute this one. We have two more in the queue. Uh, this one is uh, Esther Malkin. Esther. Hi, I just want to double check that this is working right because I'm watching one thing and I'm hearing another. So <laughs> I had trouble getting in and I just want to make sure that I'm timing correctly when I do want to make public comments. Yep. No, you're in. You're incorrectly. You, you are in the system, and uh, you're broadcasting live. There's a a nine to ten second delay. Okay. So this. So what I'm seeing on video is 
delayed from my phone call. Is that the order that it's in? That's correct. Your phone call is live, and what you see on video on YouTube Live is about a 10-second delay. Okay, I was wondering, and um, just regarding the last public comment, um, I just want to mention that we need to have more testing before we assume that we have low numbers in our county. So that that um, argument that we have low numbers is really only as good as the number of tests we can conduct of COVID. And so that has to be talked about hand in hand. Thank you. Great, right. right. thank you. Okay, we have one more caller. This one is a uh, caller uh, with the last four digits of their phone number is 2915. Go ahead, you may speak. They've been unmuted. Are you there? Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, sorry about that. I I, I didn't realize that you got my yeah. I didn't realize that was me. I, I um I I just have a question about um just public service support about if there's anything within the city leading residents um to um just not not have meetings but have more Zoom meetings just to help each other check in and see how everyone's doing? Is, is there any resources available of just setting up Zoom meetings, Facebook live chats, in any of that? Is, is there any information on just how to gather more online? Okay, thank you for your question. I, I think, Nat, if you don't mind a brief uh, description of what is available. From the city viewpoint at Monterey.org, please. Yes, yes, we do. We do have resources to uh, the different types of virtual programming uh, through our uh, our uh, operation outreach and other other efforts, um, and all of that is described at Monterey.org backslash coronavirus. And uh, we appreciate the feedback. And as we learn more about opportunities to connect with each other through. Uh, tools like Zoom, we'll be sure to, to share that on our website. Good, good, thank you. <clears throat> All right, then, uh, if that was the last public comment, which we appreciate, we're uh, back to item four, and uh, it was a discussion of the uh, city manager having the authority for a short-term rentals. Any other comments on from the council? Yeah, Mira, I have one question for uh, Hans that I just thought of. Yes, Dan. Okay, uh, Hans, um, one of the reasons, I'm assuming that maybe one of the reasons that this particular uh, item is in front of us is because of timing issues in the past. Has there been problems with contracts where you wanted to get the contract established, but you were in between meetings and it was difficult to do that as a timing factor? Is that one of the reasons why uh, you brought it to us now? Yes, uh, absolutely. We uh, It's a timing issue. There's sometimes a, a lot of time pressure behind that if one of the tenants would like to get a quick month-to-month -month, uh, agreement and we are not reacting like any other landlord would react. Uh, and basically, um, we say, okay, sit tight, you know, good idea. Let us go through the motion. And that can take uh, four weeks, that can take six weeks if we don't get to the item uh, as, as we need to get through. So in, in essence, this surfaced right now recently because um, uh, we were asked to rent this out and I wanted to err on the cautious side. I, I felt I had the authority actually to do this right now based on the emergency de declaration as well and do a back end ratification. But I felt like let's bring it up, bring it forward in principle because it's an opportune time to have less bureaucratic uh, review. And I, I, I honestly feel also that by leaving it on a month to month basis and not to exceed six months, uh, there are enough uh, checks and balances in place for the council to consider this proposal. Thank you, Hans. 
No, it might be. I, I can support this. And what I would ask Hans to do in, in his weekly update is just to let us know how many of these requests come forward. And so that would be one way to monitor it. My guess is it's going to be very, very infrequently. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, uh, Council Member Allen. I appreciate your suggestion. Um, I, I think it does make sense um, because in the nature of this crisis that we're in, I, I don't think we want to handcuff or restrict the staff's ability to be responsive. So I think maximum flexibility is really called for. Um, and But on the other hand, I think, at, and the fact that it's only month to month and six month maximum gives me a level of comfort. But I do appreciate your suggestion. I think maybe we should include that in the motion, just that we get um, maybe a monthly update on any of these so that at least we know. Okay, thank you. Any other comment? Could I just add, it, would it be helpful to share that publicly so that it's not just shared with us as a council, but it's also shared with the public? Sure, well, it's being shared with the public right now. Uh, so one comment, Mr. Mayor? Yes, please. Uh, I, I'm gonna support this, but I think that the caveat here is that Hans is placed in um, the staff work in the last paragraph, the last comment, on uh, item page two, uh, he points out that if it's a controversial item, if it's got potential uh, controversial, uh, if it's uh, you know obviously greater issues than the norm, he's bringing it back to the city council. So I trust his judgment. I trust uh, staff's uh, observation of the needs of the market as as it exists. We don't have that many vacancies. And if we were to have something that was vacant that we could help the local job market expand on a short term basis, I'd be all for that. Because if they expand, that means jobs. And that's very important right now is to make sure we're responsive to, uh, in this case, it's the, the local fishing market where squid has started. They're catching it locally. So there's more uh, opportunities for employment and sales. So I, I support it. I, I just want to add one more one more item that is actually pretty regularly coming forward. That is, uh, uh, we have a construction company coming into town with uh, workers for road construction. Uh, we enter also usually into a license agreement for a construction staging site, or if a, a, a construction staging site is needed and we have a site, we enter that as well. So I just want to let you know, give you a flavor of. It's, it's anywhere between construction staging sites to the most current example that I just shared with you about wharf number two. All right, so, okay, good. Uh, Tyler, did, did uh, I'm, I was thinking we go ahead and approve the consent. Uh, did you want to have a separate vote on item four? No, we can go ahead and uh, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, very good answers. And uh, Council Member Tyler, great questions as always, wanting to include the public as much as possible. We appreciate that. So, roll call, please, Clementine. Council Member Albert. I knew I'd be first. Um, yes. <laughs> Council Member Williamson. Yes. Council Member Hoffa. Yes. Council Member Smith. I'm upset I'm last, but yes. It'll be a different order next time. And Mayor <laughs> Roder Roberson? Uh, and yes. And no looking at the screen when you're uh, doing roll call. I'm looking at my list. I have a randomized list. Oh, <laughs> I knew you did. Look at that completely oh, unbiased. Is presenting. How about that? Hey, we're going to go on to uh, the consolidated plan for CDBG Community Development Block Grant. And I actually know that acronym, but I was also have a cheat sheet. Not, not that the city clerk has a cheat sheet, but mine is legitimately a cheat, uh, a, a cheat <laughs> sheet, a cheat sheet. Anyway, uh, I'll stop. And Hans, would you like to introduce our wonderful uh, community development director, and we'll have a presentation. Yes, Mr. Mayor, it's it's a pleasure to introduce uh, to introduce our community <laughs> development director Kimberly Cole. Uh, what we are presenting to you tonight is uh, is a is a change of our um, 
pre-presentation that we gave uh, to the uh, planning commission in 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 a, in a very sensitive way in in one area alone. Uh, it will it is uh, including this presentation one of the key element of our uh, key elements of our COVID-19 response, which is uh, introduced to you about two weeks ago, and we called it the employee, and uh, not the employee, the rental assistance program. And so um, I want to make point that out that uh, we have been working over the past two weeks uh, very diligently on this uh, program uh, and on this agenda item to bring you the, uh, the latest uh, program changes forward and hope that you will approve that uh, suggested plan. With that, I hand it over to, to Kim and ask her to uh, present the um, Community Development Block Grant FY 2024 Consolidated Plan and Fiscal Year 2021 Annual Action Plan. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, as you introduced, um, this evening is a special um, occasion to review our consolidated plan and our annual action plan. And I want to thank Grant Leonard for all of the extra effort he has spent the last two weeks in revising our draft action plan to deal with the emergency of the COVID crisis. And the major change to the draft action plan that was since um, what was presented to our planning commission is a new program for our city um, called emergency housing assistance under CDBG regulations or rental assistance. And our main reason for this change is to prevent homelessness. And how are we accomplishing this goal? Um, is we're changing the program this year and we're looking to suspend the Mr. Fix-It in our home rehabilitation programs and the purchase and resale program. And I'll be describing that in more detail. Um, the consolidated plan is updated every five years. It includes major priority areas um, to improve housing for low-income households, to provide a suitable living environment for all residents, to provide services and projects to support economic activity, and obviously to provide the required planning and administration that is needed for uh, administration of HUD funds. So what are the specifics? Um, the CDBG annual budget, um, it's a one-year plan um, to implement the year one of the city's consolidated plan. It's funded through CDBG funds. And there's really two pots of money. There's entitlement money and program income. Our entitlement income is around, our entitlement um, funds are about $250,000. And this is what most jurisdictions receive um, in the state of California and actually throughout the country. We are unique in that we also receive program income from previous investments that our city council has made. Um, and we receive annually about $800,000 in program income. As I mentioned, much has changed since March 24th of 2020 when the Planning Commission reviewed the plan. The CARES Act was passed by the federal government and employment um, rates are increasing and we obviously are operating in an uncertain future. Um, the, amended, the amended plan reflects the city's focus on emergency housing assistance. So the original budget that we looked at um, is basically in four different um, categories that the Planning Commission reviewed. Um, our planning and administration, our public service grants to our various partners in the nonprofit world that help us with various programs for our low income residents, our public infrastructure program, and our housing and rehab program. And we're basically proposing to eliminate two of those programs, the public infrastructure, the housing rehab, and the purchase and resale program, and to restructure it. Um, and so we're looking at dedicating 66% of our um, anticipated CDBG budget for rental assistance or emergency um, housing payments, and then a little bit for economic development for an emerging program. So the emergency rental assistance um, would be under HUD guidelines available um, to low income renters. They would need to live or work in the city of Monterey. 
it will be very important to document the need and loss of income to those households. And they will need to provide information, a lease and proof of past payments for um, rental verification. The payments under HUD regulations are required to go directly to the landlord. And HUD is stating that there can be no duplication of benefits. So if a household is currently on section eight or additional government as assistance, there's no duplication of benefits. Mm -hmm. And in fact, CDBG has to be used as the last resort. The HUD um, regulations will require a maximum assistance of three months. And we're looking at, um, for 2021 funding, uh, about the $699,000 being dedicated to that effort and the CARES Act funding of $152,000. So total amount of emergency rental assistance available above about $151,000. Um, I think it's important to set expectations up front. Um, if there is extensive administration requirements from HUD on this program. We will need to um, create a complete file for each recep uh, recipient, and we'll need to be able to withstand HUD audits um, or face repayment to HUD um, of those funds. And I need to em uh, emphasize that C CDBG funding is not like other funding. Um, the federal grant is based on reimbursement and program income comes in throughout the year. So as you can imagine, we get program income starting in August, September, October on a monthly basis. Some months are higher than others. And as we spend this money on rental assistance, it will have to be based um, as income is received. Um, the, uh, the actual uh, need is unknown. We anticipate it to be significant as this program is launched. The second program that we're continuing with for our CDBG program is our assistance to public service agencies. And they file applications with the city of Monterey. They go through a competitive review process um, that includes our planning commission, a member from our police department, a member from our planning department. Um, and those applications are um, reviewed and then funding is allocated. In total, we're looking at 138,000 going to these various groups, which is very similar to what has been done in past years. So we will be continuing with that program. The economic development program um, can be grants, loans, or technical assistance. We're putting, uh, suggesting $15,000 in 2021 funding for this program. And I know that HUD, when we spoke to them on the phone, talked about micro businesses and that being able to support um, low income businesses that um, need assistance. So this will be different than maybe other economic assistance programs the city may, council may consider. Planning and administration, um, we're required to monitor and provide technical assistance and to collaborate with other public agencies. We will continue to do that in this program. So what will we be um, foregoing, at least probably for this year, if not next year? Um, we're looking at the infrastructure projects being delayed. They, these projects did go through a competitive process um, and are very good projects, but we're just looking at trying to redirect those monies this year for rental assistance to prevent homelessness. Um, Meals on Wheels on the Monterey Peninsula um, is looking for a refrigeration unit. Veterans Transition Center that's located in Marina. We've had some great partnerships with this group and they were looking for $80,000 for HVAC replacement in um, some affordable housing units. Interim, another great partner. They were looking to install a security system and Community Human Services, $100,000 for the final phase of rehabilitation to an existing youth homeless shelter on Pearl Street. I think it's important to note that we kept these in uh, in the plan as tier two for if some reason the rental rehabil uh, rental assistance program doesn't work as we anticipated, either the need is not as much or something else, we would still be able to fund these, but they we anticipate not funding these this year. And so they're identified as tier two projects in the action plan. 
We're also looking at temporary suspension of programs in order to uh, support rental assistance. That's our home repair program. We have um, a lot of great, um, typically grants that are available for residents. Um, and we're looking at delaying that um, or suspending it for a year. The purchase and resale program, um, last year we were able to purchase two homes and then we rehabilitate them and resell them on the market. Um, we're looking at suspending that program um, in the upcoming year and using that money for rental assistance as well. So the action plan um, has a very rigorous as well a uh, public outreach process that begins all the way back in November and continues through to today. Um, a lot of those deadlines and regulations are established by HUD. Um, so we've had numerous public meetings, especially with our nonprofits and our social service providers on various programs and policies. So with that, um, we are recommending adoption of the consolidated inaction plans and submission to HUD. And I think, and just happy to answer any questions about the restructuring of the program for rental assistance. And we also have Grant Leonard on the phone who can answer questions um, as well. Thank you, that's my presentation. Oh, thank you, Kim. Do we have council questions, please? Uh, yes, Ms. Two. Ms. Mayor, I've got one. Council member Ed, please. Uh, yeah, um, Mr. City Manager, I'm not sure if uh, you want to have Kim answer this, but on the staff report um, on page six, it's got five items that are the following projects were selected for tier two. Uh, the Josephine Kearns Memorial Pool for 63500 That wasn't on your PowerPoint, Kim. Did something change? Did we find the funding to keep that in there? Oh. There was an inadvertently left off, I believe. Okay, so we're still going with what's in the staff report listing the five items. Yes. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. And, and Council, there's one other element you need to be aware of because it has a direct impact on a later um, decision that you may or may not uh, take. Uh, as part of the Mr. Fixit program, we are uh, proposing also to uh, put that position on the layoff list that is managing the Mr. Fixit program and allocating the salary savings into the um, rental assistance program as well. So just to be aware of that, uh, that there is a um, there's a uh, interdependence, interdependence between those. And I'd like you also to notice that we are changing the, um, the terminology from rental assistance program. You heard Kim re, uh, a few times speak about the emergency housing payments, and that goes back to HUD and CDBG as they ask us to keep the terms very clearly. And with that, also you get already a flavor of the um auditing requirements that we are looking forward to work with the hud but they had already in the terminology we have to be very clear and and we will over time uh, eliminate the word rental assistance program and use more and more uh, the term uh, emergency housing payments I, I would have a question uh, we have received a tremendous amount of public comment and emails and I wanted to assure the public that we have received those we have read those uh, that was our reading material for the last three or four days and we did have a couple comments about the fix it Mr. Fix it program or the home repair program and to my question would be do we have any applications for a Mr. Fix it or a home repair that would be considered essential in that it would keep the applicant, it would keep the homeowner in their home. In other words, it's a variation of rental assistance. It's home assistance where it makes a home livable so they don't have to leave it. That's a very good question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I punt it over to Kim Cole and ask her to respond, please. Nice punt. And I'm actually going to need to um, ask Grant Leonard to respond. We do have some applications that were part of this fiscal year that were being reviewed. And um, the exact 
characterization of those I'm not familiar with. Good afternoon, Council. So we had a, a punt and a lateral pass. Yeah, okay, very good. Okay, Grant, score a touchdown for us. Um, so then by the nature of the program, there are some essential grants we give out. Um, one example would be a sewer lateral when that collapses, somebody can't remain in their house because they don't have proper uh, sanitation. Mm -hmm. Another example would be uh, broken windows during a storm that we could help repair or leaky roof. Uh, without the grant program, someone might not be able to make those repairs. Right, and that raises my question with they might not be able to stay in their home. So think about that after we get public comment and, and maybe there's a thought to create a category of essential home repairs to keep people in their homes. And it may that may there aren't any such applications, but there may be some that I feel we don't want to miss. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any public comment? Oh, Mr. Mayor, I had a couple of oh, Alan. We'll go to the yes, floor. please, Alan. Um, first of all, thank you for the staff report. And again, appreciate the creative thinking um, and nimble thinking. Um, I think uh, I've heard from at least one member of the public about the possibility of the city partnering with United Way for the implementation. Is that something that is not feasible given the HUD reporting requirements, or is that something that still could be possibly a direction that uh, we might take um, in the future? Yeah, I, I can take that one, Member Hafa, if you allow me. Um, of course, uh, United Way 211 is an option. However, um, they have never done that before. So this is not in the wheelhouse right now to administer uh, a rental assistance program as it's required by HUD. There are third party uh, agencies out there that are doing this as their day-to-day -day operation. And uh, we, will, uh, we are planning on working with, with those who have, who have experience. Keep in mind um, that if we don't have our bookkeeping in order, and we are not doing a, the correct accounting, the city of Monterey is on the hook for the reimbursement. So in this case with 211, um, this is a, is a very good uh, suggestion. And of course, 211 is at the center of many calls for rental assistance right now. Uh, yet we need to find an agency that can guarantee us that they know what HUD wants and deliver the product. And we have other agencies uh, that, that might be helping us. One of them is the Salvation Army, which does that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. The other one is the, the Housing Authority that could also step up and help us there as well. So I just wanted to, uh, yes, 211 is an option, but we need to find the one that uh, mostly guarantees us that, that we are uh, not on the hook after the rental program has been completed and the bookkeeping fell apart. Okay, great. And then, um Another kind of related idea was the possibility of the city partnering with other cities, pooling our money, and perhaps being able to leverage other private money. Um, do you, in this proposal, is the staff reconsidering that idea, maybe for whatever reason, thinking that's not a way we want to go? Or is it possible that if um, there are other willing partners, you would come back in the future and, and we'd modify this. Absolutely. Uh, again, we are grateful for this uh, proposal that was made to us. And uh, we, we have reached out to uh, cities uh, on the peninsula. I had conversations with, uh, I had um, a, a tele-meeting with two city managers and uh, we, we discussed that option. Um, both cities, uh, are intrigued by our program. Both cities are making part of our program part of their agenda report to propose to the respective councils. Having said that, I tell you that, uh, and these were the cities of Marina and Seaside so far, um, that both cities have plans for their CDBG funding that they are favoring and they are looking at uh, part of this, um, or all of the CDBG funding going into 
small business support because part of CDBG funding is also economic development. And um, again, it will be up to the respective councils who, were in, who are informed about our program and the cornerstones of our program. It's up to their councils to decide how they are distributing their CDBG funds. Now, when we are talking about the city of Monterey funding and we talk about the city of Marina funding, there is a huge delta in money that is available for funding. The city of uh, Marina has around $200,000. And presently, when, when we contacted them about the regional approach, uh, they were uh, so proposing to their city council to spend $100,000 on uh, small business loans and the other $100,000 to be spent on residential uh, support so people who have residences can ask for a loan up to two thousand dollars alone so uh, they, they had similar um, uh, pro uh, programs like I said residential assistance up to two thousand dollars as a loan and the other hundred thousand dollars basically they will distribute to small businesses same in Seaside where they also have uh, suggested uh, uh, su suggested courses of spending that are more focused on the small businesses. Now, the city of Monterey is in the position to say, uh, as you hear later tonight, we will allocate other funds of the parking and the Tideland funds into the small business world. Um, those cities, though, uh, are were very receptive. They will make it part of the speaking points when they talk to their councils. And uh, I will also reach out to the city of Salinas, who got $1.2 million of CDBG funding uh, based on their population needs, and will uh, entertain that regional part with, with that city manager as well. Now, the train has not left the station for regionalization on this, uh, but the bookkeeping has to be very strict for each jurisdiction. So we will continue to explore that. What you do today does not close the door necessarily on regionalization. Okay, that's great. And then my last question is, um, I, I, I'm interested in making an impact. I know we all are. And how do we, I guess it's probably a Kim question. So if we give, you know, somebody some emergency housing assistance, $500, $1,000, whatever it might happen to be, how do we ensure that somebody who doesn't just pay, they we hand that over to their landlord and then a month later while well, they're still in a hall and the landlord evicts them in essence we've just given some money to a landlord but it hasn't really helped keep that person housed is do, do you have any ideas on in the implementation how do we screen people so that we're helping people who really need the help and at the same time, helping people will actually benefit from the help we can offer. Well, I think anybody that um, is in the crisis situation that we're anticipating, that they're not going to be able to make their rental payment, um, that if helping them for three months while they're getting, hopefully the economy is starting to recover at some point, whether that's August or September, and then, you know, giving them a stopgap so they have their home for three months. Uh, maybe the COVID crisis is over. Um, they're just starting back to work. Maybe they are a restaurant worker. And in month one, they won't have saved probably enough money to pay for their rent. So we're trying to give people at least three months. I would like it to be longer, quite frankly, but HUD is very specific that this um, assistance can only be for three months. Kim, I wonder, I wonder if, as part of this program, if we couldn't ask the landlord to sign some statement or some legal document that says if they accept this money, that they won't evict the tenant for six months at least or something, a certain period of time, so that um, because it's possible somebody could be $5,000, $10,000 in arrear on their rent. We pay their landlord an extra $1,000. The landlord says, thank you very much. And then in a couple months, they kick them out. It's just a thought. And it's maybe something, maybe if we go forward with this for, for Chrissy and you to discuss, is there a way for us to kind of get 
some kind of commitment from the landlord that if they're getting some of this, uh, they're getting the assistance as well, really indirectly, that um, it's going to be for a certain period of time. We're protecting the, the tenant for a certain period of time. So we can ex certainly explore that with HUD if that would be um, a possible condition. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And that's those are my questions. Any more questions before we go to the to the uh, public, Danny? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I wanted to bounce back to um, Alan's question about partnerships, which uh, uh, intrigued me. I, I just want to ask a question about the. Um, CDBG funds that are restricted for other use in other cities. Does the, the dollars that we get from HUD, can we share those dollars to other cities? Or are we talking about keeping our city, our, I mean, our funds here, but just working together with other cities, not financially? So we can, yes, it does. We can use the funds for people that live or work in Monterey. So it can be. Eligible. So they could, for example, live in Seaside or they could live in Marina and we can use those funds as long as they work in the city of Monterey. Um, we have had very successful partnerships um, through our CDBG program for programs outside of our city. I think the most successful is Veterans Transition Center. It makes sense like with a homeless provider that is providing a specific service, they don't have to create a separate location in each jurisdiction that they're getting CDBG funds from. And in fact, the Veterans Transition Center has been very successful in getting funds from the County of Monterey, I think the City of Marina, the City of Monterey, as well as building on grants. So we have the ability to use the funds for households outside of our jurisdiction, but they would need to work in the City of Monterey. Yeah, the Veterans, um, Veterans Transition Center is a great example of a of a very successful use of our dollars. Thank you very much. That that answers my question. All right. Anyone else before we go to public comment? Yeah. So I, I did kind of have a question. Or, sorry, I did kind of have a question in regards to the funding because, um, as I understand it, the funds have to be used by uh, residents of the city of Monterey. So it seems like that question is clear. So I won't. Keep pushing that. But, um, Tyler, just to clarify, if I haven't been clear, it doesn't have to be a resident of the city of Monterey. It could be somebody that works here or is a resident. Okay. Um, in the agenda report, it spoke of um, Hotel Pacific funding. And, um, and so I just was hoping that you could describe that for the public in regards to um, how that fits in and is associated with the CDBG funding. Sure. So I mentioned the city receives two types of funds. One is entitlement funds and the second is program income. Entitlement is a direct allocation from the federal government to the city of Monterey on an annual basis. It's dependent on approval of the federal budget. The second part of our um, funding is through program income. And this is based on past city councils investing money, um, for example, um, providing down payment assistance perhaps to a house and as um, that property transfers usually upon passing of that individual we get a lump sum payment at the city of Monterey and between our lump sum payments on our purchase and resale program and revenue from the Hotel Pacific um, that was part of an original um, CDBG investment way back when the hotel was built, we get about $800,000 annually in funds. Now, granted, we expect this year those funds from the um, hotel specific to be much less than they were in the past, but we still expect program income roughly in that $800,000 range. And that's why that comment I made it's very important to understand we are not going to have $800,000 available on August 1st to spend for um, this emergency um, rental assistance. It comes in on a monthly basis, our program income, and we have to balance our books each month. Now, there may be additional regulations coming forth from HUD that might relax that a little bit, 
but at this point, it's important to understand how we raise um, income on a monthly basis. It's on receipts um, received. Okay, and then uh, I had a question in regards to the, excuse me, the economic development um, okay. portion of the funds, the 15K. Um, does that have anything to do with the um, local stimulus program that we're trying to do, or is this a separate pot? And then what does that look like as far as how we're going to distribute those funds? Is that going to come back to the council for uh, for um, for us to look at? Yes, we're going to come back to the council on the specifics of that program. Um, but it would typically be an economic assistance program for low income or benefiting low income households or um, um, various um, economic programs that would do that. It'll be different um, than the economic incentive program you're considering this afternoon with parking and Thailand's funds, which might have much less, well, which will have much less federal restriction on how those um, monies are spent. Thank you. And then um, just kind of a, a random question here. At the bottom of the staff report, there's that little E below the signature, and it lists several different organizations, which I assume that the staff report is shared with them. Yes. Um, um, how, one of the groups on there's this coalition, I'm sorry. Um, the, the housing outreach list, is that an organization or is that a list that we keep internally with the city? It's just a list we keep internally. There's a large number of people that have requested to be part of a group on housing issues. So if you call our housing office and say, I'm interested in learning about various housing programs. And so we we just have this large email list and we email it out to them so people can know things that are, are coming forward. That's awesome. I'm, I'm glad to hear. I just, I, I thought I was assuming and I just wanted to make sure that that was part of the the dialogue for folks that if they wanted to get plugged into that, that they can contact the, the housing department. My last question, or my last, I guess, comment here is, um, I, I appreciate the work that staff has done in order to adjust the funding in regards to the needs. Um, you know, but I think in, uh, another critical part of this larger conversation in regards to housing um, are legal services and supportive services for, for folks that run into issues or conflicts with their landlord or landlords run into conflicts with their, with their tenants. Um, and so um, I, I'm not sure if there's a way that we can figure out an allocation for perhaps echo or legal services for seniors. Um, so that way we make sure that we're touching all elements of um, the spectrum in regards to the issues that we're going to see because of the, of the, of the conflict. So both of those agencies are funded with the public service grants. If you remember that one slide of the $138,000 um, legal services for seniors, as well as um, um, the Echo Fair Housing are both funded. Um, of course, we're not, you know, they're funded at the level that we anticipated, you know, back in November and December when they were applying. And we'll have to see how that goes this coming year based on, you know, the unprecedented situation that we're in. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Uh, Nat, did we get any public comment on this uh, on by phone? or yes, yes, we do. And uh, just reminding folks to, once you've joined the call, please dial star five to raise your hand to join the queue. Uh, the, we have uh, three individuals on the call, including two raised hands. And the uh, first person will be Esther Malkin. Esther. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to start by thanking everyone for the work and put into these um, out of the box thinking ideas. Um, we've been asking for a fund like this to be considered for quite a while now. And um, unfortunately, the COVID situation has. Um, pushed it to the forefront, but regardless how it got there, it's important to think about this as something that needs to be maintained afterwards so that it isn't strictly in place, you know, just for this crisis, because we are always going to have people that are in need or assistance, um, whether it's minor or whether it's more vary. Um, this area has 
a job market of hospitality and retail being a majority of the job sales, which are chronic need low paying jobs. So this is a program that needs to be um, considered as a longer term. One, um, I also want to mention that pulling the funds from multiple cities is a way for us to act as a region. There are some cities in our region that do not get CDBG funds. And therefore, they're going to have renters that might have a, some assistance, but it's going to be minimal. For example, Marina compared to um, ours. Because my understanding from conversations with council members there is that city and Pacific Grove do not get CDBG funds. So um, bringing in Salinas that gets a large amount of CD3G funds was a big get when I had actually positive response from Mayor Gunther and a council member as well as their city manager. So again, um, the other aspect of it is Marina is considering that, that what they're doing as a loan, where my understanding is these CDBG grants would, uh, money would not have to be paid back. And again, it would be a big help to people that don't um, live in Monterey to have access to some funds. And again, as we all know, our region is very small and people cross these borders all the time for work and their residences as soon as their you know, rents change depending on their lease. So I want, I want to really stress that I want this conversation to be um, had in a longer term way and not rush to any decisions. There is some time because the moratorium is giving us the time to explore the possibility of handling this um, in, as a way to prop up our region and not continue on the path that we've been on that has been part of the reason why we're in the situation that we have been for so long with regards to housing. As far as um, benefits to doing it through a United Way, we did have conversations with them and though they might not be set up specifically for rent help, they are set up to do this by uh, pooling the cities. They do a similar situation scenario for Calium already and by using them with their system it would not only help the people that need the, the assistance the most by consolidating where they go for that help but it also frees city staff from having to do a lot of this work. Um, the Salvation Army is uh, it, it does not have a system uh, that... Esther, would you wrap that up for us please? I, Our, I, your three I, minutes is up. I'm sorry I can't I can't hear you guys. I say, Esther, if you will wrap it up, please, we'd yeah, appreciate it. Time, but I'm wasting it on trying to hear you guys, so I'm not quite sure. Um, but anyway, I'll wrap it up, and I'll, I'll just say that, you know, this is a time that, this, that our city can take the lead on partnering with everybody in our region and show that we, we are part of walking the walk when, it, when we say we're in this together, and it's not just a catchphrase that will disappear in a couple of years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Nat, anyone else? On yes, uh, we have a uh, caller 9505, and we will unmute this person. Please announce your name. Hello. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Timothy Barrett, and I, uh, I'd like to express my thanks and my gratitude to you, Mr. Mayor, and to the council members for serving during this unusual and trying time. Thank you so much. Um, and in regard to the HUD program or, or the CDBG program, I also want to thank our city staff for being innovative and in, uh, finding approaches to uh, delegate that money in ways that it can be really beneficial for our city. Um, now, uh, as you may recall, I'm a strong opponent for local economic development. In 2016, I brought a um, National Economic Conference to the City of Monterey that focused exclusively on economic development on a local scale. And I think that given the crisis that we're having now, an economic shutdown, that we really need some innovation and diversification in our economy. And I wish that we had begun this process some years ago because we'd be in a stronger position today. So a strong support for um, the innovations in the CDBG program, but also a reservation 
and a very strong reservation because uh, our population is experiencing dire economic hardship. And I would lament the loss of the Mr. Fix-It program. I personally know several people who are in need of that program. Given the downturn in our economy, homeowners are going to have even greater challenges in maintaining their property. So while I support the economic development and the rental assistance, uh, the economic development program in particular should be one of the main programs of the city of Monterey, because in not dependent specifically on CDBG funds or the law, Mr. Fixing program. Uh, improving our local economic outcomes and our local economic development improves the city's tax base and improves uh, income outcomes for our population. So rather than program, I think this should be a long-term program that's more central to the city. Uh, and I hope that we do not use the next Mr. Fixit program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Timothy. <clears throat> okay. We uh, have our next caller is uh, caller 8558 is their uh, last four digits. It's, uh, my name is Greg Hanlon. And... Uh, I live in uh, 672 Van Buren Circle, and uh, I've been in contact with uh, Grant Leonard and also Fane Wilson, and this is regarding, uh, I guess it, you would call it Mr. Fix-It. Uh, I'm 80 years old and I am disabled. I've lived in my home for 20 years, and uh, I can't handle uh, the steps any longer getting up and down from to my front door so what i need is um an elevator and uh i fall within the guidelines of uh financial guidelines uh for this for this elevator so um when i did see uh, Stane wilson he told me that i needed um six months of a bank statement and I didn't have them, so I, now I have them. But now, uh, two years of past um, IRS statements, and so Alliance on Aging prepares my taxes, but they're not preparing taxes now because, because mm -hmm. of COVID. So um, basically what I'm asking for is that you consider keeping the program you have for people like me that are uh, a low income and want to stay in their home and have an uh, exceptional need for um, something in the way that I do for this um, elevator. So um, I appreciate everything that you've been doing as a council uh, during trying times. And this is trying for all of us, but uh, I really, would like to stay in my home, and uh, I would really like to see you keep uh, the Mr. Fix It uh, and the grant programs uh, that are available um, to the city for people like me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. We did receive your email as well. All right, Ned, anyone else? Yes, uh, we have one more caller. Uh, last four digits is 1703. Please announce your name. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Barbara Meister, uh, Public Affairs Director with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and I too want to thank you, staff and council, for thinking innovatively and creatively about how um, the CDBG funds and other funds can be reallocated in ways that could really shore up um, our businesses and to it's partly another form of economic development to pick up on uh, Mr. Barrett's idea. Um, so I want to commend you for for that innovation. And I also want to commend you for creating the uh, local ordinance, the eviction, moratorium on evictions, and for stretching that to 120 days. I, like Esther Malkin, agree this will give us some time to really see um, when the stay-at-home orders will be modified by the state and county. 
um, those of us in the hospitality industry are working together to try to think and prepare what does reopening look like in a way that will first and foremost be safe for our residents, for our workers, for our employees. Having our employees be whole and when it comes to uh, keeping a roof over their head will be a critical piece of that. Um, I do want to stay involved and, and as you go forward in designing this, and one other suggestion to consider as far as a local provider with experience doing rental assistance is Catholic Charities uh, located there in the Peaside uh, that are worth considering and seeing what expertise they've got uh, for administering these funds as well. So again, thank you, and I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, to creatively design this program in a way that really works for people as well as stretching the dollars uh, as well as thinking about it as a stimulus to help our tourism economy get off the ground again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Barbara. Stay safe and healthy. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We we have uh, some more callers. Uh, just a reminder to folks who would like to speak, please raise your hand by uh, dialing star five and your hand will be raised. Um, we have a caller, we believe, um, doesn't look like their hand is raised, but they've been on the call for a while, so we'll at least unmute them, see if they're interested in speaking. The last four digits is 5863. Oops. Uh, we'll go ahead and do 5863 first, and then 0153. Okay, hello. I hope this is me. Hi, this is Kim. Yes, this is Kelly Morgan, being from Legal Services for Seniors. Great, you're on the call. Welcome. Sorry, this has been a, it's a, a fail. Anyway, I'm, we're from Legal Services for Seniors, and of course, we've been a long time grant team. And thank you. I heard our name along with Project Echo and some of a, a new program. I just wanted to let you know that whatever you think we can do, we really like working for the city. And of course, I, I'm down in the middle of nowhere, so I had to literally walk out of my house to use my phone. Sorry about that. Um, just, give us a, just give me a call. We're happy to help with any other kinds of new fundings or new projects. We all have the same goal, keeping all of our clients in in their homes. And I can let you know that the, it's already started, some of these folks. We have somebody who tried an eviction on a 72-year-old woman. We said you can't do that because of the coverages and the, and the protections from the city of Monterey. So we got a phone call and then a letter from an attorney saying, well, we're not going to sue you for an eviction. We're going to sue you for breach of contract and wait. So they're already trying to get around the protections that the, the state and the city has given. So we're there. Please call on us, and I will hang up before another car comes by. So thank you very much. Call on us for anything you need, and I'll be happy to help. Thanks, Kelly. We appreciate that. Great. Uh, next caller is uh, number 0153. Hi, you're on the call. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. This is Katie Castaño with United Way, Monterey County. And I want to start by thanking you all for thinking regionally and for really getting ahead of this uh, crisis um, in, in terms of the rental assistance, which I think is so needed. And as you've seen from our 211 calls, this is uh, the top need. It continues to be. Um, I would just reiterate uh, support for the idea of going with uh, existing providers. A couple of excellent ones have been mentioned already. Um, and then also really chiming in on Kelly Morgantini's comment, I think there's going to be plenty of need for legal assistance as well. And then finally, I want to just clarify that uh, 211 can be a very helpful um, front end portal for uh, directing people, not only directing them to the resources as we do now, but perhaps doing a pre-screening. Um, and we, uh, we do that um, with another program. And uh, the idea is making it easier for the applicant um, to have 24-7 access to a centralized um, front door for um, entering into a program. You might even want to use multiple providers, which is another reason to have a, a clearinghouse. So I just want to thank you for thinking outside the box and for responding with such courage during this time. Thank you. All right, Katie, all the best to you. Great. Okay, next caller uh, we have here, uh, last four is 8992. 
Welcome to the call. Oh, looks like, uh, hello, are you there? Hi, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You're live with the city of Monterey. <clears throat> Great. Um, my name is Christy Hirsch, and um, I'm calling in regards to the new rental assistance program that you're talking about. Um, I think it's been in the works for a while, and obviously uh, being pushed because of the COVID situation. Um, I know that the person that runs the Jeff Dixit program just found out that the program would be dissolved um, last week. And I feel like it's not fair to not have that person be able to give a presentation about the benefits of that program. Um, the people that are helped by that mostly are elderly, and um, they just don't have the technology capacity to like to call you guys and call into the system and explain how it's helped them. So I really feel like it's a one-sided um, presentation today, and I'd be really sad to vote on something, getting rid or dissolving something, that I feel like not everybody has the full um, the full understanding of. So. Um, Although I do think rental assistance would be a great thing, I'm just not sure that this is um, the money that we should be pulling from. I really think that um, there are so many people that are really in need here right now already in their homes that this uh, Mr. Fix It grant program is really helping. And uh, I really hate to see that dissolve, and especially when the money for um, this new program won't even be available until um, August, and not all of it will be available at the same time. And so I think people will already be, I, I hate to say evicted already, but um, already struggling, and we're not going to be able to help the people immediately. Um, so I think it's a longer conversation, but I think it'd be unfair to vote on something that both sides not have the opportunity to present. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Nat. Who else? All right, um, we have uh, one more, uh, one more caller here. Uh, last four is three seven three one. Hi, welcome on the call. You're with the Monterey City Council. Okay, I don't hear any sound. This person, uh, not sure if they've indicated whether they they want to speak. So if if we don't hear anything from them, I think we can move on and uh, that's it for uh, that's it for the callers okay thanks Nat thanks uh, we'll bring it back to the council I, I'm looking at the clock we're looking at 528 um, and I I think we'll definitely want to go to item six as well because I know we have several people consultants various uh, jurisdictions and which brings to mind this evening, I think we're going to have a tremendous amount of public comment this evening, the greatest in history. And we may um, have to think about limiting three minutes to two minutes. We'll have to just find out what we're looking at, because I could conceivably see us go to midnight or one o'clock and not having council deliberations on those items, just from a sample of this afternoon, where we have so much outstanding public input. So I, I would just simply ask the council to think about that and I'll talk to Nat at the break about managing the evening meeting. So uh, we've had a presentation, are we ready to move on it? The, the thing I would like to do is approve the staff, uh, the consolidated plan, but I would like to add, and I'll, I'll let staff come back with how they would figure this out, um, maintaining some Mr. Fix-It, which would, housing rehabilitation, which will keep people in their homes. And I would leave it in a general statement like that and have them come back and see how that might work out. And is there a second? Are we okay with that? I'll, I'll second that. Uh, and I concur on that second element. I think it's important to stay stay somewhere close to take care of some of those folks. Um, I will support the motion, but I, I just want to be real clear. It, when we say needed to stay in their home, I think it really needs to be absolutely necessary for health or safety. There, there are some, thank you, Ed. I think you're, some, somebody is 
providing feedback there. I don't know. I think there are some of uh, the fixed programs that uh, projects that are nice, they're helpful, yes. but um, they're not necessary. And there are others like the one we heard about in the phone call that are. And so um, I think we want to support the staff in marshalling as much money as they can to address this immediate emergency. But we also want to make sure we don't force somebody out of their home that they that they own if it's needed. So I'm supporting the motion. Uh, I think it's also important for the public to know that this is a one year uh, a plan. So when we come back next year, situations may be different and um, you know we can reallocate money as needed at that time. All right, other comment? Yeah, I, I would just um, like to echo the comments that Holly made earlier from Legal Services for Seniors. I just kind of want to send that message to the general public that there are services out there, whether it be legal services for seniors or Echo Fair Housing, where you should absolutely contact if you're having issues in regards to your rental. Um, an easy way to, to get connected with them is using 211. I'm really appreciative of all the service providers out there that are finding ways to partner and providing services for the community. So I'm just wanting to use this as an opportunity to get that message out there to the general public um, that these services are available and they should utilize them. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor may, I, may, I, may I suggest something maybe? Yes, uh, please. I think uh, staff understands completely the, the sentiment of the council. Um, it would probably be more economic if, if you might consider saying we are reducing the uh, rental assistance program by $100,000, and this goes towards the Mr. Fixit program. Mr. Fixit programs are anywhere between $6,000 uh, to $30,000. Uh, they are not large scale projects. They are like small home improvement, small home repairs. Um, if, we, if that might be a, an option for the council to consider, that gives the clarity that I think council wants staff to come back uh, and um, it would, would uh, eliminate another session about this uh, rental assistance program and Mr. Fixit. We also have a timeliness here with, with, with the CDBG funds. So I'm just, just suggesting that if that is something you may want to consider or not. Yes, well, thank you. I, I was thinking about that as we turned it into HUD. And I, I would say that we, look, we should look at a $50,000 Mr. Fixit program. And because we could always amend it. Is that okay with the uh, seconder? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I concur. Yes, okay. Are we ready for roll call, please? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to I want to make one more comment, please. Yes. Uh, so we were talking about um, possible collaboration with uh, surrounding cities um, with the CDGB. Uh, I'm all in favor of collaborating with uh, our neighbors, and uh, especially it's very attractive when we hear Salinas has a, a large number, but I don't want to do anything that's going to um, create uh, a, another level of bureaucracy inside of uh, two cities or three cities. Uh, I think at this point in time, we need to look in terms of uh, efficiency, speed of operations and the ability to be uh, complying with all of our uh, our HUD reporting. There's enough of a burden for one city to do that, much less trying to combine efforts. So if, if something unfolds and it looks like it works and it makes a great alignment in the view of the city manager, I think it's worth it. But I don't wanna see anything get bogged down because we're trying to force something to work with other partners. Okay, thank you. Are we ready for roll call now? Looks like it. Roll call, please, Clementine. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Albert. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. And that's a yes for me as well. Again, uh, Really excellent presentation, questions, public comment. 
Uh, the next item before we reset, and it is 5.35, so I'm hoping we can maybe do this in about 10 minutes, and that's to adopt a resolution on Forte. We'll go immediately to staff, please, Hans. Mr. Mayor, allow me to say this is a slam dunk, and with that, I give it to Community Development Director Cole. <laughs> oh, the, the sports analogies, huh? Hello, Kim. Hi, yeah. I'm just moving my presentation over here. I'm sorry. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, right now we see you. Hmm. I'm sorry, I've got to do one more thing. Well, I think we're just going to do it from this direction, and I apologize, I can't get the full screen shown. Um, this afternoon, we're presenting the Fort Ord Regional Trail and Greenway Project, and this will be a joint presentation between myself and Stephania Castillo from the Transportation Agency from Monterey County. Kim, I'm um, going to ask that you make it as brief as you can, please. I will. Um, the council is being asked to take three actions um, to uh, determine the final environmental impact report for the FORTAG project is adequate to adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting plan and to adopt the findings for decision. It is a regional trail that starts um, in Marina and loops through the Monterey Peninsula to the city of Monterey. The trail is 16 feet wide as you can see in this graphic. Um, in the city of Monterey um, there's very limited portions. There's the part in the Laguna Grande Park which will help us with some of our Laguna Grande issues that we've been experiencing. There is also a portion that goes through Ryan Ranch that will connect um, Ryan Ranch through our shark fin or Fort Ord property through Delray Oaks. And with that, I'll turn it over to Stephania who can talk briefly about the environmental impacts and mitigations. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. This is Stephania. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, Stephania. Great, perfect. Um, so the if you could advance not the, the slides, a couple slides up. Uh, next one, next. There we go, perfect. Um, oh, just one before. So the um, the environmental impact report um, outlines quite a few impacts, but the majority of the impacts would be to biological resources because the project is going to be going through a lot of parks and, and the open space area in the former Ford Award. Um, aesthetics is also another big um, impact that we have identified in the report. We do have a couple um, bridges and um, under crossings that we want to make sure that those are designed to complement the environment, the surrounding environment. We also have um, impacts and mitigation for public safety and services. So we want to make sure that there are safety features such as lighting, fencing, and that there's also signs to make sure that any users of the trail are safe. Um, hydrology and water quality is another um, one of the big um, impacts that we have. And, and again, that's going to um, be determined on which alternative for the trail is chosen. Um, the mitigation measures to reduce these impacts include um, avoiding or mitigating if avoidance is not possible for biological resources. We have um, the report identifies special status um, and plants and wildlife pre-surveys, as well as best construction management practices and wetland restoration, as well as programs for invasive weave management. Next slide, please. Some of the key concerns that were raised during um, our public outreach for um, the draft EIR were impacts to wildlife and biological resources, lighting impacts, increased bicycle traffic on Angeles Way and the Frog Pond Wetland Preserve, as well as safety and aesthetic impacts at underpasses. So we've incorporate, incorporated all of these concerns into the mitigation measures as well as the project alternatives. Next slide, please. 
And I just want to touch really quickly on some public comment that was received for this specific um, agenda item regarding impacts to regional routes, such as Highway 68 and General Jim Moore. So the trail is completely off road. So there, the trail is not going to impact the capacity of these existing regional routes. And in fact, the the whole purpose of the trail is to provide an alternative for folks traveling from homes to their work bases uh, as an alternative to using their car. So they will be able to bike instead. Next slide, please. Um, the public comment received also asked about um, impacts to other areas outside of the city of Monterey. So I just wanted to clarify that Again, the trail is completely off road, except for a couple key areas where there are cr crossings, such as crossing of Reservation Road and Nanjing Road. And those crossings are predictable and they are at existing intersections. Um, there is a bike bridge proposed across Blanco Road, but again, this does not impact the capacity of those um, existing roads. And again, this project is not fully funded, so as we secure funding, TAMC will make sure to work with each of the jurisdictions to make sure that this project um, is, is um, carried out in collaboration with any future developments. Next slide. And then there are five alternatives um, besides the proposed project that are included and evaluated in the EIR and one of them is, of course, not building the project that is required by state law. The second one is increasing the use of existing roads, again, to minimize um, biological impacts. We also have a alternative to substitute those bridges and under crossings with a great crossings because that would minimize visual impact. And then we have two alternatives that deal specifically with um, comments that we uh, received regarding the frog pond. So we've got a couple options there. One of them is to stay completely outside of the park and have the trail through Caltrans right of way. And that will sum up our presentation this afternoon. Um, we're asking that the city council take action as a responsible agency on these three items. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. All right, thank you, Stephanie and Kim. Uh, questions from the council? The alternative along Canyon Del Rey from the Frog Pond, is, would that be off-road? Because as somebody who's biked through there, Canyon Del Rey is pretty scary to bike on. And it would be really great to have that trail through the Frog Pond. This is Stephanie, I can answer that. So the proposed project does go through the frog pond. It is uh, an alternative that would have the project um, off the frog pond. But, but the, would the alternative be essentially a, like a class three lane along Canyon Del Rey or would it be completely off of Canyon Del Rey? It would be the alternative would be on on Canyon Del Rey Boulevard, but it would be something of more like a protected uh, bike lane. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. May I make a yes, comment? Please. Yeah, Alan, I think you bring up uh, one of the the most difficult pieces of the project uh, because it's coming off of North Fremont. 218 Laguna Grande and connecting to the intercoastal piece. So I think there's still a lot of design options moving forward uh, to navigate through the Del Rio Oaks connection and to get into the frog pond. So I just wanted to make comment that I concur with your pointing it out. And I think there's still a lot of uh, design features that are still yet to come on that side of the uh, beginning at the frog pond. All right, any other council members? Uh, Nat, was there any uh, public comment? Yeah, we have one public comment. And this one uh, comes from a caller with the prefix 869. All right, welcome. Hi, this is Scott Waltz. Hi, this is Scott Waltz. I've been working with Fred Watson on this trail for quite a while. 
In fact, I want to personally thank the city of Monterey because back in December 2015, we spoke with the city's then engineer, Rich Deal. And the city of Monterey has been kind enough to lend him to Tampsy and to head up our project. So, uh, so thank you for that. In all seriousness, uh, I want to say that uh, I think this uh, EIR and the mitigation and monitoring report has been well done and are worth supporting. And just to stress, the aim of this project uh, in terms of serving Monterey would provide a continuous and safe bike and ped route. Uh, one of the plans is, of course, to extend the route that's already running along Fremont, recently built. But from North Monterey at several points, um, out, as has been discussed through Delray Oaks, to the Shark Fin and other Monterey properties on South Boundary Road, and then up across Fort Ord. So we think this is a truly regional project that benefits a number of parties, um, but in those particular ways benefits the city of Monterey. And uh, Fred and I, as advocates for the project, would uh, love to gain your support on approving the EIR and the monitoring report. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is that it, Matt? I'm all yeah, yes. All right, is the council ready to move on this then? I move to approve. Second. <laughs> Discussion? All right, seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Yep. Clementine, roll call. Sorry, I thought I unmuted. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Albert. Yes. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. And yes. So with that, we'll uh, recess and we'll see everybody at seven o'clock.
So here we are at our evening session on April 20th, 2020, to get into a, a very complex, very uh, heartfelt, and perhaps painful and heartbreaking, but on the other hand, going forward, optimistic and working together, uh, we'll come to some solutions. So it's all that. So uh, if you would, we're gonna do the Pledge of Allegiance and I do have a flag. And if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, uh, Clementine, our uh, wonderful city clerk, will you do a roll call so you can introduce our council members? Then, as we go forward, we'll obviously introduce the incredible Monterey staff as they appear. Certainly, Councilmember Albert. He seems to be having technical difficulties and just left the meeting. Hopefully, he will rejoin soon. Councilmember Hoffa. Here. Councilmember Smith. Here. Councilmember Williamson. Here. Mayor Roberson. Yes, and I'm here. Thank you, Clementine. I'm going to ask our very talented assistant city manager, Nat, to explain the format and the protocols of our online meeting, because obviously it's quite different than a normal meeting being in the council chambers and to indicate how the public can participate. So Nat, will you do that, please? Yes, yes, I will, Mayor Riverson. Um, thank you. Uh, for those who are interested in providing public comment during tonight's meeting, uh, we ask that you call uh, our conference line. It's area code 831-225-0330 and enter the code to enter the meeting, which is 192-7648 and pound. Once you enter the conference, you can dial star five to register your request to speak. Callers calling in will automatically be, un, will be muted and they will be unmuted when it's their turn to speak. We also ask that you please turn off your television or computer speakers or go into another room while being connected by phone as any background noise will cause interference with the broadcast. Please also know that uh, youtube.com backslash city of Monterey is the best way to follow today's meeting because that delay is anywhere between eight to 20 seconds versus watching on channel 25, which can be up to a 90 second delay. We'll have this information for you during the public comment period. It'll appear on the screen when the public comment uh, period is open. And again, please call and, and don't forget to dial star five to raise your hand virtually. Thank you. <laughs> Good, thank you. <clears throat> um, do we know, Annette, do we have uh, public comments for, not on the agenda in the queue yet? Uh, you know, we, we do not uh, yet, but uh, what we can do is ask uh, our friends at AMP to go ahead and put uh, the public comment banner up and, uh, and we can maybe take that uh, open public comment maybe after we hear the first item, just for the sake we of experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do that. All right. But, um, We'll go to head then to the uh, public appearance, and that's item seven is the financial report on the coronavirus COVID-19 impacts on the city general fund. And it's uh, this is a report. I think it puts a lot of what we're gonna do for the rest of the evening in context. And who would have thought that we would be having a meeting I'm talking about the fiscal health of the city of Monterey uh, because of a, a virus, the COVID-19, which is really, that's the beast, that's the enemy, that's what's creating so much uh, dishevelment, not only in our, our private lives, but in our public lives. So we've been working on it. I know a lot of uh, states um, 
are talking about getting to back to some kind of normal. Um, a lot of what dictates what we as jurisdictions can do, local jurisdictions, is uh, demanded and through executive orders of the governor. Governor Newsom has laid out a six point plan that would indicate when California, including Monterey, is going to get back to some kind of normality. Today, the Senate passed another bill. It's a, another small business loan bill primarily. And Senators Feinstein and Senators Harris from California, along with Jimmy Panetta, have been lobbying to have included federal assistance to local governments. During the last CARES Act, there was $175 billion distributed to the state, and I believe California got $25 billion of that. And But to qualify for fed, this federal money to help balance budgets for local jurisdictions, it had to be a city of 500,000 or more. Now, I just was watching today that Senator Warner, and he was talking about the fact that he thought the House of Representatives would put in to the new packet assistance to local governments and hopefully small local government, but we don't know. That's again, the uncertainty that we're all facing. We also know that the governor, and I mentioned Lauren's gonna to speak to that, but the governor of California is talking about any cities, or excuse me, businesses of a $5 million gross can have up to a $50,000 sales tax deferral. Well, that would include so many businesses in the city of Monterey, again, being more or less a paradigm of other small cities. So that could be another impact. And we don't know if that's gonna be implemented. The League of California Cities is talking about would the state keep its portion of the sales tax or would it take the entire portion of the sales tax? So that's another question. And I think for me, this is probably the most anxious part of this entire crisis that we're in. And that is, we just don't know. There's so many uncertainties. I think we all like to have a sense of we have a control over our lives and that there's things that we can do. But in a sense, we're at the mercy of the state, we're at the mercy of the federal government, and obviously we're at the mercy of the coronavirus. So that's why we're having this meeting tonight to talk about the repercussions and what can we do to maintain the health and safety of our city staff and our residents and try to get back to some kind of normal, whatever that would look like. So like you, I think about this a lot and I think about people who are out of work. I'm thinking about our, we're a teacher family and the impacts on them, on the parents. We're all thinking about the essential workers. Every time we go to the grocery store, every time we read about hospitals, and uh, public safety or anyone out there providing essential services. And even that's under discussion of what does that exactly mean? So we're all in this together. We're trying to find solutions together as we fight these called COVID-19. Honestly, I just had to put a little uh, introduction in there because I know a lot of us are thinking about this and we're getting bombarded by the news. So if you will make the introductions to the best finance director in the state of California, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I might, I might even add west of the Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, well, I was going to say, Hans, from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Can you beat that one? <laughs> we want to keep it a little longer. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. Uh, you you ex expressed a lot of the the items uh, that will be a centerpiece of several proposals, several agenda reports tonight. Our revenue base has been devastated. Uh, our revenue base suffering a monumental shift. Uh, that uh, that was nowhere to be predicted by anyone. And our revenue base, which is the hospitality industry, has lost 85% of their revenues. Uh, we don't even know if there is 15% of revenues coming in 
uh, through the hospitality industry. So there's a huge paradigm shift right now uh, for us and the city of Monterey enjoys uh, over the past decades and years, uh, even longer, a very successful hospitality industry in our city that affords us the quality of life that we are living right now that we have enjoyed so long. So the COVID-19 pandemic is responsible for what, for what we are facing today. No one else, COVID-19 causes this monumental shift that we are seeing in our revenue sources and that we are seeing also in our normal lives. And as the mayor pointed out so eloquently, we don't even know what the new normal is. Our finance director will now present to you a reoccurring theme, uh, but she will lay the groundwork of the actual challenges that we are facing fiscally. Uh, and as you, as she will tell you, the, fir the, the three and a half months that we are looking in from March 15th to June will have tremendous losses for the city of Monterey. And the word that we are, will be using uh, over the course of the night is devastation. So with that, I am uh, handing it over to, to Lauren to present this agenda report and frame the discussion for later items as well with the data that we can provide you today. Great, thank you, city manager and mayor. I appreciate you opening, sharing with everybody, I think the gravity of the situation and how heavy hearted we are. I also appreciate that you're sharing with everyone in our community, the sense of hope and humanity that we have in working together as a group of people. So with that, I'm going to try to transition to the presentation. Let's see, takes a little skill here. Here we go. Can everybody see this? Yes, we can. Thanks, Nat. <laughs> So this is a presentation, we're gonna keep it brief because I'm just gonna frame the items that are following tonight on the agenda. There's a lot more detail in the staff report and certainly we can answer questions from council or the members of the public. The presentation this afternoon or this evening was opened with the city manager remarks. We're gonna just talk briefly about the health and economic crisis. Importantly is what are the COVID losses? And the emphasis is that it's happening now. These are not just estimates. And I'll talk about that, that it's our reality. Let's also talk about the financial devastation. Like what is the significance and the urgency? What is the degree of what we know and how swiftly do we have to act? And importantly, in good leadership, what are our priorities? What are our strategies? And what are our actions to stay solvent? So the COVID-19, crisis is not only a health crisis, it's an economic crisis. We have spoken to the public about this concept, calling it a black swan event, where it's very high profile, it's very difficult to predict, and it's such a rare event. It's unpredictable make nature makes it very difficult for us to manage and lead, control and forecast. Its implications are far reaching. And because of our economic base here along the peninsula, we strongly feel that the implications will have long-term devastation. I always like to put things in terms of perspective. So when we read the paper, some of these numbers seem so outrageous. It's almost like, what do they even mean? Even for me as a finance doctor and a CPA, I read some of these numbers and they're so incredible. So I created this slide. I think this is, really um, striking. What it shows is the United States unemployment claims filed in comparison with the Great Recession of 2008 and the COVID crisis we're facing today. The Great Recession in two years, two years, 8.6 million unemployment claims filed. COVID-19 in 30 days. 30 days, 22 million unemployment claims filed. That's 13.5% unemployment. Now that just causes us so much pause.
Let's bring it to our home, our town. What are the local impacts? As the city manager and mayor mentioned, hospitality and tourism is the vast predominant economy and sector that we have enjoyed and benefited from and created our quality of life. Globally, 85% reduction, and we feel it here, and I'll go into that. The tourism industry generates at least 35% of our general fund revenues. 62% of measure PNS, 100% of NCIP money, a substantial percentage of Thailand, parking, any revenue source, gas tax, anything that has revenues will be impacted by COVID-19. The shelter in place, the longer it goes on, the more long lasting the financial and economic impacts. We have unemployment here locally and it affects our residents. We have business closures. Worldwide social and economic fundamentals are upending. Crude oil, as you saw on the paper and the news, these fundamentals of economics are upside down. So as a finance director, I think it's important for me to emphasize that these are not assumptions, these are realities. What is happening now? We see real losses now in the general fund. What will happen is a $10 million loss in the general fund in the next three months and in other funds as well. As a matter of perspective, in 2019, in October, which was not far away from now, the city declared a fiscal emergency because we had a deficit to balance our general fund. And now the situation is even worse. What happened now in March, we had TOTs due for the month of January and February. Five operators, two of whom are pretty large, did not pay. We did not receive over $800,000 of revenue. That consists of TOT, which is our hotel tax. That consists of NCIP money, TID money for tourism, and the debt for the conference center, which we call CCFD. That just happened. That's only one transaction, and that's $820,000. What's heavy on my heart and what I've already reached out to the bank with, with the city manager and the assistant city manager, is related to the conference center debt. An amazing project, an amazing collaboration, an amazing facility. $50 million of debt. We have debt due every six months. We have debt due in June and we have debt due in December. We are faced with the grave reality that we cannot pay our debt in December or any time thereafter until we figure out how to fix this problem. We may be facing debt default on that conference center very shortly. Hmm. What's also happening now is the aquarium is closed. They've been very transparent. Their revenue forecasts, their layoffs. Hotels are closed, restaurants are closed, stores are closed. That means no TOT revenue, no sales tax revenues for the city. Property tax. In this staff report, I intentionally did not make any assumptions for property tax. They were due at the beginning of December. We will get the remittance from the county in the next week or so. I really don't know how much the city will receive. How much did people pay? How much were they able to pay, willing to pay? Did they pay? We will find out in the next week. What else is happening now? As the mayor mentioned, the state wanting to provide as much relief across the board as possible, provided small business relief in the form of sales tax, up to $50,000 per business that qualifies. The implications possible to the city of Monterey is a loss of $1.3 million in the first year alone. $1.3 million. The conference center, events are canceled, postponed, no revenue. Sports center is closed. We've issued numerous refunds deservingly, no revenues. Commercial properties, as a form of business support and relief, we have implemented rent deferment. As a form of public relief, we have also given deferment on administrative citations. Because of economic upending, community development building applications have seen a significant decrease and a correlating revenue decrease as well. 
I was asked to put this into perspective and really help people understand what is $10 million. And I was asked to do a line chart, a bar chart, an illustrative chart. And I said, you know, to me, it's pretty simple. In a very short period of only three and a half months, we're going to lose $10 million. I don't think I need a chart for that. I think I just need to put those few words on a slide. That's not even a year. That's not even six months. That's not even nine months. That's only three and a half months. Let's talk high level about key revenues because tonight's agenda is pretty packed. This slide shows some of our key revenues and in red, you could see the degree of loss. So TOT is 28% of our revenue in the general fund. It is our largest revenue, almost grossing 30%. It brings in $23 million in the general fund. And in this three and a half month period, in working with MCCVB, which is very connected with the hospitality industry and trends tourism nationwide, we anticipate a loss of $5.3 million alone, which is 23% loss. Sales tax. The mall is closed. So many general services are closed. Restaurants are closed. Sales tax is 11% of our budget. We anticipate a loss of $1.6 million or 19%. Property tax is 15% of our budget. I really don't know how much that will be. I'll have a better idea at the end of this month and certainly by June when we'll get a full year's worth of revenue. Conference center with the closure, we're anticipating loss of 18%. And Parks and Rec, a great program that brings in revenue to help sustain it, is anticipated to lose 28% of the program revenue or almost $2 million. I did do one slide with a chart. This shows in red the percentage of loss in these major revenues. And as you could see there, in three and a half months, these are double digit losses already. And that's really substantial because if you extrapolate that loss to six months, nine months, or 12 months, it doesn't take a lot to lose a lot of our revenue base. And COVID-19 is happening during a time of the year when we get a lot of high revenues because we're very seasonal between Memorial Day and Labor Day. So this couldn't have come at a worse time if there was ever a good time for COVID. I did another chart. I was asked to show and illustrate what would TOT look like in year two? And this is a Pareta pay, pay chart. I don't think I pronounced that right. But what it does is it's a bar chart that's in descending order. And as you'll see there in fiscal 19, that's the highest TOT revenue. So on the one side of the bar chart is the revenue in millions from zero to 25 million. On the other side of the chart is the percentage, zero to 100%. So in fiscal 19, we had the highest TOT revenue and it starts to decline, right? Because TOT starts to grow historically to where we are today. In fiscal 20, the year we're in, based on the loss of $5.3 million, it's saying that our revenue will be equivalent to the amount it was between fiscal year in 15 and 16. You see how this chart works? That's setting us back almost five years in terms of our operating revenue and therefore our operating costs. That's pretty incredible. If the aquarium is anticipating it'll be closed for the rest of the calendar year, let's just make the same assumption for fiscal 21 TOT revenue. That's the orange column. The orange column is saying, we suppose TOT is gonna be zero between July 1 and December 31, 2020. What does that revenue look like? Well, as I mentioned, because our TOT revenue is seasonally high during May through September, that revenue drops our TOT to 50%. That sets our TOT revenue back to fiscal year 13 standards. And I'm setting the table in terms of the amount of cuts, the amount of operational change, and this paradigm shift that we're looking at. Revenue losses will be long lasting and the impacts will be far reaching. Tourism is a big base for us. How society comes back to life and what is normal. 
how people will feel about social gathering, how people will feel about social distancing will play out in our tourism destination and our restaurants, and it will play out in terms of our revenue. We hope for the best, and I believe that human beings are pretty incredible, but it is a pretty stark reality right now. Let's talk about priorities. I feel very proud to be a part of our leadership team and a proud to be a part of this community. We've been working so hard at the very beginning. I remember the meetings at the beginning of March where we were already diligently talking, so feverishly, so diligently in taking action. It had been clear in our mind then and it's still clear in our mind today what our priorities are. First and foremost, public safety. Serve our residents, save lives. Fix our budget and launch a local economic recovery. Fix our budget. I'm gonna say it real simply. We wanna stay solvent. We wanna avoid bankruptcy. We need to pay our bills and we need to provide public safety. Today and for many days ahead, we're gonna be required to make difficult decisions. And we're gonna to work together in being smart in how we do this and exercise collaboration and grace. Let's talk about and get in front of and have a direct conversation about the Economic Uncertainty Fund because I think it's fair to be reasonable and fair to share what we honestly know. The Rainy Day Fund is what we commonly call it. It's one day money that the city and the council has been so successful in scrolling away half a million at a time, a million at a time. And we have just recently reached our goal of $13.7 million or about 16% of general fund. That's the equivalent of running the city for about two months if we had zero revenue. That's what 16% means. I underscore the next bullet point, which is we need to use this economic uncertainty strategically, carefully, and prudently. We use the word uncertain a lot, and that's why that philosophy is important. We have uncertain times right now, and we are not sure how long the prolonged loss of revenue will be. It is not our recommendation right now to use the rainy day fund as a first action because it took us years to build it. And once we use it, it's gone. We need to protect ourselves against future losses that are yet to unfold. And we need to be able to provide public safety. And we need to take action on matters that are actionable first and foremost before we use this important resource. It will be likely that we use this economic uncertainty, but we need to use it judiciously. So with hope and concerted effort, let's talk about strategies and fixes. Certainly we will be looking at staffing costs as a ser service organization. There's no way around this. We need to look at operational costs, programs and services, and whether or not we can afford to continue at the level we are. We also need to work on revenue opportunities, whether they be one-time grants or ongoing revenues for services, for facilities to incrementally, incrementally dig our way out of this one dollar at a time. We need to look at one-time funding and on the agenda tonight is non-urgent capital projects known as CIP, which is construction and project, or NCIP, the neighborhood community um, projects. And we certainly need to take a jump start on local economic recovery for our businesses and our, for our employees. I'm very proud of, to talk about that later tonight. The city has a legacy in its leadership of innovation and creativity and partnership and this is gonna be another example that in time of crisis, we can offer this up so quickly, so willingly, and so much capability. With that, I conclude my presentation and am available to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you so much, Lauren. You, you presented that extremely well and, and <laughs> It's something we have to hear, so we very much appreciate that. And 
I know as you use the term <clears throat> heavy hearted, all of us share that feeling. Council questions at this point before we get public comment? I have a question for Laura. Yes. Council member Dan, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, I can't remember if it was the last council meeting or not. I, I asked uh, the city manager about the MTC uh, debt and uh, it was mentioned that um, that debt is actually the hotel issue if they can't pay it. And I, and I asked the question, does that mean if the hotels can't pay the debt, then it's the responsibility of the cities. Uh, tonight, I'm hearing that it is the responsibility of the cities. Would you like me to answer now, Mayor? Yes, would you do that, please, Lauren? Thank you. So um, I think it's probably been about three or four weeks ago when we had a first conversation with our legal counsel, Orwick, and our financial advisor, and we're on the call with the bank. I asked this exact question, which is, Uh, Laura, uh, Lauren got muted, Clementine. I'm so sorry. I, I got the wrong person. I'm sorry, Lauren. That's okay. <laughs> Shall I start over? Because I don't know what parts we heard. You said we asked the very same question of our legal counsel, which was, and then you cut out. Okay, wonderful. So I asked the same question, which is, who owes the debt? What is the liability of the city? What recourse do we have? I understand the debt in partnership with the hotels. This debt is really a debt of the hospitality industry. The city is a partner and a conduit to making this happen. We have a reserve of $3 million to help with the December payment, but it is a one-time $3 million, similar to our rainy day fund. The challenges we have, should this go into defect, defect and the consequences to the city could be our debt rating rate would decline pretty severely as one of the consequence. So for us, future debt will cost more. I think that's a peripheral concern. I think the first and foremost concern is the actual payment of the debt um, to the banks because we wanna fulfill our obligations. Okay. Other uh, question from the council? Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor. Barrett, please. Yeah, question, uh, Lauren, if you could just recap where we are in terms of the, uh, what's the amount of the payment again, and what's the duration and the interest rate of the debt service for the CCFD? Oh, we still, I, I don't quote me on this, but we still have about 25 years left on it. It's okay. semi-annual payment, the amount varies because in the first, five years or so, it's pretty stable, 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 and then it jumps up a bit. So, so going into December, it actually starts to increase and it is level. We are going to miss about $1.5 to $2 million in December. So we don't see a way right now, plausibly, for us to fix that. Okay, and, and the other part too is as the interest rates fall in the bond market, are there any opportunities? And I know there's no decision that can be made now, but is there opportunities to restructure that debt to ensure that we increase our ability in years forward if this downturn in the economy lasts for, uh, heaven forbid, two, three, four years, is there a way to refinance that now early in the game before interest rates change on us? Right. So thank you. Um, you know, we did very early outreach to the banks, one, to show our leadership and show our effort in coming forward and being transparent with them. One of the primary reasons is we want to continue to collaborate with the hotel industry as partners to help solve this problem and also to get out in front with the bank to talk about solutions, about terms of restructuring terms of refinancing to make it a win for everybody. Mm -hmm. The good news is that we have enough revenue for the June payment. It's the December payment that we're worried about. Yeah. So we have a little bit of a lead time. The banks across the world are facing the challenge with all their borrowers. 
We are not the only conference center that's facing this debt. So I think we doing early outreach voluntarily, I think is a good indicator that we're here to partner with them and we want to solve it maybe for a way of legal restructuring. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. if, I can give you a number for FY21. Uh, that number is $3.6 million that we that is owed to the CCFD. It's equally split between $1.8 million for principal and $1.8 million for interest. So uh, the bill FY21 for the CCFD is, um, what did I say, $3.6 million. Yep. Uh, Mayor, I have one more question. Uh, well, that's not a question. I just, will we have time in other uh, action items to talk about the local economic recovery plan, Lauren? Yes, Article. that's the fourth item tonight. So we can talk about other, because it's in your report and I have questions on it, so I'll wait. That's an action item tonight. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other uh, questions from the council before we go to public input? All right then, what would I'd like to do is to frame our, our public input of, first of all, for those of you who are new to council meetings, we are discussing item seven, which uh, Lauren so capably just presented to us. If you wanted to talk about the control list and possible layoffs or furloughs, I'm gonna ask you to wait until we get to that item. Please don't do it now. If you want to give input on the neighborhood and community improvement program and CIP programs, again, I ask that you would wait until that agenda item comes up. And then finally, the local economic st stimulus plan, that again will be brought up later. I know it uh, can be a little bit confusing. So what I'm gonna do is ask that those who want to participate and you're certainly welcome. And if, if it's not right now, we will give you ample opportunity when we address those other items. So this would be any public comment specifically about the financial status the financial condition of the city not the other items obviously they are related and i'm anticipating a, a huge amount of public comment this evening and we always welcome that because we very much believe in transparency and public input so i'm going to ask for a two minute time limit and if you will do your best to stay within that because I'm anticipating two, three hours of public comment tonight. I may be wrong, but uh, knowing how involved and caring the community is, I would not be at all surprised. So with that, if you have a comment and what to share about the financial situation of the city only, not the other items, we're going to cue you in and ask that you uh, do your best to stay within our two-minute time limit. Normally, we would do three but I don't think anyone on the council, on the staff, or anyone in the public wants us making a decision at three or four o'clock tomorrow morning. I think you'd like to find out where we're gonna go from here. So with that, we'll ask uh, Nat Roja Nasasera, our wonderful gatekeeper and organizer of this to please go ahead. Okay, very good. Uh, we have a few uh, members of the public on the call. They uh, rose, ro raised their hands uh, earlier. And uh, again, this is for item number seven, fiscal impacts of uh, COVID-19. And we'll start with the caller ending in 1056. Are you there? Okay, I don't hear. I don't hear this individual uh, speaking, so uh, maybe they're on a different uh, calling for another reason. So we'll go to a uh, caller with uh, last four digits, 5745. Five. Are you there? Hi, thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. If you please announce your name, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's Chris, and um, I'm actually calling in to um, make a comment about Lauren's presentation. Um, I know that she had publicly stated that um, there was a possibility that the aquarium 
could be closed um, till the end of the year. Uh, and I know that that obviously hasn't been publicly stated. And um, being obviously in the hospitality industry, um, the employees at the aquarium are being told that they're trying to ramp up for a July 1st date, which um, I guess it doesn't look as bleak as possible. Um, and then also in regards to Monterey and the Monterey County, um, we would be considered, you know, a drive market, which means tourism will come back sooner than larger cities that are having international airports and things like that. So I think that, you know, there should be some um, outlook that, you know, it is not as bleak as um, it looks on paper for us because tourism will bounce back especially for Monterey and the outlying areas of Monterey uh, and with places like Pebble Beach and the Monterey Bay Aquarium, that we should be optimistic that our tourism dollars will come back, QOT will go up, uh, and places like the Conference Center are going to see traffic, uh, and that is going to help um, with the public funds. And that's all I have to say. Great. Our, thank you very much. Our next caller is uh, going to be uh, Esther Malkin. Esther, welcome. Okay, Esther. Hello, can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Yes. Hello? Okay, sorry. Um, I wanted to say that I really appreciate Lauren's um, presentation and her empathy. You can tell that she's very, very heavy hearted in this presentation, and I appreciate the position that she's in. That said, I will say the same thing for, my, for myself as a citizen and a resident. This is heartbreaking to listen to. Sorry. And I really hope that this doesn't turn out as bleak as it is, because it really is very, very sad for so many. And I and I really think that it shows that, um, how we really need to have um, been a little bit more proactive in planning um, and diversifying, just like you would um, in general, but with our our industry here. And, um, you know, one of the main reasons why industries haven't been able to come here is because the cost of living is so high. And it, it brings me no joy whatsoever to tell so many of you that you that have heard me for years say how the housing situation is damaging so much that we're in a situation now that this is going to be, you know, really, really hard for a while on so many fronts that we have to move forward in a smarter way. And if housing is the main reason we can't attract people and businesses to come here, we have to factor that in to our future. And I do not envy any of you in the position that you're in tonight. And thank you for doing the hard work. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Our next caller will be Barbara Meister. Barbara, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Good, good evening. Uh, Barbara Meister, I'm the Public Affairs Director for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And I think, for, I'm assuming Lauren might have misspoke. She said the aquarium wasn't planning to open for the rest of the calendar year. I'm assuming she meant fiscal year, which for you all is the end of June 30th. So. Just to clarify, um, the aquarium is monitoring uh, Governor Newsom's um, plan for reopening. Uh, we are in consultation with Monterey County leadership. We are in consultation and collaboration with you all, the city of Monterey, and with our hospitality partners. Um, we are beginning to think creatively about what would that day look like, because it will come. Uh, I too am saddened by the struggle that we are all collectively facing, but I also want to just share with you we are here to collaborate and partner uh, for that day of reopening, whatever that might be. 
Um, we also, I want to remind people, we do some great networks in this community that we all enjoy locally as do our visitors. Having the wonderful open spaces of beaches and parks uh, for biking, hiking, and the rift trail, uh, those are all assets that are going to serve as well. So I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, as we work through the struggle, and I'm hopeful and confident we'll come out at the other end of the tunnel. Thanks so much. Great. Our next caller uh, will be, I believe, uh, Bob Petty. Bob, are you on the line? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to talk into my computer mic or the telephone. <laughs> telephone. One of the things that one of the things that Lauren mentioned was uh, priorities, and uh, I know you've received uh, oh seventy some letters, including the one I sent in the last two days, uh, with regard to the library as a priority. And speaking in terms of finances, while the library isn't a big uh, provider of revenue to the city, uh, I think that, and I'm sure you will, but I just wanted to mention, taking into account what it costs to operate a library versus uh, maybe one of the other sources that might provide more revenue but cost more to do it. And this, of course, says nothing about the sentiment expressed by around 70 letters that I know you received in the last two days from children up to retirees, from professional organizations, all pointing out the uh, priority that a library serves and I would say almost an essential priority in a community, especially one that uh, has the values that Monterey claims to have. And so I will let other people take up more time, but I want to look at both sides of the coin, both the revenue and the, what the what priority means. And it means a lot more than dollars and cents. I realize you have to have dollars and cents in order to operate anything, but uh, it may uh, maybe there's a balancing act. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I believe uh, if uh, there's a few more people on the call, but they haven't raised their hand, which is must raise your hand, dial star five if you'd like to speak on this item. Uh, this is, again, fiscal impacts of COVID-19. So uh, we do have a call coming in here from Kevin Dayton. Kevin, you're on the line. Thank you. Hello, Monterey City Council. I've been watching this, and uh, uh, boy, it's hard to keep spirits up about seeing this. Uh, but I want to remind the public and you that the city of Monterey and the Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, of which I'm a government affairs liaison, uh, has an active COVID-19 business action and economic recovery team. I personally believe that this uh, team is doing an excellent, superior job, especially for a city of just 28,000 people. Every day, uh, leaders get together and draw on ideas, strategies, there's great collaboration. And uh, yes, uh, things on paper do look bleak, but as far as I can tell, uh, city staff and the chamber staff and all the people who are involved with the business industry in the area are determined to get things back up on their uh, as soon as possible to get things going. And uh, we've just got to be positive about this and uh, just say, you know what, what can we do each day to uh, take this on and uh, solve the problems and prepare for the future and make sure, as Chris said earlier, that as soon as uh, the public health order is modified or lifted, that we start encouraging people who live on the peninsula to uh, uh, start uh, going out and enjoying the beautiful place we live in and start attracting people from uh, the Bay Area and the Central Valley back to, to come here, driving here for day trips. We've got a great advantage with this beautiful location and a great community here. So uh, uh, just keep up, uh, but don't give up. Uh, let's keep our spirits up and look forward to the future and just do our duty to uh, plan and prepare as if we were starting tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, if uh, you're here to speak on item number seven, fiscal impacts of COVID-19, we've got um, one hand up uh, and we'll start with uh, 7458. Welcome to the call. Hi there. 
Manas and I'm, I'm a Monterey resident and I'm just basically talking because I'm disappointed in public safety and stuff, uh, especially uh, for VZ because they're not doing enough to stop people from gathering. Um, I see people like this, I've seen on the rec- trail every day and I see uh, people gathering at the beaches as well. Um, I just think why do police get paid so much yet they don't do their job? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, next caller is, let's see here. Uh, we will go with uh, 5327. Uh, good evening. Um, this is Ray Myers, uh, president of Monterey. And uh, I'd like to speak about the financial director's presentation in reference to the rainy day fund, uh, 13.8 million, I believe, in approximation. Um, it's under my understanding that these funds express purpose is for to be used in an emergency situation. Uh, we don't believe there's anything that would qualify more than now as a um, that situation. The only argument I heard um, was that the virus or the um, fund was um, to be not depleted due to any future crisis. Um, so perhaps we may come to some compromise where we use a uh, percentage of it, of the rainy day fund, and keep some for the future. Um, I didn't hear any discussion on what portion was going to be used. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, next caller here is 2042. You're on the line. Welcome. My name, my name is Karen Brown, and uh, I'm a resident of Monterey, and I appreciate the report from the finance director. Her presentation is supposed to be conservative, cautious. That's her job. But the job <laughs> of the council is to be not just cautious and conservative, but to be brave, brave courageous and bold and do what's best for all the people of Monterey. And that includes the people who are poor and not able to be uh, able to buy a lot of books and um, download things from Amazon and Kindle and that sort of thing. So I encourage the city council to consider the needs of everyone in the community, and that means to allow the funding of the library. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next caller is uh, 6278. Hi there. Hi, uh, this is Mary Lynch Dunmore and I'm a resident of unincorporated Monterey County since 1981. Can you hear me? We can yes, hear you. Sir. Yes. Monterey is the city nearest my residence, and over these four decades, the majority of my volunteer work, like advocacy and more, has been for the city of Monterey. I'm also an appreciative patron of the library, as well as my son and daughter, now serving in the military and working in travel. In 1993, my daughter, then four, wrote a link letter of thanks to youth services librarians, Kathleen Gutner, Karen Brown, Kim Dewey Burton, and I added a postscript, let's use a tax money, Mom Wake Up with Library, and spend the library's only more important as an essential community service. Witnessing Monterey's team and reference to services librarian, Ebony Harris's warm, cheerful professionalism, and making the library a welcoming place for youth and others, shows how priceless the library is in supporting community education and well-being. I would be surprised that even before this pandemic, many of us longtime locals do not have budgets that allow movie outings, music streaming services, magazine subscriptions, book purchases. Now the numbers of people truly needing the library's collection and services are growing. I hope you'll remember Ann Herbert's words, libraries will get you through times of no money, better than money will get you through times of no library. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our next caller will be 2915. Oh, hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. 
Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Christopher, Christopher Chambers, and uh, the finance director mentioned something about the um, the conference center and how it's, it's still holding debt. And uh, it's, 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 it's beautiful. It's a very beautiful place. And uh, I was wondering, since there's no conferences going on, since there's no revenue being generated from that conference center, how long um, can that place, how long can the doors be open even though they aren't? And if um, the debt payments come up, come due, uh, is it a matter of just restructuring the debt or is it the thing to take it over? Great. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Yep. Excuse me, Matt. What we'll do is uh, questions like that will get answered when we're done with the public comment. This is Mayor Clyde again. And we'll be sure to get an answer to that excellent question. So don't turn off your YouTube or computer yet. <laughs> okay. I'm staying tuned. Okay. Mayor, Mayor, this is Tyler. I just wanted to um, echo a comment that that uh, Alan just made in the chat, which is if you could just give a reminder of the item that we're on and how we're going to be getting to some of these things in a little bit. Yes, yeah, I right. understand that. But when people are talking in general about the library versus layoffs, it's kind of a gray area, but thank you. Yeah, and we have one more caller and uh, last four digits, it's 8097. And this is uh, Emily Ham. Emily, you're up. Hi there. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is Emily Ham, and I am the newest employee of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership Housing Team, where I'm focusing on Monterey Peninsula Housing Initiative and right now helping to lead our regional um, housing response to COVID-19. Um, I will also be graduating from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in May and have been a resident of Monterey for just about two years now. Um, our housing team has recently published a set of housing-related recommendations for local governments to consider as we continue to respond to this public health emergency. Um, but I would just like to touch really quick on the first one in particular, which is to enact moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures, which you have already done. Um, but in addition, we would uh, like to urge you to provide rental assistance for those who have been financially impacted by COVID-19. Uh, we put forward three additional local recommendations, including the continuation of local planning and construction processes, um, as well as a number of state and federal recommendations that you can find in our COVID housing response position paper. Um, and the second one, which I'd like to touch on with really quickly, um, is the continuation of local planning and construction. That's the one I'd like to emphasize as well. Um, we understand that the Monterey Renters Protection U U United has been working with the city staff to dedicate CDBG funds towards the rental assistance program for city residents and potentially residents outside of the city. Um, and we're really pleased with its progress and encourage the city to continue to think about um, regionally how we might address this housing crisis. If your efforts help not only residents in Monterey, but also your workforce to live in other communities, then that helps uplift everyone in our region. Um, we will be convening a weekly conference call that includes some of the community members and activists who have already spoken tonight. And we are also working to develop subcommittees to address our ongoing challenges, one of which includes supporting rental assistance programs in our region. And we would invite city staff to participate in this working group if you're interested you can contact me at eham at mdep.biz and we thank you so much for your leadership on this thank you thank you okay next caller is uh, going to be the last four digits seven five five six you're on Hello, this is Dana Swanson, event supervisor at the Monterey Conference Center. I'm speaking on behalf of the Conference Center team. The Conference Center is a vital part of the recovery process for the entire city of Monterey due to a definite group on the books recurring, requiring excessive planning from our events operations team to provide for the new standard, the new normal. The layoff of our employees of those departments uh, that generate revenue for the city. We need to help with the um, comeback of Monterey. In fiscal year 2018-19, the 
conference center has highest revenue year in history, totaling $68 million of economic impact for our community. We also helped contribute a total of 41,532 hotel room nights for the city. These record-breaking numbers were based upon years of hard work and staff knowledge, and most obtained during our closure during our renovation, very similar to our closure now. Our efforts to secure, plan, and execute large events and meetings is critical. We need our sales, events, and operations team and maintenance team to successfully open our doors. Even with our doors closed these past 30 days, we have tentatively reserved 8,764 hotel room nights for future years. We have saved 7,318 hotel room nights for groups that have been affected by COVID-19. By reducing the MCC staff who are reinforcing the three remaining staff to be reactionary and not giving them the time for the tools needed to get new business or service or clients in preparation for their arrival. This will have a drastic impact on the peninsula's ability to rebound quickly by reducing business levels, community events, sales taxes, TOT tax and revenue for parking and local businesses. Over the past week, we have dedicated our time to interfacing with our clients and preparations for our reopening. We are working with our sales, operations, events, and vendors to create virtual site tours of our building with events, operations, and our vendors. Draft diagrams of new layouts to include social distancing, develop new standards that follow all current health regulations. Sure, our okay, building will you, will you, uh, safety. Thank you. Thank you. I, I and, and for the third group still on the book for June to December 2020. Yes, thank you so much. Again, if, if people want to talk about layoffs, uh, I'm going to ask you again. I know the financial report and the priorities of different departments, I get that. But if you specifically want to talk about layoffs, we again will request that you wait. But obviously, we're not going to cut you off. Nat, who else? Okay. Uh, next is uh, the last four is seven, eight, five, one. You're on. Hi, can you hear me, Nat? Yes, we can. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. This is Rob O'Keefe. I'm the interim president and CEO of the Monterey County Convention and Visitors Bureau. I wanted to weigh in, and I'll do it briefly. And deference to the schedule and the amount of uh, people that would like to also weigh in. I want to thank uh, uh, the city council and Hans and Lauren and the team there. We are in unprecedented times and I have never seen in my seven years uh, in my position this level of collaboration and cooperation and I decided to weigh in because some of the folks who had weighed in before have expressed some despair. And I think it's probably logical to have that. But from a tourism standpoint, and I really appreciate how much was made about the importance of tourism to our city, uh, we have a comeback plan. We're working on that in close collaboration with the city and with others throughout the county. And there'll be a lot more to say about that in the future. But the power of tourism is an enormous, compelling human imperative that we are, Monterey County and the city of Monterey are well positioned for as things develop. So I guess my message is to express a little bit of hope and encourage a lot more collaboration. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We look forward to it. Great. We have uh, one more caller and uh, Hi there. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, it's uh, Ted, uh, and I just had a, another quick question about uh, Lauren. And with the uh, obviously the hospitality industry and hotels and the conference center, that um, they, I guess the question is, do they have future bookings um, currently? Uh, from now and into the future, and is that revenue being taken into account um, in the numbers uh, in her finances? Um, because it looked like it was not. Thank you. Okay, those are uh, all the callers who have uh, indicated, uh, called in, and have indicated they are raising their hand. 
So thank you. I think I'm um, wondering if uh, Mayor Roberson is muted. Mr. Mayor, are you there? Or Uh, yes, I am here. And there I am. <laughs> All right, uh, Council, um, uh, Lauren, the uh, staff, there were a, a couple of questions that were brought up. Uh, first of all, we appreciate Barbara Meister from the Monterey Bay Aquarium um, fiscal year. Uh, not calendar year, and I, I, I never, I still haven't figured that out. I don't know why we can't have both, but so we appreciate that. And did you catch the questions? Uh, I think one was, why not I use did. the fund? Oh, well, then I will be quiet and let the bet, let the best finance director go for it. <laughs> um, so I hope I captured the questions and some suggestions. A member of the public talked about the rainy day fund and that this would seem by definition an emergency. And while we may not want to deplete the rainy day fund, it would seem reasonable to use a portion of it. So as we mentioned in the staff report, um, the emergency fund will be something we consider amongst all of our strategies. Um, and using a portion of it may be something we come upon um, sooner than later, but um, I think the individual did convey it correctly. We don't want to deplete it. To what degree we use it is I think a matter of leadership judgment. Um, another question came up in regards to the conference center. Um, how are we approaching this? I think first and foremost, we want to approach it collaboratively with the bank and the hospitality industry to restructure the debt in a manner that would align more closely with our economic reality. Um, the debt goes on through 2034. The interest rate floats around 4%, so we've got about 14 years left. Um, worst case scenario, if we don't have a win-win situation with the bank, it's possible that they'll take the building. It's not going to be useful for them. So I think they'll right. be very motivated with all of their borrowers to craft something that will be mutually feasible. So we've had about four conversations with the bank already in the last um, 30 days two teleconferences and two follow-up. So we're continuing to share with them the data that we do have. The last member of the public commented on whether or not the assumptions within the $10 million includes revenue bookings for MCC, which is the conference center, and hotels. So in developing the staff report where it shows we have revenue shortfalls in the conference center, I believe of 18 or 19 percent, the conference center general manager was asked to look at bookings through June 30th. That shortfall in the slide in the staff report reflects the bookings that we actually have on schedule. In addition, our TOT was in collaboration with the MCCVB. As the director, executive director, Rob O'Keefe just mentioned, we've been having weekly meetings with them. They've done a tremendous job building a financial model based on their expertise and data to have a model that has multiple factors in occupancy, in terms of duration, in terms of compaction. And we've been able to work with them to figure out collaboratively, regionally, what are the statistics and the assumptions that we use. We worked with them on providing the TOT numbers that are in the slides tonight. They represent our best understanding of um, the hospitality industry, current rate of occupancy and revenues as we know it. So to the best of our knowledge, um, those have been included through the June 30th numbers in the staff report. I believe those were the questions or the comments um, that wanted some responses. Okay, excellent. Any final uh, uh, council comments about the report or the public comment? I just have one comment, um, if I may. Um, Councilmember Tyler. Lauren, I really appreciate the, port, uh, the report and uh, the presentation today. And I'm wondering um, if my colleagues can agree with me on the need for us to receive some kind of financial report or update as, a, as an element of every council meeting um, from now on and for the foreseeable future. Because I think us kind of staying abreast of 
um, the budget and the finances is a critical element of the different various decisions that we have we have to make. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Great idea. Uh, I, I want to just point out something, if I may, and it gets a tiny bit into the uh, the rest of our agenda, and that is the unknown once again. So, if we're looking at the fund for economic uncertainty, we have other funds that we're looking at using as well: parking, tidelands, NCIP, uh, CIP. Uh, marina, harbor, et cetera. And we're looking at those as potential revenue sources. And if the optimism that I heard and I share it, and, I, and it's my hope, if we see an economic rebound, then a lot of those funds don't have to be tapped. They can go right back where they are. We're fortunate to have those funds to help us through this. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to de de be depleted. But for cities or any jurisdictions who don't have these funds, they're going to be really, really hurting. So again, we, we have these funds to tap into in an optimistic way. Maybe we don't have to take everything, but we have to have our options open. And that's, that's again, the unknown that we're dealing with. So that was about an hour and 15 minutes. I'll, I'll let you go for a minute, Ed, for one item that was the report. So that's why I'm appreciating everybody being as succinct as possible. Council Member Ed, please. Yeah, 30 seconds. Um, thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, very succinct and very clear report to understand. Appreciate all the work that's behind that. Um, you painted a picture of what's now, and we really appreciate that because this slowdown started um february and then now and then march and then now in april so these are real dollars that are not available for our budget moving forward so any decision we make and the decisions we make tonight if we are reluctant to make those decisions that 10 million dollar mark gets larger so we need to be cognizant of the fact that you reported to us tonight real dollars that we no longer have they were budgeted and we'll get to talk about what we had budgeted that money to. But I just wanted to call out, you said those were now dollars and that's what we are short currently. And so we've got lots of decisions ahead as we can mitigate that number in the coming months. I appreciate your report. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have, I can go in 30 seconds, that's okay. Sure. So, um, Obviously, we're in very, very uh, serious moment. And um, while I want to be optimistic, we yes. have to be pragmatic as well because we we can't afford to get it wrong. Um, two things that occur to me: one regarding tourism. While I want to be optimistic that things will turn around, and I'm glad that our staff and the Convention and Visitors Bureau and hospitality are working on a plan. I can imagine with 22 million applying for unemployment, one of the first things family budgets are gonna cut is recreation and tourism. Uh -huh. That's reality. That is that is something that is likely to be first to go. And as we look at corporations and organizations planning conferences, again, one of the first things that could go is, is, is conferences. So I, I think that um, with the recognition that probably when you put it all together, about 50% of our budget is tourism related, and it might even be more than that, but it, I think it's a conservative to say 50%. We have hard times now, and we're likely going to have hard times for the near term. Thank you, Alan for that reality check. All right, so let's, uh, can, oh, Dan, did you want to? Yeah, uh, Mayor, I, I guess if, if everybody's commenting on this, I might as well comment on it now. I, I, I have, my comments are more involved in uh, the upcoming um, uh, uh, items. So, uh, but I do want to, I do appreciate the the business department and, and all the, the work they put through to to, uh, to give us this, these, uh, these figures, even though, as everybody knows, it's not it's not rosy. 
But but I do want to comment one thing on uh, our local tourist economy is that when people don't fly and when people decide that they don't have the money to go outside of the states, they usually get in their cars and take short trips. And I think those short trips will be Monterey or Santa Cruz or or Napa, where they don't have to spend the money uh, actually flying. I think that was the comment that was made in public comment. And I think that's what we're going to see as a rebound is that people will want to take short trips and those short trips will be the city of Monterey. Thank you, Dan, because when the sport, excuse me, not sports center, when the conference center was down for a year and a half, two years, we actually had a 5% increase in tourism and it was all leisure travel, meaning uh, mom and dad grabbing the kids and people driving from Fresno. They're going to want to get out of Fresno and Modesto and LA and, and come to Monterey. And I think that's the point you're making. And we, that was true earlier. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do, I know it's going to uh, bring a, a thank you for the report is taking a look at the position control list by reducing positions or, um, furloughs and layoffs. And what I'd like to do just from a, the procedure, we'll have a staff report. Uh, we'll take a look at what time that is. It's probably gonna be at that point, we'll wanna take a break. We'll do a public comment, then we'll bring it back <coughs> for council deliberations because I, I think it's gonna be good that we're not sitting here two or three straight hours. So with that, we'll uh, go ahead and this is something uh, I want to say just going in that we have received a, a, a voluminous amount of emails and public input. We've processed it, we've read it, we've studied it. So I want everybody to know that up front. And we're gonna have our staff now put this in perspective of how do we respond to the financial report that we just had. So Hans, your team's ready to go. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the following agenda item is uh, is the hardest agenda item I think that I have to introduce to the council or present to a degree as well. Uh, and again, let me state up by let me start by stating uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic is uh, responsible for our assessment and our recommendation. The COVID nineteen pandemic uh, has this huge detrimental effect on our community's economy. Um, we have been prepared for an economic downturn for years. Uh, we stashed away funds for that purpose, but we expected a drop of 5, 10, or maybe 15% in, uh, in our travel, in our tourism-related industry. Nobody expected 85% as we are looking at it right now, or nobody expected to lose $10 million in three and a half months. Um, what that leads us to, to conclude is we cannot maintain right now our current status quo. Uh, if we continue to maintain our status quo and continue to provide services at the same level as prior to COVID-19, uh, chances are pretty high that the city will go insolvent, will go bankrupt, and certain assets will be sold in fire sales just to get by. Um, this evening we hear from our HR director, Alison Hawk, um, and she will talk about a proposed layoff measure that in many ways is intended to be a temporary layoff measure. Uh, there will be a lot of questions coming and we will answer as many of those questions that we can answer tonight. Before I continue, just let me be clear because there were comments, a lot of comments received that were um, expressing concerns that we want to close the sports center, that we want to close the library, our rec center, our Schultze center, etc. COVID-19 closed those centers. Those centers are closed today because of the pandemic. Every other library is closed in the 
state of California. Every other sports center is closed. Every other rec center is closed. So when the health officer or when the state of California lifts those restrictions, our library will open again. When the health officer or the governor tells us it is safe to operate a senior center for the most vulnerable community members, we will open the Schultze Center. When it is safe to open the sports center, we will open the sports center. When it is safe to open recreation centers, we will open the recreation centers. So no way are we proposing to permanently close any of those centers. As a matter of fact, we are committed to reopen the library the day when we get the green light from the Monterey County Health Officer to open the library. The reality also is that we do not know yet to what extent those facilities will be used by our residents. When you look at surveys being conducted right now, you can see that people are very hesitant to go out, that they are actually very skeptical about a phased approach right now. So we have to take all those points, all those data points that we have right now under consideration. When we open the sports center, will everyone return to the sports center? Councilman Bahapa just spoke about how he sees some family will select their personal savings and the personal priorities. So we have to look uh, in the future, but by no way is it our intent or staff's proposal to close the library, close the Schultze Center, close the Rec Center, close the Sports Center for an indefinite time. No, I want to be saying it one more time. We want to open those facilities when we get the green light from the Monterey County Health Officer or from the state of California. So the next item is that I want to thank everyone for their feedback. And I'm directing this to our employees. And I want to let you know that I read your comments, I read your emails, and many of those, all of those actually, um, touched me in a special way. I know when Sarah wrote to me about the Schultz Center, what it means for her. I know when Rachel wrote something about the Casanova Ognol Community Center, I know what that means for me and for her. Um, we got comments from Paige, from Nancy, from others about the conference center. I know what we have in you and I know what you have contributed and are contributing and will contribute to our conference center. I, I know Katie uh, up at Hilltop Park and I appreciate also what she has done for us. Um, there are so many others that I could name right now. Uh, another name just popped in my head, Juan Chavez from Parking, who I saw starting out in our custodial division and getting promoted through the ranks there uh, to where he is now in Parking. So I want to let you all know, I know what it means for us, what you mean to us, and I know that what we are trying to propose to the council, and Allison will explain this in greater detail, is a temporary measure only. Like I stated in the beginning, we plan on reopening all the facilities and when we are opening also our parking garages and charging fees there again, when we open the parking uh, front water, uh, parking, uh, parking lot at the waterfront, we will also fully restaff our parking division. The library submitted also multiple comments and I appreciate every single one of those comments. And again, the library director knows because I spoke to her on Thursday last week that we will be reopening the library the very day when we open the sports center. And that's a commitment that, that I have made and I think that all of us will be making to each other that whenever it's possible to bring back the programs, to bring back our services, we will jump on that opportunity. So 
Uh, I want to thank everyone for those comments, and I want to reassure you again that every single one of those comments that we have received so far has been read, has been understood, and I will continue listening and reading and talking to every single one who wants to talk to us. The point, though, is at the present time, as Lauren pointed out, we are in the midst of a severe fiscal crisis, and we don't know right now how we maneuver ourselves through this fiscal crisis. It's sure that we will recover. The one gentleman who spoke very positively about the rebounds of the tourism industry, I hope he's right, and I want him to be right. What we are facing now, what our council is facing now, difficult times and difficult decisions. And I am very sure that our council tonight will make the right decision. As I always say, the council knows best. And after listening to all of you, I believe the council will come out at the right end of this. With that, I hand it over now to Alison and I ask her to present our proposed plan for temporary layoffs. Thank you, Hans, and good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, I'm going to start with the presentation. We have a lot of information to share. Um, I'm going to try to take my time to go through it. I think it's really important that you all understand all of the information that we're sharing, um, the reason this decision is before you tonight. And I also wanted to make sure that we were responsive to the, a lot of the public comments and a lot of the employees' questions that we received. Um, about the layoff plan, and so we can be um, providing that information to them. So with that, I'm going to share my screen um, and start the presentation. Okay, thank you. So this presentation tonight um, is because of the COVID-19 pandemic and our response um, based on the need to reduce our expenditures. Um, this is a recommendation to impose layoffs to authorize the city manager to re-employ and also to appoint the HR director myself to negotiate with labor groups if they so choose to volunteer concessions. I wanted to back up and just provide some key dates to put some framework around the proposal. October 15th was the date that the city declared fiscal emergency. The reason that date is important is because it does allow you to provide less than 30 days notice um, to employees for layoff. Now we are not recommending that. We are hoping that we can provide employees with more notice. This is something that is provided by our city code. It's unlike a lot of other agencies or private companies um, that can just lay off in a day's notice. We are providing more than 30 days notice to our employees, but I did wanna let you know that because we are in a state of fiscal emergency, our city code allows for less. On March 13th, um, 2020, the city manager issued an emergency um, proclamation due to COVID-19, causing on March 14th, temporary closures of our sports center, our conference center, our public library, museums, and parking facilities. March 17th was the day the shelter in place order was declared by Monterey County Health Officer. Now with providing those dates, we wanted to provide with to you what are immediate fiscal challenges. Now Lauren already provided a really um, expansive presentation on this. The main point is that we've got a $10 million devastating drop in general fund revenues for this fiscal year, the one that we're in right now. $5.3 million from our TOT, our hotel tax, 1.1 million from our sales tax revenue, and 3.6 million from other revenues like the sports center, recreation, and conference center fees. This is just for a three and a half month period, mid-March through June. It's a huge drop in revenue. This next slide I'm sharing with you because this slide really helped me put into perspective what the TOT means to Monterey. This is data that you will probably remember from last year when we started negotiations with our labor groups. This is our market data. The cities before you are the cities that we compare to for our labor market. 
And we gathered this information last year, and I just wanted to show it to you now because what it does show is that Monterey's TOT revenue is very large. Last year, the revenue figure was 23, over 23 million for a population of just over 28,000. You compare that to Santa Barbara, also a city known for tourism. They have just under the same amount of TOT as the city of Monterey, but three times the population. If you go down and look at the city of Santa Cruz, they have only $9 million, excuse me, in TOT revenue and more than twice our population. This shows that the TOT revenue and the devastating impact that the TOT revenue has had on the city of Monterey makes us unique. It makes us unique for so many great reasons, but in this pandemic, it's also causing us to lose our revenues more quickly than almost any city in the state of California because of our large reliance on TOT. Just going to show you one more chart about this. This shows the TOT revenue distribution by population served with those same cities. You can see the $819 per capita TOT dollars and look at all of the lower amount of dollars per capita for the other cities. TOT is the driver of our economy and our revenues for our city. A lot of these other cities rely primarily on property tax and then sales tax. They will not see the devastation to their revenue so quickly as we are with our hotels closed and our tourism non-existent. And I think that's a really important uh, thing to understand, to understand why the city of Monterey is before you tonight with this proposed layoff plan. We know a lot of other cities are contemplating layoffs and putting plans in place to do so. We just unfortunately are um, coming at it ahead of them because of the fact that we are so reliant on our TOT revenue. So this brings me to the unfortunate and really devastating reality. We just want to point out that the COVID-19 pandemic is really causing this crisis. And I know we all know this, but we just want to make sure employees know it's not something we want to be doing to employees. This is not caused by our employees. This is caused by a pandemic. Lauren already touched on this, and so I won't get into the financials about this, but we have a three, three, um, $13 million strategic reserves. These are one-time funds, um, and these are needed to maintain critical public safety service and protect the city from fiscal insolvency. As Lauren stated, um, we will be looking at utilization of our rainy day fund, these reserves, um, but we do also need to realize that that $10 million deficit that we are confronted with is so far just for this fiscal year, and we know that the pandemic's impacts are going to be longer lasting. So these layoffs are mostly temporary, and we believe, unfortunately, that they are needed now to avoid more dire long-term catastrophic cuts to city services in the future that could be then permanent cuts. We simply cannot afford to fully staff facilities that are temporarily closed especially when revenues have plummeted and program fees associated with these positions have also evaporated. We are proposing this to keep services open in the future. Again, as Hans pointed out, we are planning on reopening as soon as possible and to the greatest extent that is safe and economically feasible. There is an intent to reemploy. We wanna make sure this is loud and clear I've highlighted this to let make sure we are reassuring everyone that as soon as it is safe and economically feasible, the city intends to reopen our facilities and re-employ as many employees as possible. This is not a request to permanently close any of our facilities with no intent to reopen. This is meant to be a temporary measure. As Hans already alluded to, he has worked with departments and staff to begin working on a plan. As soon as layoffs were contemplated, he started putting plans in place for a gradual reopening as soon as, again, it is safe and economically feasible. We know that services may look different for a while with social distancing requirements and with budgetary constraints, and we know that full recovery will likely take some time. We are looking at a phased approach to the reductions in our expenditures. What this means is we're looking at some general cost savings. 
Deappropriating NCIP and CIP projects, that's next up on the agenda. That is absolutely something that the city is looking to do as well. We are also looking at organizational restructuring and other cost savings, and that will be to be determined and brought forward to you at another time. We are also looking at other programmatic budget cuts citywide um, that we can make. And again, this will be to be determined, brought to you at another meeting. Now, talking about labor cost savings, um, as a city that provides services to the community, our main um, expenditure is personnel costs. So labor costs are the main thing that can meet that $10 million deficit, unfortunately. So we are looking at a phased approach. This tonight is to propose temporary layoffs affecting staff and facilities that are closed during the shelter in place and also any voluntary salary and benefit reductions. Um, I'm gonna talk more about this in a moment, but I will let you know that because um, our employees are um, represented and we need to negotiate with them, we are in closed contracts with our employees. Um, we cannot impose any salary reductions or benefit reductions to make up our revenue um, losses. They have to be voluntary and they have to be offered and agreed to by our labor unions. The only thing that um, council is able to do without the agreement of the unions is to impose layoffs. So this is really the only tool that council has until the labor groups are um, able to come forward and offer any concessions. Um, I will let you know that many of our labor groups have already done that and I will present that to you tonight. Phase two is any additional labor concessions um, affecting all of our labor groups. So again, we will be reaching out. I've already actually, I've reached out to every labor organization um, last week as soon as we realized that layoffs um, were going to be recommended. Before it was announced to staff, I contacted every single labor group in there um, and let them know that we wanted them to meet at the table to start talking. I asked them to please schedule time to collaborate with us that we would be open um, to meeting with them and talking with them about any um, questions that they had, any impacts they wanted to discuss, um, or anything that they wanted to negotiate. And then of course, phase three, this is the um, where we hope we are sooner rather than later, that's to rehire laid off staff as facilities are able to reopen. So this brings me to the layoff recommendation. Um, as you see in the council agenda item, this is to approve a resolution to lay off 106 positions. This, this is 83 filled positions. So that means 83 employees, 83 individuals that would be impacted by this decision. 23 of these positions are vacant. We chose June 2nd, 2020 as the proposed effective date of layoff. I wanted just to speak um, a little bit about why we chose this date. I wanted to talk about this would allow for employee coverage for healthcare and the city contribution to continue through July 31st, 2020. When um, our contract with CalPERS allows us to continue to offer health care and to provide a contribution through the month that the employee separates and then also in the month after they separate. That is what you have before you. Um, that is the, the guidelines that we have to follow. Now, of course, there is the possibility that we can negotiate with labor groups to continue offering health care coverage for a longer period of time. And um, I think we all welcome those conversations. We've already started having some of those conversations, but this is what we are allowed to do um, based on our contract with CalPERS and without unilaterally imposing additional contributions past July 31st. Again, any changes, even if they're additions to benefits rather than reductions, has to be agreed to and by the labor unions. It's not something we can impose. I want to also just explain to you that we know that healthcare coverage is also um, a main concern for employees, understandably. This would be a huge change for employees um, if they are laid off and going on unemployment. Right now, the city provides um, the majority of our employees have 100% coverage. Um, the city fully covers the premiums for employee only, employee plus one, and employee plus family for the majority of our employees. 
Most employees that will be impacted by these layoffs um, don't have any cost share in healthcare right now. So this would be something that would be a big impact. Um, they will have the right to COBRA to continue their health care. I also want to let you know that HR is working, human resources is working right now to make sure that we can um, assist employees to apply for COBRA if this is um, implemented. And also if COBRA is too expensive, we want to be able to help employees find other health care coverage on Covered California, the affordable care um, offered in California. So we really want to make sure that we're helping employees through this um, period, because I know this will be very difficult. Um, so we will assist with those applications. I also just want to um, make sure that everyone is aware that the federal pandemic unemployment compensation um, that was passed last month is providing an additional $600 per week to eligible employees for unemployment. In California right now, the maximum weekly contribution that you can get is $450 for 26 weeks. This new federal um, law would provide eligible employees with an additional $600 per week, so over $1,000 a week in unemployment, and it extends to 39 weeks. So it extends from 26 to 39. Um, so that's also something that we um, are hoping will continue and it's something that has already started. So employees on unemployment right now in the state of California have been receiving, if you receive $1 of unemployment through the state, you get $600 per week through this program. Also maintaining services. Um, despite the de devastating losses in revenue um, and this devastating proposal before you tonight, the city does intend to keep limited staff in all departments. Um, that's including the sports center and the library and recreation, which would continue to provide some virtual programs and services to the community so that there's not um, a lack of services entirely. These will There will still be some services provided to the community dur during this time. Staff is also developing plans to carefully reopen facilities. Um, I already mentioned that, but I just wanted to make sure we're reiterating that and in, um, to do so in an appropriate manner when it is safe to do so. Again, the proposed layoff date is June 2nd, but if able to reopen facilities before this date, the city can start to bring employees back to work and in some cases may not require layoffs at all for some staff. Um, now, a lot of people are questioning, why are we proposing this now if by June 2nd, things might change? Again, I wanna remind everyone that our city code does require that we offer 30 days notice. We also, um, when we realized how devastating the revenue losses were, um, I think this was something that we weren't anticipating to come so quickly. And when we realized it, we did wanna make sure that we gave employees notice ahead of time. This also provides me with time to negotiate with the unions um, on any other reductions that they're willing to make. So we have time to adjust um, that what happens on that June 2nd date. Now the decision to lay off versus furlough, I've had a lot of um, people questioning, why are we doing layoffs instead of furloughs? And I just wanted to give, um, there's no clear definition of what either of those are, but a layoff is typ um, typically a temporary separation from employment due to lack of work with an intent to re-employ re when work resumes. Also, the city code only provides a city council with the option to lay off. We don't have provisions to furlough in our city code. Furloughs are things that have to be negotiated with the unions. Um, and what is a furlough? Well, furloughs typically are across the board, unpaid time off for a fixed period of time to address financial challenges. So it would be across the board, typically affecting all, all employees across all departments um, to meet financial challenges versus a layoff, which is temporary and targeted towards those that have less work to do. So um, those services that are not impacted by this um, and basically deemed essential, and I wanna just make sure that everyone realizes when we're using essential services, we mean what is essential per the shelter in place order. Um, what are those services? We're looking at public safety and emergency management. So police, fire, our first responders, public works, making sure that our streets are still um, kept in repair and that 
we're still able to maintain our infrastructure so that doesn't go into disrepair. Also planning and building to ensure that the planning and the building inspections and the constructions that are happening are able to maintain. And then also staff that supports all of these operations, which includes my department, finance, ISD, our um, I IT services, and then all of the admin staff in all of these departments that help them function and provide the essential services. Employees providing these services right now are continuing to work at full capacity. Um, some would probably say they're working um, above full capacity during this time. Um, taking unpaid time off and a furlough would really impact services to the community and public safety by decreasing the amount of hours people are working to provide these essential services. Um, so, so therefore, the furloughs across the board could ne negatively affect um, these essential city services. That means less policing, less fire services, et cetera. I will also um, let you know that an across the board cut to alleviate layoffs entirely would have to be very significant. We are looking at preliminary figures and it looks like it would require something like a 20% across the board reduction in all departments, including police and fire, to make up for the, um, this, the costs associated with the positions um, that we are looking at tonight. So very difficult decisions. So what are the impacted services? Um, the impacted services are due to the pandemic, the city was forced to reduce or temporarily close certain services that were deemed non-essential by the county health um, officer shelter in place order. Now it did leave to the city what that meant to be essential and non-essential. We did though try to make sure that we were keeping in step with what most other cities and counties felt was essential and non-essential. And we also wanted to make sure we were looking out for the health and well-being of our community and our employees and not requiring employees to come to work and um, be in um, be around other people when they weren't deemed to be providing essential emergency services. This doesn't mean that the city doesn't consider these to be important and critical community services. That is absolutely not the case here. The essential term is based on the order. It is not whether or not we find value in these services. We absolutely do. Most of the employees impacted by the shelter and safe, um, shelter in place order offering these impacted services have been unable to perform their regular job duties um, since mid-March. Now I will want to make sure that I'm pointing out that this doesn't mean that employees weren't performing community services and city services. They pivoted and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. What I'm saying here is they weren't really able to provide the same level of service as they would if the library was open and people were coming in, if the conference center was serving um, conferences, was holding conferences, if rec programs were happening, if the sports center was open and people were coming in to work out and be at programs. So employees really did have to pivot and they really, really did. And I wanna talk more about that. So what are the impacted services? We've talked a lot about it tonight, but just to point it out, the library, the city has great pride in our, pub, our Monterey library. Our sports center, it's a unique sports center. Most cities don't have sports centers. It's something that we know is a huge value to our community. Our museums, so unique to the city of Monterey. Our conference center, also such a unique service that the city of Monterey provides to own a conference center and to be able to hold huge state-of-the-art conferences. So this is um, also an impacted services. And then recreation, all of our camps, our preschools, our programs offered in recreation. And then the customer service provided by our parking staff. Our parking staff are some of the people that welcome tourists to our city. They're the first people that often our visitors see. These are valued employees. And then also various staff and programs in other departments. Um, a lot of other departments were hit, much less so than these other um, services that I'm calling out. Staff in these departments have really worked hard to create some level of service remotely and online. Um, they've also, the city will also retain sufficient staff to continue some of these online and remote services. Um, and also I will say like parking is also pivoting to provide some more security services. So employees are really doing what they can to provide services. We do wanna make sure that we're acknowledging that. Civil service delivery comparisons. We felt that this was important so that you could see um, 
that we are, again, unique to a lot of the other cities, even in our own area. The blue line is Monterey. It, this is the full-time equivalent city employees per 1,000 residents offering these services. So recreation, you can see, we have a much more robust recreation staff than any of our neighboring cities. Our sports center, uh, it cannot be compared to any other service offered at any community. We have the unique sports center. Our library, we have more employees working in our library than any of our neighboring cities. Our museum, again, so unique, not something that other cities have conference center the same, and parking operations the same. These are unique services that have all been closed. So when we're looking at our neighbors to say, why are they not yet reducing services to the same level? It's because they don't actually have that same level of service, and they don't have that closed service impacting so many more employees than what is impacting Monterey. Unfortunately, all the things that make us so wonderful and unique um, are also the things that are making this pandemic impact us more severely. This is what I wanted to talk about with employees pivoting to support, provide some community support. Um, day one, city manager talked to all of us and said he wanted to create Operation Outreach, um, which a lot of you know is something where we got um, names um, of patrons to the library, to the senior center, to the sports center, um, and started identifying community members that might be at risk um, for serious illness due to COVID-19. Um, and our employees in all of these departments started making phone calls, reaching out to our community. The city manager also opened the Emergency Operations Center immediately to provide um, so many support things for our community. Um, employees rose to the occasion and provided so much support. They reached out to thousands of residents who are at risk, as I talked about, thousands. They offered support to our emergency operations center. Our employees called and got masks, sanita um, sanitizer, and other um, supplies that our community so desperately needed to address the pandemic. The employees that are on the list today that are um, on this layoff list are the ones that were making those calls. They also provided virtual programs. The sports center provided exercise classes, so did recreation, so did library. They provided programs and lessons. So as I said, they pivoted and they did what they could to provide community services. They also just continued providing customer service to the public. I will assure you that um, we did think that the shelter in place orders would lift within a few weeks when we all left in mid-March. We thought that these projects would actually sustain through the closure. We realize that this is not the reality of this pandemic or the economic impact. Um, so I just wanna make sure that you are aware of what our staff did during this time. So also supporting employees during this pandemic. Um, in March, right when the pandemic started, the city manager immediately provided 80 hours of paid leave to be used as needed for our employees. Um, so this was 80 hours of leave so that employees wouldn't have to touch their own accrual banks because we just didn't know what was gonna happen and we knew that it was gonna take time for um, us to figure out where and how employees could continue to work in these closed facilities. So 80 hours was provided. I will let you know that most employees did not use or did not need to use these 80 hours because they were so creative with ways that they could continue to provide services. Um, so, but then after two weeks went by, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, and now we're at six weeks, um, the ability to sustain pivoting and offering services when our facilities are closed is really, really diminished. So employees are having to start using these 80 hours. Employees unable to work remotely. We do have some employees that simply were not able to set up in, in time to be working remotely or just didn't have the abilities to do so. Um, the federal government provided paid sick leave for employees impacted by COVID-19. I wanna also let you know that the, um, the city made the decision at the very beginning to allow any employee unable to work to have an additional 80 hours through this program. That is an expansive reading of this law. Other cities. Um, made the decision to not provide um, the 80 hours of paid sick leave by deeming their employees 
um, exempt from the law. We did not do that. So employees did have access to 160 hours of leave. We also assigned all of our safety, our OSHA safety training and our harassment prevention training to employees. So when they went home um, and they didn't have work to do, they were able to do a year's worth of training um, for their OSHA safety and their harassment prevention training. Um, the idea is we thought that we could get all of our employees, we could use this time to be resourceful, get our employees trained for the year so that then when they got back to work, they didn't have to take time out of their work schedule to do those, those trainings. They would be done with their trainings and ready to get back to provide services to the community. Our employees were enthusiastic about that and signed up and many of them completed a year's worth of training. I also want to um, talk about ISD. I um, just want to acknowledge that team. The minute we knew that we were going to be going home to work remotely, so many other cities were not set up to work remotely. ISD immediately set up dozens and dozens of laptops that we had available, loaned them out to employees, set up a remote work website, um, got all of the employees ready to telecommute all of the employees that were able to. So it was just an amazing feat to watch. They worked feverishly to get us going from all coming into the office to all of the sudden working at home. Um, I can tell you that through my interactions with other city HR departments, this was unique to our city. Hardly any other city was able to pull something off like this where we were immediately telecommuting. Um, for those employees that are able to do all of their job duties remotely, there was no delay. Um, but again, for these services that are open to the public and providing um, services to our community through having people come in and the public come in, it was a lot more difficult to provide remote work opportunities to sustain full duties. So again, back to the decision to lay off. I wanna remind you that we cannot unilaterally impose furloughs or salary cuts or anything else. Those must be negotiated and they must be agreed to by the unions. They virtually need to be volunteered by the unions. Our labor groups. The city code only provides the city council with the ability to lay off with reemployment rights. So we can do temporary layoffs, not permanent layoffs. You can do temporary um, layoffs with reemployment rights. Um, I notified all of the labor groups last Wednesday regarding the layoff proposal and made sure that they knew that we were available to negotiate impacts and start discussing those impacts immediately. Many groups have already met with HR, um, human resources, and offered concessions and other options to lessen the impact of layoffs. We just started meeting with them and we hope to continue these discussions. I just wanna talk about the labor groups that have responded to support the city family. Um, as you know, the city manager and city attorney have volunteered a 10% reduction in pay immediately through um, November 2020, and also deferred to um, volunteered to defer a 2% salary increase that is um, supposed to be happening this July. They've pushed it off to next January. The executive management group, which is all your other department heads, have also volunteered an 8% reduction in pay immediately through November 2020, and have volunteered to delay. Um, they're also 2% salary increase due in July. To push that off, I'm sorry, that should be until January 2021. Our miscellaneous management group, um, MEA, um, they have members impacted by this layoff. They approached me last week. Um, I believe they met today and they started to have discussions to talk about how they can lessen those impacts. Our police management group and our fire management group, um, they've also said that they want to be at the table and offer concessions. Um, the police management group has offered to also defer their cost of living increase. Um, they've done this even though none of their members are impacted at this point. So I will be meeting with those groups. I will also be meeting with any other group. Um, I did um, reach out to the GEM bargaining group um, last week. Um, they did say that they wanted to meet, so I offered to meet with them this week. and. About an hour ago, I, I did hear back from him, them that they would meet this Thursday. Um, so I'm hoping to have more information for you um, about that group as well. Again, wanted to talk about reemployment. Um, the recommendation before you is to provide the city manager with the discretion to reemploy as soon as possible based on the status of the shelter in place orders and the availability of funds. 
Um, why we are saying this is because typically what happens in a layoff is that the city council removes positions from the position control list. And then when we want to bring back positions on the position control list, we have to go back to council and ask for your authority to do so. We are asking the city council to instead provide the discretion to the city manager to immediately re-employ as soon as we know we are able to, so that we don't have to have that delay that sometimes could be a week or two weeks, depending on when council is scheduled, um, to ask for authority to bring them back. So any position that was laid off based on this proposal would be available to be brought back on immediately as soon as it's able. And um, we've asked for that discretion to be provided um, for the 24 months, um, two years, basically from the date of layoff. So I also wanna just make sure that you are aware of, based on our um, reemployment rights that's in our city code, employees laid off retain the right to reemployment to the position for 24 months. That means they get the first option to come back to their position. Um, nobody else can come back to their position for 24 months they have the right to that position when that's when that position is ready for reemployment. They retain their seniority rights. They come back to the city with the same seniority rights that they had when they left. They retain their vacation accrual rates. So they won't come back being like a new employee with new accrual rates. They retain their accrual rates. Their leave balances that were not cashed out will be restored. Now by state law, we have to cash out vacation balances and um, some other accrued holiday, things like that. But sick leave balances, anything that's not cashed out will be restored. So we will basically put them on hold and put them back into their banks the minute that they are reemployed. I also just wanna make sure that um, employees are aware that any employee that's a classic employee, that means they aren't a PEPRA employee. So they um, have the more generous retirement benefit. When they re-employ with the city of Monterey, they retain their classic status. They do not then become a PEPRA employee, even if their break in service is more than six months. Um, if they were to go to another agency with more than a six month break in service, they would then become a PEPRA employee. But so long as they're coming back to the city of Monterey, they're going to retain that classic status. I know that's a big impact and a big question for employees. Um, so I wanted to make sure that, that, that you were aware and that they were aware of that. So next steps, what are our next steps? Between now and June 1st, Today's proposal is the first step needed to begin discussions and to plan ahead. The city by June 1st and between now and June 1st will have a better projection of how this pandemic will impact revenues for the next fiscal year. Between now and June 1st, the city hopes to have a better understanding of when and how the shelter in place orders will lift and how facilities might reopen. Between now and June 1st, HR staff will meet with the unions regarding any other options or impacts. And between now and June 1st, we will know if there's concessions that will help mitigate the impacts of these layoffs. I wanna remind you what I said before, um, if this was going to be an ac across the board cut to alleviate every layoff, it would be something along the lines of a 20% across the board reduction, and that would include police and fire. Um, that would be so that we had no layoffs. So that is the immensity of the figure that we're looking at based on that $10 million deficit that's just for this fiscal year. But we will be looking at those concessions. There's a possibility that concessions could alleviate some of the layoffs. Concessions might also provide the ability to provide additional months of healthcare contribution as a safety net to employees. Um, those healthcare contributions are in the um, they're about $100,000 for these impacted employees per month to the city. So we could negotiate um, offering additional months of potentially um, providing that contribution. We want to reach out to employees. We want to hear from the employee unions. Um, and again, I just want to remind council that we cannot be directly dealing with our employees. We have to have those discussions through the proper channels, which means I have to meet with their employee representatives in order to have these conversations. So I urge employees to reach out to your representatives and to have them bring your ideas and your proposals to me at the table and to my um, team, my labor team at the table. 
So what is our timeline? April 15th, um, we notified the labor leadership groups of layoffs. That was last week. April 16th, proposed layoffs were announced by the city manager via um, Google Meet live stream to all of the employees so that they would know what the plan was ahead of time. April 16th, there was also a media release announcing these proposed layoffs. On April 17th, um, the, we provided a list of all the positions effective. We released that in the agenda report. We also provided it to all the departments um, and we sent some information to each of the labor union with all of the employees that were impacted in their group. Tonight before you, um, we are here to consider the proposal. Tomorrow, we hope to start negotiating identified impacts. I already let you know some of the voluntary impacts that have been provided um, by some of our team members. We will start costing those out and seeing how they can impact this proposal. Tomorrow also, if you, uh, if you um, approve the resolution tonight, um, the HR team has been working diligently to put together informational packets for every single employee effective. Also through our city code, we have bumping rights, reassignment rights, which means all of the employees that are impacted by layoffs might be able to actually bump another employee that they have more seniority over um, if they've previously held the position or if they have no, more seniority in the current position that they're holding in other departments. So that is something that we are going to be communicating with starting tomorrow. We are gonna be meeting individually with every single employee impacted by the layoff proposal providing them with all of their rights and all of their information. We will also start um, having informational presentations about how to apply for unemployment, COBRA, Covered California. By early May, we'll be coming back to city council. Um, we are hoping that we are able to have changes to those layoff based on meet and confer. Um, we'll, come in, we'll come to that um, in closed session to get some authority to negotiate that. Um, so we'll know more in May. So hopefully we'll be able to give you more information between now and May. But we're asking tonight with that projected date of June 2nd as the layoff proposal date so that we have enough time for employees. Um, and so that we can also, if the shelter in place order has not lifted, if our economic, um, if our economic outlook looks um, bleak as it already does, but continues to look that way, if we are already in that position, are still in that position on June 2nd, um, then we know we are going to have to act quickly in order to avoid these layoffs being longer term or to avoid having additional layoffs um, that impact um, other services across the board. June 1st, um, layoffs, the last day of work will be June 1st for employees, and then June 2nd will be the effective date of layoff. Again, we chose that date so that we could continue health coverage through June and then also July. Um, summary, um, this is a very painful, difficult, um, but we believe necessary decision before you tonight. We know that this is not easy for everyone impacted. Um, of course, we all empathize with our employees and our families. These are intended to be largely temporary layoffs. We wanna reiterate that. We are hoping these are temporary layoffs for our closed facilities. And they're needed to avoid um, draconian cuts to public safety and to protect the city from insolvency. We will continue virtual services with core staff in Sports Center Recreation and Library. Basic custodial parking maintenance and enforcement will continue. And when it is safe to do so, we will reopen facilities and we will rehire staff as soon as possible. How we reopen facilities will depend on health and safety guidelines and the fiscal state. And with that, I will close the presentation. Thank, thank you, Alison, uh, Mr. Mayor, council members. I think our presentation shows you our approach to counter the budget challenges, the budget devastation that we are facing in, in a most humane, efficient way to have a focus on rehiring, have a focus on reopening the facilities as we are allowed to do this. 
by the state of California or the Monarch County Health Officer. I want to personally thank Allison for this heartfelt presentation. Uh, I think we all can feel that uh, we feel passionate about our family members. We feel passionate about our coworkers. And um, what we are proposing, I feel, and what we have done so far was in the best tradition of, of our city. And what you've seen tonight so far, I think, um, shows you that the path forward uh, is, is conscientious about the merits of our services, the merits of our employees as well as future oriented to bring back our employees as well as reopen the facilities that were currently closed, closed by the pandemic COVID-19 and as soon as it's safe we are opening again up the library and staffing appropriately as service needs are there. So with that Mr. Mayor uh, if you have uh, I, I believe your intent is now to take a break. Um, I uh, hand it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, thank you. I think we should take a break, come back at 9.30, which is 18 minutes, because um, we've had a two hour and 12 minute presentation. Uh, very, very complex, very professional, excellent, very heartfelt. And I imagine all of us could could use uh, just a little break to clear, clear our heads as we go forward. Then the first thing we'll do coming back is uh, public comments. And during those public comments, I, I would humbly request if you emailed us, we read it. If, uh, if someone makes a statement that you agree with, you can make your phone call really short and say, I agree with this or that. Uh, because again, I think it's incumbent that our council, I'm, I'm guessing we won't get to decision making until 11 o'clock, but maybe I'll be wrong. But I really hope the public can help us by making their comments succinct. If you wrote to us, we heard you and would ask people to really focus on uh, letting us get to some decision making because I'm sure a lot of people are anxious about where we're going. So with that, we'll see you all at 930.
All right, I think we're ready to go. Uh, once again, we, we thank our staff for its outstanding presentation. I think many of the questions that we had received through the emails were asking about was the library being closed? Uh, was Schultze Park being closed? Were people being permanently laid off? And all the answers to all those were no. So I, I hope that allays some of the concerns. And so what we'll do is we have a queue. Is there any way, uh, do you know how many people are waiting at this point? Yes, we have about um, five uh, or six individuals currently waiting with their, uh, their hands up. And we just remind individuals to uh, call into the number that is shown on the Chiron at the bottom of the screen. And please remember, if you do uh, intend to speak, please dial star five. We'll take uh, and we'll take uh, callers as you wish, Mr. Mayor. Okay, um, Matt. I want point to... of order: the the yes. number is no longer visible, so you might want to um, put that up again. Like okay. That. Great, great. Uh, let me do that, uh, and then also have the timer ready to go as well. Uh, for those who are watching on AMP and on YouTube Live, there's a Chiron that uh, those who are in the Google Meet don't don't see. Um, that's been up, but I, I will. I appreciate you reminding me to put the timer up as well as the dial-in information. We can take. Uh, are we ready for public comment, Mr. Mayor? We we're uh, ready for public comment. We very much appreciate everybody's patience, and and to honor our time limit again. So your council will have a chance to take in all your input and work with the staff to come up with some uh, thoughts and recommendations. So welcome. It's a this is new for all of us with the phone in, and I think it's working pretty well. Right. Thank you. And who's our, our first caller today? Yes, our first caller today will be extension, uh, or the last four digits will be 3801. Welcome to the city council meeting. Hello. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. My name is Ryan Perrin, I'm the labor relations representative for UPEC 792 and the GEM employee group. While no one can deny that the economic situation we're facing is challenging, the city should only be considering layoffs as an option of last report once all other options have been exhausted. Sadly, it appears that the city leadership is going straight to mass layoffs even before considering other options that could address the current loss and revenues of the city. Alternatives that should be considered before dipping into the city's general fund reserve and economic uncertainty fund, exploring options for federal and state budget assistance, temporary across the board furloughs and pay reductions, and reappropriating other funds should be considered prior to layoff. It is not fair whether the city is laying off for lack of funds or for lack of work. Regardless, we do not agree that either is a valid option at this point. Even in closed facilities, there is plenty of work for many of the people targeted for layoff to perform. Our members are ready, willing, and able to work, including performing duties well outside their typical duties if called on whatever it takes. The city's healthy reserve funds were put away specifically for an economic downturn like this current one. It's a rainy day. If the city is fortunate to have rainy day funds, why not use them? What is the point of having reserves if not for a situation exactly like this? The question must be asked if the problem is a lack of funds to pay employees or if it is simply a lack of commitment to city employees. If there is truly such a dire lack of revenue, why then is the business to consider spending over $1 million, giving it to local businesses as assistance later on in tonight's agenda? How can this be afforded if the city is in such a dire shape? Why are more executives and managers not being targeted for layoff? Why is the same manager and other execs not offering to take larger pay cuts, like execs and other neighboring agencies doing, such as the Strick Road, Seaside, and Carmel, which, by the way, have not laid off a single full-time employee yet? Why is Monterey laying off uh, 80 employees when these agencies that are neighboring are laying off now? The current shelter in place order is through May 4th. Why lay off now? Additionally, as the mayor referenced, Congress is discussing a fourth stimulus bill, which is very likely to include federal money for smaller sized cities like Monterey. Now is not the time to set in motion layoffs. Instead, we should consider the options while we wait and see what happens. 
we are due to vote no on this item tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The uh, next caller is 0776. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Doug Holtzman. I'm the president of the Monterey Public Library Friends and Foundation. We would like the brief statement we sent you yesterday to be part of this community conversation. We know the city is facing an unprecedented situation and a dire fiscal challenge. We share your concern for the city and community as you consider the difficult decisions before you. We're grateful for every city staff member and we value their hard work and the services they provide. I was delighted to hear the city manager's commitment to reopen the library as soon as the shelter in place order is lifted. We remain concerned that the proposal will drastically limit access to essential library services even after that time because of staff reductions. Library services are particularly important during hard economic times and particularly valuable to those most in need. Providing practical information on topics such as job hunting, free resources for readers, listeners, and viewers, and a real source of inspiration, solace, and community. We're especially concerned about activities and services for children and families facing extended school closures and unprecedented demands. We ask you to find a way to restore library programs and services as soon as humanly possible. We will work with you to support the library in any way we can. Please let us know how we can help. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Our next caller is 1912. You're now live. Thanks for joining. As to uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, and staff, uh, certainly my name is Mike Sovereign. I've been a long term member of resident. I've certainly been impressed by the quality of the presentations, and as always, from our excellent staff. But it does seem to me that you're missing the elephant in the room. We know that although there are tight constraints on public safety services and pay, there is one large element which remains, as far as I know, in management's control. That is the amount of overtime, which is indeed huge in the police and fire services here. That overtime is probably not nearly as necessary as it has been. There is no traffic. There is little crime. We could stop running the fire trucks up the hill when in competition with the county <clears throat> ambulances. We could save a lot of overtime and probably as much as you're going to be saving with the layoffs, I have not heard the number yet of what you're going to be saving. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Next call comes from 5647. Good evening. You're live with the Monterey City Council. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marilyn Cruikshank. I'm a former employee of the Monterey Public Library and a current employee of the Monterey County Free Library. And a, um, I've been a, a long-time resident of Monterey. Uh, I just want to thank you, everyone, for your for your uh, excellent assessment of the situation and for trying to um, to do everything you can. Uh, I, I would like to implore you that you do everything. I've heard that some employees have not been permitted to negotiate uh, pay cuts um, to help other keep other employees from being laid off, which concerns me. And I would also like to implore you that um, to consider the value. Um, hopefully, and when we come back as soon as we can, that you don't only consider the financial aspect of libraries; that you do consider their. Um, their community impact um, and then you bring all of the employees back and you recognize the value that they all bring. Um, thank you very much and um, yes, thank you. All right, thanks for your comments. Okay. 
next call comes from 7005. Welcome, you're live. Hi, I'm Kim Smith. I'm one of the current managers at the Monterey Public Library. Um, I think everybody tonight will try to be brief. Um, I just want to point out that the three positions um, that are going to be left at the library, the director and admin assistant and a librarian, um, are, in my opinion, not sufficient enough to maintain library services, even when the library is closed and at very, very minimal levels to the public. There's ongoing subscriptions, vendors, um, phone calls. We've issued at least 250 library cards to new uh, library patrons and customers since we've closed for shelter in place. And um, with so few staff available, um, it's going to be very tough to um, maintain any basic services and plan for reopening the library. Um, when the library is reopened, I'm, I'm hoping that we are able to staff with a sufficient number of staff. Um, we have a number of positions that have special skills. Um, other people in the library do not have the same skills. Um, and if we're not able to bring back certain people, we will lose that. Um, and when we compare ourselves to other libraries in the community, um, Seaside and Marina are part of a county system. Um, they have a separate administrative office with management and a director elsewhere. So I don't know if that was figured into the account. Um, I also want to say that as uh, libraries have taken budget hits throughout the years, we've lost a number of positions and have um, replaced some of those hours with hourly uh, employees on calls as the city calls them. Um, and these people work zero to 20 hours a week. They get no benefits. Um, but we rely on these people to provide um, library um, library uh, offerings. And if we aren't able to bring any of these people back and we can only bring back a limited number of permanent staff, um, it's, it's definitely going to be hard to provide services. Thank right. you. Thank you. And my next caller is 5471. Your life. Greetings. This is this is Rick Hoyer. I'm a resident of Monterey and a business owner in Monterey. Uh, I do not envy you. You're doing what most of us in the private sector had to do three weeks ago. We cut, we laid off employees and cut salaries across the board of everyone in the company just to survive. Uh, it's not like you're laying off people tomorrow. You're going until the beginning of June. The time frame to react to other things that happen. If you're going to delay to wait on what happens with the federal government, look at what happened with the last programs that happened. The Small Business Payroll Protection Program, the fund, $300 billion was gone in 10 days. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be a drop in the bucket. It will not solve all the issues. You have to begin planning for and arranging for the cuts now. And the reality is, Shelter in place order may end, say it ends June 1. The reality is the economy is not going to start regenerating that revenue for you immediately. There's going to be a delay. You're doing the prudent thing, very difficult thing to do, and it's tough on everyone involved. But to say to wait is a nonsensical idea. To say that to dry, dry all of your rainy day funds now to solve the thing, if the shelter in place ordinance stays until August or September, you're now in a worse position than you are now and have to make your cuts even more. You need to look at it and use it judiciously as you go forward. Again, I don't envy you. I've already had to go through it myself with my 27, formerly 27 employees, which is now less than that. Uh, we're looking at a scenario where every one of our clients is closed and our clients are across the country. So it's, you're lucky you've been able to wait this long to have to deal with it. And if anything, you probably need to deal with it quicker than you're even planning to. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay. Uh, just reminding uh, individuals too, please uh, dial star five to raise your hand. There are a few folks who've been on the call for a while, 0163 and 3482, you are, your hands are not raised. Next caller will be 0798. Hi there, you're live with the city of Monterey. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Anderson, 
And uh, I really appreciate the uh, thorough, carefully considered reports and presentations. Your pain is evident. Uh, regarding the last caller's comment, I don't think that uh, uh, government and business are, can be exactly compared. Uh, the uh, people uh, fund the uh, government, and the government is toward people. Uh, and I believe that's been stated by a lot uh, more articulate persons than me. I did read the agenda attachments, the staff report, and proposed resolution for items 7 and 8. I have one question. Uh, oh, but first I want to say that uh, this rapid response that you've got is seems well considered. Um, I admire it. Uh, I do have a question about the, the terminology in the resolution, which is reducing positions. Is that the same as laying off staff with intent to return, or does reducing positions mean that the positions may or may not exist? Uh, when they or may or may not be reinstated, the positions themselves. Um, so I want to keep my test, my comments practical, and I am concerned, of course, with this terrible financial crisis. Uh, I want to know what will sustain the people who call Monterey home. I want, you know, I, I just want to ask that question. I want you to ask that question on sustaining. How much will the morale of the community be further depressed by the loss of the outreach products that the city's dedicated public servants are providing? Uh, what will facilitate prompt return of services when the buildings open again? I read in the report, and there's three library staff, many museums. Please. Consider keeping a few more positions for the library, museums, and recreation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Our next caller will be 5722. Hi there. Hi, this is Laura Pratt. I'm gem chair as well as a citizen of Monterey. I believe that you should be voting no on this item uh it's premature we have a healthy emergency reserve fund that should be utilized the executive staff should be taking a minimum 20 percent cut as other public and private agencies in the area have done uh, the financial slides referred to the top um you know, that we have a uh, higher TOT and yet we have the lowest TOT rate in the area, which I've been talking about for years that we should have raised. And for 37 years, the city of Monterey has not raised, which just shows and proves that people come to Monterey and they're going to be coming back to Monterey. And in fact, if you look around now, even during the closure, people are here in Monterey in force and getting free parking while we're supposedly tight on money. Uh, so there's a lot of things to talk about there, a lot of things that we hope you will reconsider. Uh, we feel that this shouldn't be even discussed until at least the next council meeting, and then it probably should be put on a special council meeting as a standalone item because it is such a large and controversial issue. Um, we also recommend no extra power to the city manager. You folks meet three times a month. And if you need to meet a fourth time in an emergency situation, you're always able to do that as far as bringing people back um, expeditiously. Uh, we feel that you should retain that power to do so. And you can always do it retroactively if you feel that it's necessary to do that. I would also just say quickly that the morale in the city amongst its employees has never been lower. And that's over 13 years experience talking to you. Okay, Th thank you, Laura. Uh, next call will be 7722. Hi there, you're live with the City of Monterey City Council. Thank you for taking my call. My name is Brashira Crawford, 
and I am calling uh, regarding this issue. I want to thank all the city council members and leadership for the uh, for the work that you've done so far. I reviewed the uh, board agenda, the packets, and um, and I see that a lot of work has taken place in your coming to these uh, conversations. I'm a local business owner, educator, and a very involved community member. And I would like to urge the city council to vote no on this. I believe that it's too soon. And um, I think we have to put priority in, on our people and the people in our people and the people who make this city great. Um, I feel like it's an undeserved um opposition um, for these essential workers. These are the people who um, who are essential to our community and who have invested a lot of time in making this place wonderful. Um, the library, the museums, and the parks and rec the recreation departments are um, are basically gutted with this initiative as I read it. Um, I would like to propose that the city and the council do a little more research and as previous callers mentioned, um, really use the reserve funds that we have to preserve the morale of our people here and um, actually fight for the people who have dedicated their lives um, and employment history in the city. Um, and with that, I'll take myself off the line. Again, I, um, I would like to urge the city council to vote no on this, to give it a little more time. I know we're in difficult days, but uh, 80 layoffs, that's a lot. Other cities of our size are, are not taking um, the same kind of measure. I would encourage the county to do a little more research and investigation and see what those cities have come up with and come back to us um, at the next meeting with a better proposition. Um, also, uh, the con the, uh, another consideration that I'm noticing is um, Reassignment instead of the uh, the the mass layoffs as described in in your board packet. Um, really consider reclassification and present those to the affected employees, and um, and then have the discussion from there. And with that, I'll take uh, I'll take myself off. Okay. Thank you for your comments, Matt. Next. Yep, next is 2641. Hi, you're on the call live with the city of Monterey. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. Uh, I'm the adult services and outreach librarian and volunteer coordinator for the Monterey Public Library. And I would urge you to vote no on this layoff proposal. Um, the proposed layoffs are particularly detrimental to the library because it's cutting the staff down to 85%. Leaving this department with only three staff members is completely unsustainable and will make it unable to meet the needs of our community. It also cripples our ability to maintain necessary services to the community while we're sheltering in place and coming out of it. Our physical building might be closed, but that doesn't mean our staff sits idly at home. Um, every day, we're continuing to serve our community, virtual library offerings, we're making library cards, online programming, ebooks, audiobooks, is research assistance, and, um, and referrals to find on other services. Um, if these layoffs take place, many of these will not be offered anymore because we won't have the actual staff members who are working on these projects. Each staff member holds unique skills and expertise that can't be rep replicated just because they have the same position. We're the first library in California, and we hold a very special place in the state's living history. We also know that many cities across the state have been looking to see what our area is doing to help guide them on their path. We don't want this to be the precedent that we set. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Our next call. We don't have uh, information on, but it's uh, we'll unmute the person. Thank you for joining. Hi, um, thanks so much. I'm calling in. I've got uh, a statement and a couple questions. Um, one would be going back to 2008, 2009, and what Monterey did in that um, moment. Um, 
Um, you know, I haven't heard any discussions at all about uh, retirement for employees, uh, early retirement packages for employees that, um, you know, potentially could help um, with this. And then obviously the reclassification um, for those people. Uh, and then um, the next statement or I guess question would be um, from a hospitality standpoint um, with, you know, large groups that come to this city and that have been using a conference center that currently have contracts later in the year or in 2001 and 2002. Um, you know, if there is no staff to service those people or look after them, um, how are we? How would the city maintain the money on the books from those people? And who is going to be out selling the city um, for 2001, 2002, 2003, um, so that there isn't a giant gap in the hospitality community for TOT? You need to be selling the city. Uh, and it's spaces for all of the hoteliers to make sure that people are coming here and not basically closing down that mechanism um, because the TOT will dry up from group business. Thank you. Thanks so much. Our next caller next, is 0163. Welcome. Hello. Hi there. Uh, Mayor and Council members, this is Olga Maxoff at the Monterey Conference Center. I'm speaking on behalf of the proposed layoff, particularly in respect to the Monterey Conference Center. In fiscal year 1819, the conference center had a time revenue year totaling $68 million of economic impact for our community. Even with the doors closed, these past 30 days, we have 10 visitors reserved at the Monterey Conference Center that coincides with 8,764 hotel room nights for future years. Additionally, we have saved 7,318 hotel room nights for groups that have been affected by COVID-19. By reducing the staff of the Monterey Conference Center, that really affects us here. We can't do what we're doing currently. You have to pay attention to what happens at the conference center. We are not like the library, the sports center, and the recreation centers. We are an economic driver for the Monterey Peninsula. We were passed a week and a half ago by city management to partner with CBB to drive this engine for the While our, our staff is being reduced by, like, we're down to like 20% of the staff at the conference center, and it just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Next caller is 3482. Hi, you're live. Hello. Caller 3482. Okay, we We'll try it. We'll try that person again. We'll go to the next person, 4765. You're on. Hello. Hello. Not sure. Uh... Go ahead, Nap, because they could call back. Okay. You know what? I think it's it may be an issue on my end. Let me um, having a, a problem with my connection actually. So um, okay. bear with me for just one moment. I, I got disconnected into the system. Welcome to Turbo Bridge. Please enter your conference ID and press the pound key.
The conference is in presentation mode. Your line is muted. You are now a host. Okay, let's try this again. Um, can oh, we can hear you now. Thank you. Line unmuted. Oh. All right, go go ahead. Okay, you got you can hear me now. We can hear you now. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. It's Esther Malkin. Um, I'm sorry. I think the, the line went completely dead there for a minute. So just um, briefly, I just wanted to say that my next comment is no disrespect to anybody in, on city staff, but I have mentioned this before when the conversation of Measure G came up, and I'm going to make it again so it's not going to surprise any of you, but my feeling is, is that the executive salaries are the ones that really make a dent in the budget, and I'm hoping that you're not going to be cutting a lot of low-level employees while city staff is only going to be taking an 8 or 10 or 12 percent pay cut. I realize that it's complicated with certain positions as far as unions, but I still think that it would be a better um, good faith uh, action to raise that because the people in, in your positions, as far as executive salaries that are six figures, are the ones that can weather those cuts much better and easier than the people who are making forty and fifty thousand dollars a year to work for the city. And most of them can't even afford to live in the city that they work in. So uh, even if it's um, complicated with labor, I would think that it would. For the optics, it would make the executive staff look a lot more empathetic if they weren't putting in, pulling in six-figure salaries and coming up with two-digit percentage cuts. Sorry, guys. I hate to be the one to say that, not that you're not working and earning every minute or any penny of it, but in the long run, your salaries accumulate just a lot more um, that could help the city offset this than you know, combining 80 positions of lower paying jobs. Thank you. Okay. Uh, those are all of the, the calls. If the, okay, the one well then let's uh, let's call. Thank you. Thanks. I think uh, before we go to council, I'm gonna ask our staff to respond to some of the public comments, please. Then we'll open it up to our council. Okay. Uh, one of which, uh, one one a public uh, person talked about overtime and fire. Would that be something that would be negotiated as a possibility for uh, uh, additional funds? So I'll, I'll just throw that out there. That was, uh, uh, someone mentioned that. Mayor, yes, this is, Let's see, let me take that question. This the city did just negotiate mm -hmm. with our police and fire unions, and um, we brought that to the council. Um, it seems like a long time ago, but um, a few council meetings ago, we already did negotiate significant reductions um, that we do think that the fire um, department will see in overtime, and the fire team, the fire group, um, the labor group did come forward and agree, agree to significant reductions related to overtime. Um, and I will also say that we um, both the chiefs have, um, I think eliminated um, unscheduled vacations and other things along those lines during this period. And I do think that our overtime right now is significantly reduced. Um, if that's not a correct statement, I will let them um, correct that. But we are addressing overtime. It's been a key focus of negotiations for over a year. Okay, thank you. That would answer that gentleman's question. The next one, uh, the uh, labor negotiator for Jim said, are, we, are you looking at other options, including state money, federal money, uh, bailout, et cetera? We had talked about that, but it wouldn't hurt to reiterate wh wh how we're looking at uh, some relief from other agencies. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor, we um, we are hopeful that uh, the current package that I think was approved by the Senate tonight uh, contains uh, some funding for cities under 500,000. Uh, right now, there has been no funding uh, for cities uh, under 500,000 or even counties under $500,000. Um, as, as you can imagine, uh, the, the funding that we will receive, um, I, I would uh, humbly submit to you, will be by far not able to cover our losses in the last three and a half months. So we're looking forward to, to see some of that uh, details uh, coming to us sooner than later. We haven't seen anything yet, and we are hopeful that some of the funding will be given to us. Um, as the council is aware, and Lauren briefed you about this as well, the governor of California, uh, in his efforts of redirecting and re-stimulating small businesses, has actually taken away sales tax up to $50,000. And Mr. Mayor, that includes special sales tax for Measure G, Measure P, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, oh. for Metro P and S. So everything that is in sales tax for the city of Monterey can be uh, deferred for small businesses up to $50,000. So uh, the the situation is dire for the city of Monterey, and I wanted to um, state that we are looking forward. Hans, you're, you're come, cutting in and out. Okay. Nat, are you with us? He's cutting in and out, or is it just me? It, it might just be you. He was doing uh, doing fine. I uh, hope you're doing fine, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, you were cutting in and out. Did you say the governor is taking Measure P and Measure S money, our road money? Yes. Street, uh, street money? The sales tax is taken completely with no uh, recognition of special sales tax. So I think, uh, Mr. Mayor, maybe you were going in and out, but it's a deferred deferred collection. And uh, so that means that that adds to the problem because the sales tax is not going to be coming. Oh, no, what, now ads frozen. What's the deferred time? When is the, the governor saying that that tax will come to the city's funds? Uh, after, uh, it is a interest-free loan that small business can take by retaining sales tax up to fifty thousand dollars and they have to start paying back after 12 months yeah hey hey um council member ed would you mind when once even if you're in a dialogue with somebody once you're done talking just mute your mic right away because they're I don't know why that is but specifically with you there's a lot of feedback and it's it's really loud in the in the in the speakers i will do that but there's feedback it's probably because it's late and it's in my head <laughs> thank you <laughs> so again hans I, I still missed uh the governor's plan is to take measure p and measure s money which is uh one one cent for street sidewalks and storm drains you said yes yes sir i did Okay, thank you. Now you're coming in. Wow, that's another hit. Have we estimated how much that's going to cost us yet? No, we have we have not time to to look into that. Again, it's up to the small businesses how they want to use it or not. That's also an unknown factor for us. I can tell you that, um, and Lauren can uh, explain this even better. But until we really understand what this happens to us, sales tax gets remitted every. Three months, I believe, uh, Lauren. And if you can tell us when we can see the next sales tax coming to us, that's the first time where we can see actually what the hit might be. So may I comment on that? Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Please. So the $50,000 deferment per qualified small business will have about a $500,000 impact on the general fund and about a $600,000 on the measure PNS in the first year. While it is a deferment, and these are small businesses, the risk that's going to happen is if these businesses are altogether terminated and closed, mm -hmm. will the city have any recourse? Because technically, these sales tax have already been collected from consumers. And the city, the state is allowing the businesses to borrow this and not remit the payment. 
And so uh, we as a city are in essence the conduit lender and our hope we wait with updated breath that these businesses will stay solvent and we'll be able to pay the city a half a million dollar in general fund and $600,000 in measure PNS money. Um, the half a million dollars is in the presentation that I delivered earlier this evening. Thank you, Lauren. That just compounds uh, the, the difficulty. Another question was, why is, and I think there was an excellent slide on that, but it looks like the city of Monterey is doing more layoffs than other cities. I think there were two answers to that. One was the slide which showed, uh, and again, if you have that slide uh, readily, it shows uh, a, a sports center, a conference center, uh, a harbor, parking, and that other cities simply don't have. And those have been the primary hits. Then secondly, I think it was uh, explained that other cities will probably be right behind us in and looking at balancing their budgets. So if you want to add anything to that. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I, I can tell you that also many cities around us, uh, as you pointed out, uh, are already on a very, very limited service level, uh, providing uh, very limited services in their recreation departments, uh, let alone don't have uh, other services like we have or have lesser staffing in the libraries. That was the chart that Allison showed you. The uh, city of Monterey has been very lucky and very blessed to uh, still operate for recreation centers, to still operate seven days a week a library. We have a sports center uh, that opens uh, at 5 a.m. and closes at 9 p.m. So we have been very lucky, whereas other cities around us really have uh, not those assets anymore in operation. And uh, of course, that is part now of our challenge to maintain those high level of services. Yes, and then the another question, which I think you've addressed, and uh, that was from the conference center. How how once we're reopened, uh, will we have the staff to start marketing again to fill up the conference center, and will we have the staff uh, for the library? That was raised by both people, and I think you've made it very clear that we were rehiring as quickly as we can once we're open. Yes, but and, yes, and the main people. Yeah. And um, our conference center staff, our conference center manager uh, is working on, on a reopening plan that, that starts with uh, day one reopening and then counts backwards what we have to do for the reopening. Um, the staff uh, indicated also that they will be still in, in the conference center working till about uh, the, the end of May, beginning of June. Uh, the staff that we leave in the conference center with, with the conference center manager, as well as uh, I believe two other staff members, um, they will be uh, qualified enough to handle the, the sales calls that we are getting right now. And again, we, we will not be shy to step up and re-staff folks uh, when we see that there are openings uh, for additional business. Um, the, the library is in the same position. Um, I've asked Inga last week, Thursday, to tell me what she needs when we are reopening the library. And um, uh, again, I, I hope that uh, Inga and, and her team will present to us also how the gradually opening of the library will look like. So we are working on those plans, as you stated, uh, to reopen all the facilities. but. Uh, our revenues right now need to catch up also with our expenses to a certain degree. And um, right now we cannot fiscally foresee uh, at what time we have fully restored all, all service levels. Okay, then a final question and thank you council for allowing me to uh, ask these questions on behalf of the public. I didn't want to dominate the discussion. And that was in, during the great recession, 2008, 2009, there were tools which were used during our last fiscal crisis, are we looking at those same tools now? And I think a couple of things happened there. There were layoffs and there was a question about retire retirements and retiring. Would, uh, did the, would the city be asking uh, employees who are close to retirement if that would be something they would consider? So what were the tools that we used last time? So allow me to say, I really look forward to have a great recession right now. Uh, uh, yeah. 
because 2008, 2009 was way more manageable than what we are facing right now. We were way, we were able to track our revenues. We were able to track the downturn. We were able to trend. So 2008, 2009 was um, um, a, a real challenge for our city and for our revenues, but it was absolutely traceable. We could foresee trends and we could uh, ex, uh, we could calculate them in a e way easier way. Uh, we never had an 85% reduction in, in our hospitality industry. Right. Uh, so the tools that we used in 2008, 2009 were also that we looked at layoffs and we did this in, in certain areas that we felt comfortable doing it. Um, we uh, looked at uh, our tree crews at that time and we looked at our custodial teams, et cetera, et cetera. And the council uh, at that time decided to implement layoffs in certain areas. And um, these, these were tools that we could use at that time also because we had a very predictable event as when you compare it to our current pandemic. We cannot predict anything right now other that we know that we don't know yet. So uh, in 2008, 2009, we reduced uh, department heads, we reduced managers, we reduced other employees. We also reduced police officers and firefighters at that time. So it was a combination of, of all those steps. We were lucky enough that we had attrition in certain areas. A retirement program cost money, uh, no matter how you want to scale that. We just completed a retirement program, I believe, in 2017 um, that uh, included uh, employees that were eligible to retire, that we paid them up to three years of healthcare coverage pending on their um, seniority. Um, I cannot say right now that we have the financial funds to pay for a retirement program. Um, and um, again, a golden handshake, or no matter how you label it, uh, might be also something that that we can look into and also explore further. But I, I need to tell you, I'm deeply pessimistic that we have the funds in place to do that right now, uh, like we did in 2017. And we did also, I believe, something in 2008, 2009. So um, the situation is different. And uh, like I stated before, um, this pandemic is is completely unforeseeable in our assessment right now. Thank you, and I appreciate everyone's patience to get those questions answered. So, council, comments, questions, please. Who wants to go first? Uh, Danny, you want to start us off? Sure, I'll start. These, these are questions. I'll, I'll leave the comments to the end when all the questions, I'm sure that the other council members have questions too. So, and they, those answers may, uh, may help my comments. So the first question, I've got a couple. The first question um, is to, to our city manager, Hans. Um, it, they did bring up uh, one 2008, which we just discussed, obviously. And uh, I'm, I'm just asking the question about our revenues coming out of 2008. Um, and I'm sure that we, we have more revenues than we had in 2008. I'm sure of that. Is that that's correct, isn't it, Hans? We're making yeah. more money than we did in 2008. Absolutely. So the, the layoffs that we had in 2008, did, did all those employees come back when the revenue came back? Or did we, um, did we keep the departments at a, a, a different rate? A different so so what, what I'd like you to, um, what I'd like to state is, um, in 2008, we had no facility closed by, by the state of California or the Monterey County Health Officer. The sports center was open and we had visitors. The recreation centers were open and we had visitors. Uh, our parking garages and our parking lots were collecting parking revenues. Uh, our TOT was down. Our sales tax was down. But we still had visitors coming to the city of Monterey and the visiting, if I remember the occupancy rates correctly, out of the time dropped to probably in the low 60% level. Right now we have 15% occupancy that we hope we actually have. We don't know the data yet, 
but the data that the MCCVB shares with us is 85% down. So the situation in 2008, 2009 was somewhat better, way better than it is today. And um, you ask another question. Would you remind me quickly uh, what we, oh yeah, the employees. Sorry, Sorry also, I forgot. What we, <laughs> what we did with the employees was that we were actually lucky to use attrition and reassignments inside the city. So some of, I spoke about, we uh, eliminated at this time our tree crews. And except for one person who did not want to um, get a position, so to speak, all employees were reassigned to different uh, divisions. So we have one uh, tree crew worker I know working in, 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 in our parks division and he is, assigned to Dennis the Menace Park. We have another tree worker who's working in streets. So we were able to shift people around. Uh, when I spoke about firefighters positions that we didn't backfill, they were, they were part of a safer grant and we were lucky enough to use attrition to not backfill. So the numbers were quite differently at that time. Our revenues were still coming in and we had less employees that, that we actually had to lay off. I think we had actually only one actual person leave city employment. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Hans, I had to ask that question, but you're the, the chief historian in our, in, our, um, in our city. So I was just curious about, even though we had uh, more revenue coming in, why those positions weren't, um, weren't put back. Uh, the second question is, um, as I see in your staff report, uh, we have uh, $10 million that are going to be uh, of lost revenue that's going to be backfilled by the uh, CIP and the NCIP. Um, my question is, if we're backfilling to make the budget whole, how come we're laying off? Can you rephrase the question, please? Yeah. Okay, so we're losing $10 million of revenue. Yes. And what I'm hearing is that the reason we're, we're laying off is because we're losing $10 million of revenue. But it sounded to me like we're taking funds out of those two areas to make up that $10 million. So why are we laying off? Because uh, we are continuing to put, find, we, we, we have to continue to find funds to make up the continued revenue loss. So if we are not taking uh, the proposed step of a layoff without corresponding revenues, we will continue to bleed cash. And we need to find, you need to find then council uh, on July 1st, another $10 million to anticipate for the uh, next losses that we will have in the next three months. So. It is it is it is an, a zero sum game, uh, so to speak. To say, well, we put everyone whole, and then we hope that by June thirtieth, miraculously, July first, our sports center is full, our recreation programs are humming, and the conference center is starting a beautiful conference again. That is the challenge to predict that this will actually happen. So, so basically, Hans, and then I'll. I'm done. Basically, the way I see it is that we're laying off um, in uh, response to future lost revenues. You can say it that way, but we are laying off because right now the facilities are shut down right. through COVID-19, and, okay. and we are not use we are not selling those services, or we are not getting reimbursed for those services. Okay. And what, what you will see sooner or later is if we are opening those services up again, we will backfill those positions with the folks that we are talking about right now. And our recreation program, our recreation fees, our sports center fees, et cetera, et cetera, will help us to recover the cost for those employees that we then back reinstate. Okay, thank you. I have one other question, but I'll let other council members ask questions. Okay, other questions, please. Mr. Uh, Mayor? Mr. Mayor? Okay. Uh, Mr. Allen, please. Yeah, um, this is not my question. I think Mike Sovereign asked, how much money will be basically saved or how much are we projecting will be saved 
by the layoffs. So that's um, one question that I I know the answer to, but I think it would be good if staff could speak to that. There was another question from, I think, Elizabeth Anderson. She, she, and again, I think I know the answer, but it'd be good if staff could speak to this. She talked about the resolution, identifies that we would be reducing positions, and she wanted clarity on whether we're talking about um, permanent or temporary reduction in positions. And I think we heard earlier it's temporary or it's intended to be temporary, but I think it would be good if staff could speak to that. And then we heard from somebody who works in the conference center, I didn't catch your name, about how the economic activity of the city will be driven if we lay off the conference center staff who are basically arranging for future events to come to the conference center. So those were, I think, three questions that were asked I haven't heard answered yet. I think it'd be good if staff could speak to those. So the, the corresponding monthly savings through the layoffs will be around $950,000 monthly. Uh, can you repeat the number two question that was about RPTs, regular part-timers or part-timers? Yeah, I think the question from Elizabeth Anderson was in the resolution, it talks about reducing positions. And it wasn't clear to her if that was temporary or yeah. reduction. And I, I let Allison explain that. That's a technical explanation necessary. Allison, please. Yes. Um, the way that it's drafted in the agenda report, under the city code, we have the ability, the city council has the ability to reduce positions through a layoff process with reemployment rates. So we're just being very specific to match our city code rules when we wrote out that agenda report. But essentially what that is, is a position reduction through layoff because that's the process, but with rights to reemploy as soon as possible, making it temporary. So it's a temporary, we're, it's a layoff that we hope is temporary. Okay, and then the third one had to do with the economic, driving the economic activity, with the conference center being the major driver. How do we do that when we're gonna be laying off um, so many of those folks there. Yes, and 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 uh, thank you for for that question and the the clarification that I can offer is that we are staffed right now uh, until the end of May with a full contingent of employees. So whatever comes through our telephones and our uh, requests for proposals, uh, we will be responsible and responsive to that till the end of May. Um, if if the if there continues to be a continued flow of, of bookings etc um, and that will and this might overwhelm the remaining staff that we have there with the conference center manager and another sales associate um, we will we will backfill we will bring back the employees at the present time uh, it is our assessment with what we have and what will remain in the in the conference center we are sufficiently covering the request for proposals coming from potential uh, conventions. Um, again, convention business is, is, is again, something we cannot really predict right now. Uh, we, ha we, 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 we heard that large gatherings for the remainder of the year might be postponed by, uh, by, by the state. Uh, you heard that. So I feel very comfortable right now that what we leave in place with our general manager, who is a very experienced a former hotel operator and sales manager and knows his way around, um, plus an, a, a sales associate, we are, we are very capable of handling what we are getting in as requests. And again, like I stated before, if we feel this is coming in better than we expected, more inquiries and we cannot catch up with that, we will bring the appropriated staff back. But keep in mind also the conference center staff is not just sales staff. There are staff also who are event organizers and helping the conventions in, in setup and organizing and being their point of contact. We have also support staff that cleans the facility, that does minor maintenance tasks. So all this is part of right now our proposed layoff because we really do not have jobs to do right now. 
Thank you, Hans. Um, those were my questions. So I've got comments. I'll wait till we get to that part of the discussion. All right. So I think we're uh, asking questions and saving comments. So other questions from our council? <clears throat> I'll go uh, ahead and if I may. I have, I have one. Bye. Go. Yes. Go ahead. Please, Ed. So uh, a piece of this, although we did not um, hear it from Allison, or did we talk about it before? But the process of navigating and helping uh, those that are laid off uh, through the process. If I tracked it right, we're talking about a June 2nd date, insurance to July 31st, and that's uh, basically 40 days away from tomorrow will be June 2nd. W when can a laid off employee submit for unemployment and how long are they likely to have to wait for unemployment to start knowing it's going to start after their paycheck arrives sometime in mid-June? How long do they have to wait and how can we help them navigate? Thank you, council member. So um, it's hard for me to answer those questions given the volume of unemployment claims that are happening with the state. Um, we did get assurance, though, that um, this extra $600 offered by the federal government was starting to be provided to employees, I think, it, last week, um, that were unemployed for those that are already unemployed. Um, we did put together a presentation on how to apply for unemployment, and um, my staff has put that together. Um, they, we are going to be providing it to employees in English and Spanish. We will also be meeting with them one-on-one -on -one to help them fill out unemployment application. Um, they can start doing so immediately. I don't know how soon, I'm hoping. Um, the wait period has been reduced. They, they got rid of the wait period for unemployment. So we are hoping that we could give employees the time to plan for this and to file now so that there is no delay. Um, so we will start meeting with them as early as tomorrow if this is approved. Um, setting up one-on-one -on -one meetings and helping employees navigate the process because we know it's a difficult one and we want to do whatever we can to provide um, assistance to to set set themselves up as best as possible. Great, thank you. Um, and this is a question for Hans. Um, as I read through the material uh, today, we also learned from Allison tonight some of the labor groups and some of the the management groups have have offered to give back some of their salaries. Um, so what's the mechanism that that I can offer that we bring back and act on the city council and the mayor uh, giving back and suspending our stipends? It's not much, but I just feel like we ought to do what we can and uh, decline a stipend for the time being. So how would we do that? Th th thank you, Mr. Uh Mr. Smith, Councilmember Smith, thank you uh, for that proposal. Uh, the good news is uh, it's easy to negotiate with all of you because you're not organized. So, <laughs> hey, hey, you mean an organized uh, a labor group? Well, hopefully, I have, I have, uh, <laughs> I have teachers there and 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 a former police uh, officer as well. So so I know that you very well understand what uh, labor means and appreciate. <laughs> Uh, but uh, if you don't, uh, if you like to forego your stipends, and I need also to tell you that um, a, a commissioner from the planning commission has also su suggested that uh, all it takes is that you let us know and uh, tell us uh, what what it entails, and we will be happy to accommodate your request as well. And I I uh, want to thank you for for that proposal, uh, Council Member Ed. Okay, thank you. And I'll step aside and wait for comments and like to hear from everybody else. Okay, more questions. Tyler, I think you've been waiting patiently. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, so in regards to my question portion, I, I think I would start off by um, just asking the question um, of furlough versus layoff. I know that was discussed extensively through the staff report, um, but I think the question is more of um, how we should be, con what it looks like that we should be considering. So um, uh, I guess part of it is, I know that we can't make that decision if we decide to move forward with the furlough, um, but if we 
gave staff time to meet with the bargaining units to consider that as an uh, as an alternative, um, knowing that it would be very challenging to get there. Um, I, I I just kind of want to ask that question, um, and then in in alignment with the furlough question. Um, there's another element of it where in this in the staff report I identified um, an automatic um, across the board. Does that necessarily mean um, across the board, or is that just generally what's done in a furlough? Could we do a partial partial furlough? Um, and then how does um, uh, if we went through a furlough, how would that affect opportunities for individuals to apply for? unemployment. I was under the impression mm -hmm. that folks can apply if there is a reduction in hours or pay. Um, so those are my questions in regards to the furlough topic. Good ones. Yeah, I, I let Allison answer that. Um, again, uh, it's driven by the Monterey City Code that we have to apply. Uh, but um, Allison, if you wouldn't mind answering that uh, for Councilmember Williamson as well. Of course. Yeah. So um, we certainly are going to be meeting with the bargaining units immediately. Um, and if they are, are offering furloughs, then we will absolutely bring that to you and then cost out what those savings will be and how that could impact this, um, this decision um, moving forward between now and June 2nd. Um, furloughs can mean a bunch of different things. There's no real de definition for it. I think the way the city has typically done furloughs is to do something where they do like a modified work week where you take a furlough of maybe 10% and don't work every other Friday, or you furlough um, a holiday closure period. Um, we certainly looked at all of those options, and I think we are open to considering all of them. The, the, the big concern here is that um, that amount of furlough would need to be pretty significant to match the general fund um, impacts that we're seeing. So that's something just to consider. But certainly if we do get um, groups that are agreeing to do a furlough, we can see how that would reduce the layoff option. So we will absolutely bring that forward. Um, as I said before, in order to match the $950,000 in monthly reductions that this plan would have, that would be a 20% across the board for every employee, including all public safety, everyone. If we just limited it to the bargaining units being impacted, that is much larger than a 20% furlough. So that's what we're, we're needing to meet with the groups about. Um, the other thing that you asked about was what does that look like for unemployment? A reduction in hours can still, you can still qualify for unemployment and it's gonna depend on what your salary is. Um, the higher your salary is, the less ability you will have um, if you've already hit the maximum amount. Um, but with so you so it depends. So that's an it depends answer is that a reduction in hours may still allow you to apply for unemployment or it may you may already have be maxed out in how much you make. So you won't get the unemployment. Um, but again, under, if I understand the law correctly, if you have $1 of state unemployment, you get that extra $600 a month. Um, so that's something we will look at and consider absolutely. Um, one of the things too, I just wanted to mention that um, employees, I think it's making, it's about 54, if you make about $54,000 a year, you are eligible for state and that federal unemployment. Um, you will not see a reduction in salary because the maximum weekly benefit will match your salary. Um, so it's for anyone making more than fifty-four thousand, they'll see a reduction in their salary. We have a number of employees. I think it's about fifteen employees on the layoff list um, whose unemployment benefit should should mirror their salary, so long as the federal plan remains in place and is funded. Um, so that's also information to know, but. We will be meeting with the groups about additional concessions and if we are able to modify this. Um, the other concern that we did have is that knowing that this is a 10, we have a $10 million loss in revenues in just three months. Um, these layoffs are saving less than a million dollars each month. Those months that we provide additional health care, that is reduced by $100,000. So if we're needing to have more than a million dollars a month in cost savings, 
um, these layoffs are, um, are not sufficient. So even if we get additional concessions, um, they may reduce layoffs, but we need, may need to find additional cost saving measures. So that's a complicated answer, but yes, it's a very good question. It's on the top of all of our minds. How can we not have layoffs or reduce layoffs or mitigate layoffs by other concessions? We will be looking at that. Allison, I wanna just build on the question that Tyler asked uh, just really quickly, Tyler, then back to you. And you're talking about furloughs. They, they could include one general group. They could include the entire city. Could they include, uh, I think a librarian wrote us in an email and said, we would be willing to furlough. Could, could a building do it? Or does it have to be the whole organization or the whole group, the whole union? It's negotiated by bargaining unit, and in order for a department to do it, um, like for the library, that library has three different labor unions, and we would have to negotiate with each one to impact that group. So if they were saying they wanted to take a larger furlough or a different furlough or a different concession than other departments, we would just have to make sure that each labor group was in agreement with that. Got it. Okay, uh, Tyler, more questions? Yeah, um, and, and let me, I'll probably say this a few times, but I, I really appreciate the work that staff is doing and, and I um, don't think that there's any ill will here. I think that everybody's trying to be a team player. As a matter of fact, I'm hearing a lot of the emotion in um, how um, the issue is being presented tonight. So I, I'm going to be pushing back a little bit and, and trying to find alternative solutions just to make sure that we're, reaching everything, but I just wanted to put that out because I'm not intending to be in an attack mode. Um, uh, what, my next question is, um, I'm hoping, um, and, and I'm not sure if this if if it matters at this point, because if, if the council decides to move forward with this action, um, but I, I don't think I really see, have seen anywhere how many um, positions are gonna be removed um, from each department. I know that it, we, we see in the staff report um, the expected number of um, positions on the position control list, but sometimes those are broken up into part-time employees. And so it, that number is different compared to actually how many employees are affected by in which departments. And so I was wondering if that is available and that that's something that we could see. Yes, you can see it starting on page 163 of your package. Okay, so, so one, two, there are no subtotals, but it gives you a good idea by adding it up quickly. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So there's only 16 positions that are affected in the library. Uh, if I'm counting the number of uh, yes. positions that are identified there, it's only 16 positions that are affected. Is that accurate? Yes, yes, I would say uh, 16 positions, uh, and as you heard a couple of times, uh, the estimate by, by a lot of email writers was 85%. Okay, and how many positions total are there in the library? Uh, I would say 19 to 20. Okay. Um, and then... Um, one of the things that, um, and, and I've discussed this before in the past in regards to um, vacant positions, um, how much of the savings that we're seeing is, a, is from the vacant positions that are being proposed to be removed from the big, um, position control list versus the ones that are currently filled? About 20%, I would estimate right now, and 80% of the other savings come from uh, employees that are being uh, laid off. Okay. Um, are there other vacant positions that are still on the vacant, uh, on the position control list if we move forward with the changes that are being made today? We grabbed all the vacant positions that we feel we can grab. We didn't grab vacant positions uh, in the ranks of police officers or firefighters, but almost everything that was vacant that we felt we, we could use, we, 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 we took. Um, 
so I can tell you right now, whatever we had, we, we, we put into that package. How many positions from police and how many from fire are vacant currently? I don't know, but I would guess four to five positions in police might be vacant right now. Okay. Um, I, um, it's, 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 it's also noteworthy that in 2008, we had 63 sworn officers. 2008, 2009, about 63 sworn officers. We are now down to 52, 53 sworn officers. And um, it's a priority of, of mine not to touch public safety. Of Ooh. course, we can overrule that. You said four to five for police. How many for fire? Um, Ish. Every, uh, every fire station is, is filled with the uh, right contingents. Um, the uh, police chief just texted me. He says he has one vacant position uh, right now, and uh, we have zero vacancies right now in fire. Uh, but of course, we have uh, cadets in, in the fire academy, five, with, well, because we anticipate uh, retirement sooner than later. Okay. Um, so in the agenda packet, we received a letter from the Monterey Executive Management Employees Association, MEMA, um, which for the public that represents all of the non, um, um, I can't, I forgot what that word is that identifies the ones that aren't part of it. The non-confidential department non -confidential, head. Thank you, Allison. Um, so non-confidential executives in the city. Um, and so those members sent a letter stating they are prepared to reopen their MOU and take a 10% reduction in pay. Um, they are being offered, uh, they're offering um, it upon the condition that savings generated are used to the extent possible to reduce the number of layoffs or to provide support to those that are being laid off. Um, uh, and examples, continuation of benefits, et cetera. So I'm wondering how does this proposal plan to incorporate their condition? And I know that I'm assuming there, that this will all have to be discussed in negotiations, but I just wonder, is there um, plans to consider, what are the plans to consider that, I guess? That's an item that Allison will discuss at the negotiating table with, with a group of MIMIA. And I can just also mention that timing-wise, by in it, um, getting that letter and getting it before you, um, but able to, being able to cost it, determine how it could impact layoffs. Um, we did have a meeting with the MIMIA, with the, um, the, the fire chief is the head of that group, met with him, and we did talk about the fact that we could um, meet with you at the next council meeting in May and still have that be um, implemented May 1st um, so that we could do it as quickly as possible. So we are looking at that right now, costing it and figuring out um, how this could help or mitigate any of the impacts or layoffs. So we will have that for you absolutely at the next council meeting. Okay. And then the last question I have for now is um, the alternatives presented in the staff report are limited to um depleting the city's funds for economic uncertainty um can additional alternatives be presented could there be a plan to utilize a portion of the reserves in addition with other efforts examples include applying for covid 19 related grants and various other program funding um, and i know that there was discussion of around um the time that it, it would take perhaps not being worth it and and concern around um, the length of time that it would take to receive the funding. Um, but I, part of my thought here is that I think any little amount helps. And and so associated with that question, could some of the employees that are being proposed to be removed support the city's effort to apply for those um, if everybody else is kind of caught up on the services that we're considering essential based off of the, um, the shelter in place order? Yeah, Tyler, this is a, a very good question. Um, I, I remind you what Rick Hoyer was saying. Uh, even though there are a lot of grants out there for small businesses and a lot of tax credits, et cetera, uh, what, what uh, Rick Hoyer was telling you that uh, at the end of, of all those grants that were part of the first CARES package, um, he laid off uh, Office 27 em employees, most of those employees. 
So it is good to, to we will apply for grants, we will apply uh, we, for other funding that might be available, but I hate to break it to the council. This will be not the saving grace for us. Uh, we can be happy if we get something that is six digit figures. And uh, I think I would estimate also it will be well below a million dollars. So the, the, the financial uh, challenges that we are facing, the money that we hope that we can get through a CARES Act, um, it, it will probably be uh, not uh, offsetting the, the revenue losses that we have. I would even not say probably it will not offset the revenue losses. Um, and again, uh, applying for the grants uh, is, is a skill set that we have retained. Uh, and we have folks that, that know how to do that uh, in the most efficient way. And, and um, it might be not uh, the, um, it might be possible to train someone else and do the cross training and have someone else do it. But what, what are you doing after you've submitted the grant? So, so the point is um, um, there, are, there will be hard choices coming. If we have chances to, to re employ people or keep people employed because those doors will, uh, might might open, we will walk through those doors, uh, absolutely. But I don't think right now that might be that that may be um, that may be an additional alternative. And as such, we will use this as an additional alternative. Yes. Um, is is it possible for? And I don't want to do too much micromanaging here, but I think it's helpful for the public to see those opportunities that are potentially available to the city and to see which ones we're not absolutely not eligible for, which ones we've applied for and we've heard nothing. I mean, I think it's great to give an update as far as kind of where we're at with those. Is that possible to do? Absolutely. Pull down CARES Act number one, Google it, and take a look how much money was available. No, for no, but, but if, we have the future, if there are future opportunities, Tyler, we will post that and uh, the public can help us identify those funds that would be utmost helpful for us. I just think uh, can, part of my point is is that it's it's I think perhaps good for us as a city to market that to the community and let folks know like hey we're doing everything we can here's the information putting it out there so that the public knows that you know this is a dead end this is promising um, you know and, and I know it's it's there's work associated with that and there's a lot going on. Um, with the staff and, and the work that you're doing in, in your office, Hans. Um, I, I just think that the more that we can show the public um, the efforts that we're making, I think um, uh, the better support that we can have from the public and the efforts that we're doing. Absolutely. Okay. That's all my questions for now. Mayor, I have one more question, Mayor, and that's it. Okay. No, this is fine. This is super important. Let's go. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Allison, I, I have a question for you. Um, all the, great presentation, by the way, Allison. I, that was a wonderful. I mean, I, it was, I've done those kind of presentations before, and, and those are always very, very difficult. So yeah. um, well, well thought out plan, staff. But I did, I did look at one slide, and this, I looked at them all, but this one slide that really you have a lot of work to do from tonight until June 1st. I mean, there is a lot of things that you have to cover. So my question is, and I've already heard, you've already heard this from some of the people that called in, what, how, how would it affect this whole process if, if the layoff didn't happen on June 1st and it happened in the middle of June? What, what, what kind of effect would that be? As far as staff workload or as far as economics? Economics and staff workload. I mean, I, I just looked at that, yeah. that bullet list. I don't know how you're going to get all that done by June 1st. Um, I, I can say that um, the, the team that I have in HR um, have worked tirelessly the minute that we've um, – the first couple of weeks, we were trying to make sure everyone worked remotely. The next couple of weeks, we were trying to figure out how to implement the new federal laws for paid leave. Um, the team has been amazing. They've spent the last, as soon as we knew that um, that layoffs were the, the recommendation, um, 
my team has had to go through and look through every single person's personnel file that might be impacted to determine seniority rights because our computer systems go, don't go back far enough to track work history. Um, Jay Punker was loaned to our team from the city manager's office to do that as well. Gina Russo had lead, led that effort. Um, it was a tremendous effort. And so I can tell you that all I can say is that my team has been preparing and planning for this and we will accomplish it if this is what the what the council determines to do. Um, we Everyone will just continue working at a, a pretty feverish pace to get it done. Um, Rafael Albarn in my office put together that presentation with Serena Ladati on the unemployment and doing it in Spanish as well. Um, Stephanie Brown and Cheryl Coretis, I just, all of them have been doing amazing work getting it ready. It's not something they wanted to get ready for. It's not something a month ago we ever thought we would be doing. Um, but they do want to provide all of the assistance to employees. So we have already laid out a plan to have a number of us setting out times to meet with employees and going through this process. So it will happen if it needs to happen. Um, as far as what would a later June impact do, um, it would still only allow health insurance to go through June, July 31st, unless we're able to negotiate something with the labor group. So it won't impact the date of health insurance. Um, so simply would add two more weeks um, to employees pay. Um, we are getting to the point where employees Many employees in this list um, have utilized all their paid leave options that we've provided as extra paid leave. They've done all their training. Um, they don't, now they're going to start like going into their own personal accruals. Some of them are probably hoping to be able to cash those out if they need to, but they might be able to use ones that aren't cashed out. Um, I have no good solid answers for it because it's complicated, but um, We'll we'll do what we need to do to get it done in the time frame that we need to get it done um, in the best interest in the city. If we had two more weeks, that would be more time to meet with employees, and it would be, um, you know, less of a strain to get it done all in time with um, the staff that we have. But as far as the economic impact, I don't want to speak on that. That's not kind of my role. I think it would be half of the nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right, sure. Do, do you think that that would help in negotiations if we had some additional time when it comes to concessions? Huh. Tough question, I know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that might be something that we come to you in May and say, hey, we've met with all the groups. They wanted it. They're, they're asking us to push layoffs off or adding this to it or whatever it is. And I, I, I want us to be open to considering all those options um, so that we lessen the impact um for sure so city, um, Man city manager are you open to um if it uh if by june 30th um our staff is saying i think we're pretty close is there a way that we could prolong this for another even if we vote on it tonight uh that we could push it out another two weeks is that something that that staff would be willing to do it is the pleasure of the council, uh, what staff is willing to do. Um, you asked a question, uh, you asked a question about, um, will we get a better result if we prolong the negotiations by an additional four weeks? And um, I will tell you, in my opinion, uh, we might get a better result if there is more pressure to negotiate in a faster amount of time. That is my assessment. Uh, on the other hand, if you have more time, uh, maybe you can create also more understanding by the employee group. But uh, giving what I understand from negotiations in the past, um, uh, if you have a tight deadline, uh, people might be more willing to come to the table and negotiate real and uh, start talking immediately business and the grandstanding that you see sometimes in negotiations might be fall to the wayside and you really start talking business. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor. I think I'm done with my questions. Okay, uh, let me uh, conclude with a question or two of my own. Um, so as, as I'm hearing the discussion and the presentation, and thank you, uh, by the way, I think the presentations really did allay some of the fears that is out there, that we are not closing the library, we're not closing recreation centers, 
uh, we're, we're basically the govern the governor has done it. Uh, they're not open. We would open them right now if we could. So if with the approval of temporary layoffs, it's understood that we're looking at reducing layoffs impact through negotiations, uh, bringing people back as soon as possible. And we're looking at the opportunities to reopen everything, including the library. It doesn't matter if it's a revenue generator or not. And as I look at the unemployment benefits, it's six to six months right now. Will be nine months if the federal government extends it. There are two things uh, that I most would be most concerned about because when we look at positions, you have to be looking at these are human beings. And in this situation, I've been through it as a school teacher, layoffs. Uh, fortunately, I never did get laid off, but I remember my colleagues being laid off. And one is health insurance. And I would be interested personally in providing extended health insurance. The whole argument of Medicare for all, call it what you want, but someone put a really good question for it. It was uh, actually with Stephen Colbert. <laughs> and, and he said, you have to be employed to be insured. And so you could do Obamacare, but it would I would be very interested in going forward that we be able to, the city be able to provide health insurance to anyone on the layoff list. So I throw that out as a question. I think you were talking about 100,000 a month, but I think probably the biggest fear one would have, if you have a six or nine month uh, unemployment insurance, the chances are very, very good you're going to be back. And that's our goal, to bring people back. But the health insurance would probably frighten me the most. And I, I personally would be willing to commit to uh, paying that for layoff uh, employees. So I would throw that on the table. And uh, then... I would probably uh, just request we review the minimum library staffing to make sure that we have the right number. We've had some public comment from staff members who say there's a lot, there's a lot of work being done right now and outreach, et cetera. That would be the, the second thing I would look at. So one, if we approve temporary layoffs, we want to reduce layoffs through negotiations. We want to bring people back as soon as possible. Uh, we want to reopen as soon as possible. Six to nine months unemployment insurance would, if I were laid off, that would be a cushion that would make me feel better. Can we help with health insurance and review minimum library staffing? That's kind of where I am right now. So the question would be, that was a statement. The question would be, can we, uh, can we as a council in a city make sure that people have health, have health insurance. I hate to see them go COBRA, then go Obamacare. If we have the ability and we may, maybe that's what the uh, uh, reserve for uh, economic uncertainty is. We maybe use some of that to make sure that everybody has health insurance. That's gotta be the biggest fear. How would we do that to provide health insurance going going forward? Yes, Mr. Until people back. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we can make this happen. Um, we were considering this and talking about this within our small team right now. Uh, we became aware also of uh, some real needs by some employees that approached us and explained where they see immediate need for their families right now with respect to healthcare. Completely agree with you. Healthcare is, is a human right. And uh, we should make sure that our employees um, uh, e that temporarily get laid off have uh, sufficient health care. So uh, that's something we, we will consider and we'll find a way of funding that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're at the comment point and are we ready to move on any of this? If I could just ask a, a follow-on question to that that point about the healthcare, how much are we looking at in regards to healthcare? If that was a, an element that we decided to continue providing, I think the mayor's estimate is 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 in the ballpark of around a hundred thousand dollars a year for about eighty employees, 
Yes, it's uh, a month. That's a, that would be per month. That is per month. Yes, absolutely. That's a per month cost, and uh, uh, the, the number is, is is pretty much on target. And I, if, yeah, I would anticipate the possibility. I'm sorry, Alan. I would anticipate the possibility of retirements. I don't know if we could. I don't know if we're in a position. The city's in a position to do a retirement incentive or golden handshake. But certainly, if someone is at the point where they're thinking, you know what, I've been thinking about retiring. Maybe this is the right time to do for the good of the organization. I recommend it. Being a retired school teacher, I recommend it. <laughs> And that might help with the reductions in retirement as uh, re reductions in layoffs as well. The, okay, comments. Alan, I'm sorry I interrupted you. So, Mr. Mayor, first of all, I, I think uh, I'm in alignment with what you uh, just said. I, I think uh, I'm feeling very similar. I do want to make a statement that um, I think the city manager and the HR director communicated, but I think it's important for us as council members to communicate, which is that we very much value the work that all of our city employees do. We value the work of the city employees who are being considered for um, temporary layoff. Uh, the service that they provide to our community is essential it may not be labeled essential by the county health officer but the work that our librarians provide to young people to senior citizens to people of low income and to everyone in our community the people that work in our health center or in our sports center helping our community stay healthy, the work that our community center employees do, it's all very, very important. And uh, I think that is something that I really want to echo. And I was glad to hear the city manager and the HR director also deliver that message. And I know every single council member and you, Mr. Mayor, feel the same. I just wanted to, to make that statement. The fiscal crisis we're facing is it it is it is very very serious, and um, I, I can't imagine contemplating layoffs under any other circumstance. If we were talking about an annual loss of a million or two million dollars, personally, I would immediately be saying, let's look to our 16% reserve or $13 million reserve, emergency reserve. But the 10 million we're already looking at is just for three and a half months of this fiscal year. We don't know what the future holds, but personally, I think that the recovery is not going to be as fast as we would like, especially here where we're so dependent on tourism. And so we're gonna need some of that reserve to get us through the next year and possibly the year or two after that. Um, that's my fear. And so as much as I would like to hope for the best, we really do need to plan for the worst because once we spend one-time money, and we're spending one-time money from our capital improvement funds and our mm -hmm. funds to cover this initial deficit spending, uh, but but then looking into the future, you know, those one-time funds only go so far. So I, I think we need to support the staff recommendation, mm -hmm. but I do also support the idea that through negotiations, we can um, possibly reduce the position list and or possibly extend healthcare benefits. I think we also, though, we don't wanna presume what the employee groups are gonna need. I think we need to just direct staff to negotiate with them, bring us back 
some of the ideas that emerge out of negotiations at our, our subsequent meetings. Um, but I certainly am open and I understand I, and believe from the bottom of my heart that healthcare is a human right, that healthcare should not be dependent on your job, that this horrible crisis highlights why this is so problematic and that there's nothing worse than losing your job and then potentially being hit with a expensive healthcare emergency that you now don't have healthcare for. So yes, I, I agree with everything that you said, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I will now listen to what our other council members have to say. Well, in the words of Chris Cuomo, amen, brother. <laughs> yeah, it, we just, that, that would be the most frightful thing to be. You don't have health insurance. Can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in? Uh, yeah. Mr. Uh, yeah. So um, as it's been said already, uh, this uh, what's in front of us is a in large measure very difficult. Uh, these are people that we're talking about in the positions. Um, as you all know, I left the city in 2006 when I retired and many of the folks that uh, are still here, I, I know them and I know their stories and I know their families. And this is not an easy decision. Um, and and I'm, I'm lifted with my spirits a bit because I hear the city manager uh, has some, some positive approaches in terms of labeling this a uh, temporary layoff. Uh, we all hope that we will get out of this quarantine soon. We'll see things open and we'll see um, our friends and neighbors come back to our community and start to, to do the things that Monterey can serve so well and have folks spend money and come here and spend money and buy things and stay in hotels and go out to eat. Uh, all of those things are exceptionally important for our city to be healthy and to be sustainable. Um, at its core, I think our city manager has it absolutely right when we have to define what is the absolute essential services. And he's provided us a list tonight. If you look through the list of uh, the CIP we're going to get to soon uh, from the uh, NIP, um, it's described as essential. Uh, these employees that are earmarked for position layoffs um, right now, because there is no job for them to go to because the building is closed. I think the way the city manager outlined it was exactly right. Um, the employees are willing and they're able. They just don't have a place that they can go to work because the governor has said, we are not released from our quarantine yet. That will be phase one once we're released from the quarantine and we see uh, how we open back up and provide those services in a scaled manner. So those employees that can be brought back after this temporary layoff, our city manager has identified how important that is and that that's his priority. And uh, I'm pleased to hear that that's uh, what's in his head and in his heart. Um, we have to constantly think in terms of a change paradigm. We've read several of the staff reports. Uh, we've been watching the news since this started to emerge in um, early January and then grew to February and then March and then we were quarantined. So we all do the same thing and we watch news all day long looking for snippets of uh, improvement. Um, I didn't ask the question of the city manager tonight of uh, a question that gnaws at me and would gnaw at any leader and that's if I ask what are your greatest vulnerabilities for you and your team? And I think the city managers laid that out for us. And so I think we need to keep that in mind because we still are very, very vulnerable uh, in the coming weeks and months. So the decision we make tonight, I hope it's the last decision we have to make that's on the layoffs and the timed callbacks to get people back to work. But because we're in the period of an unknown, uh, we, we have to look at the lessons of the past, and the city of Monterey had those in 2008. Um, my background in emergency response systems tell me that you better pay attention to the emergencies 
because if it's unknown, you can't see it, and you go around the corner and you look and you see a different perspective. So we've got the right staff to help us get there. I've got a lot of confidence in the entire team. We've heard from many of them tonight. And I look forward to this being a positive news in the coming weeks. But at the back of my head, we have to keep saying, let's not overcommit yet because we don't know what our vulnerabilities are yet because we don't know how bad this can be. I'm an optimist. I hope it gets better quickly. Um, but we must, under all conditions, make sure our city remains solvent. And the only way we do that is we preserve our rainy day fund for the last possible time and preserve that asset. And that's the last thing we spend. And we hope that we don't have to go beyond the number of layoffs we're talking about tonight. Um, I like the scaled up approach. I like the phased approach. I think the city manager and his team has got it right. And I can agree with the mayor. Um, but I think we do, do need to get into negotiations and allow our staff to be able to negotiate and see how much there might be available because of givebacks or reductions in contracts with our groups that are going to negotiate. And that's an unknown dollar tonight. And so we need to give our staff a little bit of time to do that. I feel uncomfortable tonight committing to an exact number of months for medical insurance, although I totally agree that that is extremely important and probably the number one thing in negotiations with our groups. Um, but I can't support a number of months until I hear more information from the city manager. But that's a concept that I agree with. And I think that we'll we'll find a way to do that with the available money that we'll save through the negotiations, I believe. But that's all I have. Okay, uh, other comments? Tyler, you wanna go or you want me to go, Tyler? I'll go ahead and, and jump in. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna go a little bit of a, a different direction. Um, I, I'd really like us to consider uh, taking a good hard look at at alternative measures we can take to support the essential services in our in our community um, that are quite often utilized by the most vulnerable in our by the most vulnerable in our community. Um, so when we're talking about looking at alternatives, some of the questions that come to my mind is, um, you know, going back to some of those vacant positions. Um, can we first consider a voluntary hour reduction furlough program? Um, what about furloughs as opposed to layoffs? What other means of savings are there prior to determining these drastic cuts? How much savings is, is there from the proposed executive salary cuts? Um, how much savings from utilities, um, from removing other items in the budget like equipment, vehicles, and supplies? Um, Regarding the sports center, could we offer individuals an opt-in option to maintain their membership payments to the city? I know we've been making reimbursements to that. Um, how about a temporary ban on overtime? Um, um, I, I wonder if how much collaboration there is with Friends of Monterey Public Library to host a fundraiser to see um, how much, I mean, these are obviously, I think the theme of what we're hearing tonight is that even if we, look at all these um, creative ideas and solutions that they won't get to the core of, of the problem. And, and I hear that and I, I understand that the comments that the rest of my colleagues are saying, um, I would just say that we found out as a council the first time last Wednesday, it hasn't even been a week. And here we are less than a week making a decision, which I know that we have to move fast. I know that we're in unprecedented times um, but I'd really like us to consider at least engaging in a dialogue, having <laughs> communication with our with with our personnel, our Monterey family, our employees, before we actually make that decision. Um, I would even say, why can't we come back next week, next Wednesday, have a special meeting, um, and give the negotiation team time to meet with the labor unit uh, um, units and have a conversation saying, hey, you know, we were looking at moving forward with this last week. 
The council's given us a week to figure out a, a, a good solution. And so that can be part of the pressure um, um, plan. Um, and we can still stick with the timelines that we have. So the council's agreed to give additional time, but we're not going to push the goal line as far as the layoffs if we don't come up with a solution that's effective enough to get us to where we need to get to. Um, uh, the, the argument regarding the cuts is uh, due to the uncertainty in the, economic, e the economics of the future. Part of my concern is why are we approving recovery program, whether it be the emergency housing payments or the local stimulus program, these payments may be wasted if companies go out of business or a tenant ends up moving out. Um, we're doing it to create some level of certainty. So why can't we do the same for our city services? Um, if we end up choosing to move forward with the layoffs, um, I, this, I, I guess I'm a little bit concerned about there being some ambiguity around um, what happens if the shelter in place is lifted between now um, and between now and when the shelter in place is lifted. Um, uh, I imagine that due to the impacts of the, the economy, that just because the shelter in place is lifted and we open back up the sports center and the library um, and all these other um, brick and mortar places that we, that we operate, that we're not necessarily going to bring back all of our employees on. So uh, it sounds great to say that it's a temporary layoff and I think the intent is good, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee. And I think that we can get lost in the communication here. Um, I also think it's important that the council maintain the authority to bring positions back online. I, again, it's, it's no, nothing personal. Um, and I don't think that, I'm not saying that our city manager isn't capable of doing that. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, I think he would do a great job. But as so, as much as I appreciate staff's leadership and willingness to take that burden, we're the ones making the decision at the end of the day, and everybody is watching how this will uh, how this will really turn out. Uh, if it ends up that we won't be bringing back all the positions, that has to be on us as a council to take that burden on. And I don't want to leave that on Hans. Um, you know, part of my experience in having to deal with this crisis is we're giving up a lot of power to Hans to operate. And I think rightfully so. He's the operator. He's able to make things happen quickly. Um, and that was the right choice for us to do that. Um, but I think that as much as he's stepping up, we as a council need to step, step up too. And so if that means we need to have more frequent meetings and special meetings to make that decision to reinstitute some positions, let's do that. But I think we need to step forward here and be a little bit more engaged. So uh, in conclusion, um, I'd propose we look at how our staff can respond to a voluntary partial furlough model. Um, I'm, concerned, I'm concerned about our response to the, to the COVID-19 impact. What services do we lose from laying off these employees? Are we going to lose some folks that are part of our Monterey family? So if we, if we, um, if we lay them off, are we going to lose the quality service that we're receiving from these people that we have now um, and what kind of impact will that what kind of implications will that have uh, moving down in the into the future um, I prefer to see a first attempt at alternatives be before we cut straight to layoffs labor groups didn't hear about this until late last week it's been less than a week with little discussion of solutions um, how we communicate about our response to the economic crisis is just as important as the response itself. Regardless of how we move forward, we need to make sure our decision making in the future is inclusive of the need to expand local industries that are driven by changes in the workforce. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing and why we're having to take a reaction before we see other communities taking uh, a drastic reaction as so soon is because we're so dependent upon the hospitality industry. And I appreciate the partnerships that we have with the hospitality industry, but this really goes to show that we really need to find ways of expanding the industries that we are trying to make in our city so that we're not so dependent upon one industry and having to take these types of actions. I think the economy, after this um, issue passes, 
the economy is going to continue to see volatility when we experience issues into the future. Um, so anyways, I'll, I'll end it there. I, I um, am, am interested in hearing what the feedback is from my colleagues based off of my statements. And let's see how the rest of this conversation goes. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Tyler. And um, Mira, is that okay? Can I go now? Yes, please, Council Member Dan, please. Thank you. Um, it is late, and uh, I'm not going to make my comments uh, uh, lengthy. I'll just try and make a few points uh, because I've heard a lot of really good discussion tonight and really good comments from our from our, our own council. Um, I've been through layoffs, just like um, uh, Mayor Robertson's been through layoffs, quite a few, as a matter of fact. Uh, 600 in 1994 when Fort Ord closed, uh, yeah. 600 pink slips. And whenever you give any pink slips or whenever you give any layoff notices, all of a sudden the tension uh, arises in that employee dramatically. And I wouldn't want to give, uh, I wouldn't want to raise that um, anxiety if those uh, layoffs don't happen. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is that we don't really know how long the shelter in place is going to be. And, um, and I'm, I'm nervous that we uh, give layoffs and then uh, things start to turn around and now we have to go back and rehire those employees because I've been through that and it's not, that's not a fun thing to do at all, uh, trust me. So uh, I wanted to comment a few things on uh, what Tyler said and uh, that was the, the the speed of how this came forward to us. I mean, this is a big decision, folks, for the city of Monterey. It's huge, and um, I, I think that um, if if it if it's if it's part of our contract that we we don't need a full thirty days, um, and that we could still get things done on June second, I personally would like to take in all this information we got tonight. And I, I personally like to, to wait until the next council meeting and uh, make my decision. That's, that's, my, that's my, my own opinion, uh, because I have gotten a lot of information tonight, not only from the, the staff, which was great information, but also from uh, people from outside in the community. So for me, uh, I, I would like to see this uh, uh, put off for uh, at least another um, until the next uh, council meeting. That's my first statement. The second statement is that um, I, I understand, uh, I'm smart enough to figure out that when you close facilities and you have to reduce labor because there isn't a need there. And, and I get that. You can't hire employees in a building that's empty. So I, I definitely understand that and I agree with that. However, um, what, what really worries me is the reopening of these, of these facilities. Um, I would like to see when they do reopen that we hire all the employees back the minute it's reopened. Uh, so if you have a conference center uh, that's reopened and, and ready to go, it shows our employees that we're all set, ready to go and move into the next phase. And, and so uh, same with the, the conference center, I mean, the, the, um, uh, the, the sports center and the library. So for me, uh, I would hate to see what would happen in, back in 2008, where we bring these employees back very slowly, and before you know it, we're not actually fully staffed. I would like to see us fully staffed as soon as uh, the uh, shelter in place is, uh, is taken off so that we can show our employees and everybody that we're ready to go back to work. As a matter of fact, I, I'm almost to the point where uh, I want to see uh, something in an emotion that says that we are going to uh, rehire all the layoff employees as soon as those buildings open up. I know that's difficult. I understand that, but that's just that's I feel that very strongly. That's it, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Ed. Alan, final words. Yeah, uh, thank you. All good comments from all the council members. Um, it's a tough vote. We've heard great information from our staff, but I'm, I'm compelled to, to be concerned about the today loss, that we're looking at the, the large number that can't be made up. And I think we heard it from Rick Hoyer tonight who called in 
who reminded us he laid off folks three weeks ago. That's the same story I'm hearing everywhere. As you know, I go out of town and I have classes and they've all been postponed. And what I'm hearing is government is not going to authorize travel for a long time. All cities and all governments are going to be reeling for quite a while. We've had conferences canceled for the remainder of the year. So we know the conference center has very little business right now. So why would we be talking about bringing them back even when the quarantine's lifted unless we know we have conferences? Same thing for the sports center. We, we won't know what happens until we open the doors and we see what kind of response we get from the consumer's confidence to go out. And that's a key factor we haven't talked about tonight. Um, but I think we need to be cautious because we have identified a $10 million shortfall between now and June, and June's right around the corner. Um, as I mentioned, we've got 40 days for our staff uh, to get to the June 2nd mark. And this next couple of weeks are very critical for negotiations to determine what opportunities there are to uh, possibly lessen some of the layoffs or make some compromises with the labor groups. But aside from all those other suggestions, um, Tyler, they're great suggestions in a perfect world when you don't have an emergency. But when you've got the, the roof on fire and the floor is unstable and you have no assurance that there's additional revenue coming, we have an emergency that we need to recognize. And that's not handled by anything other than personnel cuts, sadly. Um, from every training I ever had and all of my leadership classes going way back, um, cuts are not made by paper, paper clips or cutting back in a few programs or uh, minimizing some of the hours uh, on employees. That would be great if we only had a $2 million deficit. We have a $10 million deficit right now. So the only way you make that up is by personnel layoffs. And we hope it's temporary and we bring them back as soon as we can. My frame of mind says we have to work this emergency through and it's been identified clearly for us. Um, to delay and to pretend we can be in status quo is a dereliction on our leadership abilities. And I think we have to act now, let our staff get into negotiations. And the next two weeks when we have our next council meeting, uh, we'll have a little bit of good news in terms of what the, the groups are willing to give up. And maybe the, uh, the number of layoffs won't be 84, maybe it'll be 75, I don't know. But we need to give the tools to the leaders that are in charge of, of making these decisions. And Hans has done a good job identifying the urgency of making the decision tonight. So I don't wanna delay it. I think we need to get into authorization for negotiations and uh, get on with notifying the employees, those that are on the list of the pending um, layoff so that they can get into the next motion, which is to apply for unemployment and move towards that June 2nd date. And by May 30th, maybe we'll know better and we'll see uh, the quarantines coming off and we know that it's responding uh, better than I'm talking about now, but I don't think it's going to come back fast enough to avoid the layoffs right now. Thank you, Ed Allen. Any more thoughts? Um, yeah, I've got a few thoughts. So first of all, I appreciate the comments from my colleagues, and I, I feel exactly the same way. I mean, I, I don't want to make this decision tonight. Okay. Um, I think it's a decision that ideally should be, we, sh we should have consensus on. So if people need more time, then I'm prepared to give more time to uh, the employee groups and to the council, as long as that doesn't jeopardize our ability to ultimately protect the city's fiscal bottom line um so i kind of feel like that's where we're heading i do want to speak to a couple things as far as alternatives go i mean most of the alternatives are subject to negotiation they're subject to negotiation not with one group but in the in in, in the big picture 
it all depends on what every group is willing to do. We heard from our HR director that if we wanted to avoid all layoffs, it would really take a 20% pay and cut from every employee. I don't think that's likely to happen. I mean, I'm going to be correct. You have some employees who right now are working and working really more than they normally would, and they're putting themselves in danger. They're out there, our public safety office workers in particular, they're out there at risk of getting infected. It's, it's very hard to expect people to take a 20% pain cut when other people aren't able to work. They want to work. They're great workers, but they can't work. So do I think that's likely to happen? I don't think that's likely to happen. I mean, I'm actually impressed that we've had some of our management willing to give up 10% of their pay through the end of the year. We have our police lieutenants willing to talk about um, uh, voluntary concessions, but federal money, the CARE Act, I mean, it doesn't apply to us. We're not a city greater than 500,000. So that money doesn't benefit the city of Monterey at all. Will there be some future funding from the federal government? Maybe, but I wouldn't hold my breath because they don't be able to work together there very well. Um, and so then it really comes down to other concessions that we might be able to negotiate. And, um, you know, that's going to be up to the employee groups. Uh, as far as Dan, Dan made a statement about when we open, we should be able to open with every employee back. And ideally, I would agree. But I think the problem with that is when we reopen some of these facilities, some of those facilities, the services, some of them are fee for services. So are you suddenly going to have in june are you going to have people in large numbers wanting to come back and take a fitness class are you going to have large numbers of people bringing their kids for reading at the library i don't know maybe but i think there's some risk there that in fact a lot of people are going to be still concerned about covid19 and want to keep their distance and so I think in principle, I agree with you, Dan, but I don't know if it's feasible or practical or cost effective. So I don't want to make that a requirement of whatever decision we ultimately make. Um, I guess that's that's that, those are some of my thoughts. Uh, so I, I would be open to delaying this a week and let's let's hear maybe more information after negotiations begin. But but I think in the end, we've got some serious financial reality that we're going to have to face that is unlike anything we have seen before. So, Mayor, if I can just say one last thing and comment on that for a second. Um, yes, please, Alan, Council Member Dan. Thank you, Alan. What what I was what I was driving at is that when I hear people talk about programs and bringing programs back, the fear is that those programs will not come back in its entirety ever. And so, if you say that you're bringing back all of the employees to bring that that program back to life, you're you're letting the public know that we are not going to be making cuts. Um, to the programs forever. That's the only reason why I brought that up. I understand that it, it does. It's not feasible if you if you have a a, a a library where there's nobody in there and you have all your employees there. I I understand that. I just want I want the fear to go away that we're not going to reestablish all the programs that we currently have now. That's the only reason why I brought it up. Can I make a motion, Mayor? You certainly may. Can I make a motion that we table this item until the next council meeting? Can, can I offer a, an alternative, Dan? Sure. Can I? So it, it, sounds, it sounds like um, uh, many of the council members are not ready to make a decision 
tonight, and I understand it's 20 minutes to 12. Um, Hans, is there a way that we could next Wednesday, it's our normal reserved um, time, the fourth, I think it's the uh, the fourth Wednesday of the month next week, or are, yep. we, in, or are we into May? We're we're already in our one, two, three, four. It would be the it would yeah. be the fifth uh, to uh, Wednesday, but we could do it. Yeah. Could we could we do a um, special meeting uh, next week? That would give um, Allison and her staff a week to be able to identify timeline, uh, lay out some of the things that we know that her staff has to do to negotiate and get feedback from the, the groups. I'm very hesitant to delay this for two weeks. I just think that for every day that we wait, we get closer to the point of realizing that the June 2nd date is the date that seems like it it makes sense. And we're giving our employees, uh, well, as of tomorrow will be 40 days and they got notice a week ago so they've already they're on a timeline so they're they're going to have a, about a 47 day notice which is quite a long notice and we know that their insurance is extending to july 31st i'm okay with that amendment we do it in a week i'm okay with that amendment to my um, I, I think also um if i may uh, make a suggestion as well at a minimum, you need to appoint us as negotiators to open uh, the discussion as official meet and confer with the bargaining units. Uh, we cannot just meet and, and just start a pitch chat. Um, yeah. I think you need to appoint us as uh, agency negotiators so that we can meet with the affected groups to discuss. Um, you need to um, make also clear, if I may suggest that, that uh, time is, is of the essence. Uh, by not adding the intended furlough to that mix, our position to negotiate um, will will be not weakened, but we will be in a different position to negotiate because uh, the clarity is not yet achieved by the council to uh, follow through eventually. So, uh, but as a minimum, I would ask that you appoint us so that we have authority to meet and confer. Um, I think that is what I heard fully, and I also heard that you were uh, asking us to do um, um, the healthcare and put this into the discussions as well. And uh, usually you would go into a closed session and give us directions, uh, but I think from what we have as an open, transparent communication, we can sit down with the employee group and employee groups and see what uh, negotiations uh, will bring and report back by Wednesday. All right, so you're suggesting as part of the motion that we would appoint uh, the city manager and HR director as our negotiators? Or would we just, uh, am I, oh, I'm sorry. I would, uh, I would appoint Ellison Hawk as the negotiator and not the city manager. Got it. All right, so I think the motion as we're crafting here, Dan, is yeah. uh, if uh, we would, uh, if if I may, can we continue this meeting to uh, Wednesday at four o'clock? By continuing it, I would uh, suggest that we take no more public comment, if we can do that if it's a continued meeting. And then secondly, that uh, as part of your motion, we would be appointing uh allison hawk is our negotiator yes i accept that and i was and i'll second that that's april 29 at, at 4 p.m yes i yeah I, I, oops, sorry mayor as part of uh we would be looking at a health insurance program to be paid by the city and one of the other things i asked that we take a look at is a review of the minimum library staffing if that could be part of that as well is that okay with the uh, maker of the motion? Yes. Okay, uh, Hans, anything else that you need for clarification on that motion? Um, Mr. Mayor, you, you uh, can you clarify uh, what you meant by the library one more time? Um, yeah. We've heard some public testimony that three people are not enough ah, okay. to carry on uh, all of the outreach, the e-work, et cetera. You got it? Yes, I got it. Thank you. 
Um, any more discussion on the motion? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the the direction that we're taking and, and I a few things. Um, I so Ed and Alan had both made comments um, after I spoke and I just want to clarify. I, I am in full understanding that this is a dire situation that we need to take drastic action on. Um, so I hope that doesn't get lost in the message that I'm trying to put out. I just appreciate the direction that this is going um, to do a little bit of a better job at making sure that we're reaching out and involving our employees in this discussion a little bit more. Um, so I, I appreciate it. Um, the only other comment that I would make is um, I'm a little bit concerned of the lack of public comment in the discussion coming back. I mean, I, I understand how easy it is for us to just make the decision today and not have to go through the whole public discourse again. Um, but what if something is different about the situation as it presents itself next week and the public has something to say, now we just lock them out when we're a public body that's inherent to what we do. So um, as much as it would be easier for us to not engage in additional public dialogue, I think that's a, I think that's an essential part of it. Actually, um, pardon my interruption. I, Councilmember Williamson, I was going to comment on that. If this existing meeting were adjourned to the new date and it was just to continue deliberations on the item that's before you, you would not necessarily need to reopen public comment. But because there's new direction being given and new information will come back, uh, the council will be required to take public comment. Okay, that's fine. And and one other aspect is, of course, uh, by uh, continuing and we create another week of um, anxiety or insecurity for employees because we cannot really uh, make a determination yet. Yes, I, and I, we may end up exactly where with the staff recommendation as presented tonight. And, and that's understood. However, I think it is a huge decision and it's well worth taking a week for uh, contemplation and so on. Yes. But, and it, Can and I just it, make one other clarification? Um, yes. The initial employees, if the decision is made next week, then we can certainly notify the initial employees on May 1st. But we would be if the layoff date then still needed to be effective um, in June, early June. Yes. We would need to be utilizing the ability to have less than 30 days notice because a number of employees who are on the initial layoff list have seniority rights to bump. Yes. Um, so they may bump employees that aren't on the initial layoff list. Those employees they may, then may have bumping rights. So we might be looking at a couple of bumping. Um, so it will take at least a week or two to figure out who the final list of impacted employees are based on bumping. So some employees might not be notified until mid-May. So I just wanted to make sure you are aware of the fact that we might need to have a smaller notification period if we maintain that June 2nd layoff date. Got and that it. might be something to consider next week. Yes. Okay. It gets more and more complicated. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Chrissy, are we okay now? Yes. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a and a second. Uh, Hans, uh, staff, Clementine, are, are we all good on what we are our direction? I'm good, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Could you please remind me who just seconded it? I can go back in the recording, but if you recall, uh, it was Ed. Ed. Thank you, Councilmember. Exactly. <clears throat> you ready for a roll call vote? Yes, we are. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. Council Member Albert? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Hoffa? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Uh, yes. How do you feel, Council? We have two more items. You want to take a little break and plow through? Mayor, I, I would um, request that we take a break. And I, I also like to point out a few minutes ago, I saw that there was a a notification that popped up that said that the recording was going to end in 15 minutes. So I think it might be good. To, I don't know if we need to end this session and restart it if if it's necessary for us to record it. Oh, uh, our, our Google uh, Meet 
time is limited. Is that Nat? Are we okay to continue or not? Yeah, yeah we're we're okay to continue. If we if we do decide to take a few minutes uh, for a break, we can stop the recording and then restart it. We do not need okay. to leave the meeting. We can just switch to Hawaiian. Do we have to vote to continue the meeting? Well, if if we uh, no, if we're going to restart and uh, uh, and and come back then we're fine. So I'm asking you, do you want to take these other two items? We could add them to our Wednesday agenda as well, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to, uh, well, I, I kind of like to get through it. I mean, I'm already wired and had coffee and <laughs> you know, what's, what's the point of continuing and loading it up next week? I think we're better off to just finish it tonight. Well, you never get tired, Ed. <laughs> well, I just it's in the middle of the afternoon for Ed. <laughs> Hey, do you have a preference one way? Does it matter from a staff viewpoint? It's the pleasure of the council. Okay. <laughs> Are we good? Uh, 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 Mr. Mayor, we, we like to, of course, get something uh, um, squared away, uh, like, like the NPIP or the local economic uh, stimulus plan. But the um, the the uh, Wednesday meeting uh, can probably afford a second item if, if the council is willing to go uh, into an evening session there. But I think if we can tackle the NCIP, that would be helpful. Tonight, you mean? Yes, sir. And then the final item we would look at Wednesday night. Yes, Next sir. Wednesday. Yeah. All right, let's do that. We'll come back here in about eight minutes at high high midnight, and we'll, we'll tackle that one more item. Okay, everybody? Okay. All right, we'll see you shortly.
then let's go. No. All right, but we'll welcome back and we're going to take up uh, item nine, and that is to transfer the NCIP money and CIP money to the general fund. Uh, for, because it's an emergency, we'll take a four-fifths vote to do that. And we've had a lot of uh, good background and input on it. And so uh, I think we'll just have a pre staff report, find out if we uh, have anyone who wants to phone in. We have received some correspondence on this. Again, I'll reiterate that we have received emails and we have studied them, read them, and we appreciate that input. So let's... Uh, Hans, if you will, you'll probably want to turn it over to our very fine public works director, but I'll let you introduce him. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, the the numbers are all ingrained into our brains now. We have repeated a couple of times uh, what our deficit is, how much we are facing between now and June 30th. Um, let me just reassure you that uh, we are very committed to, to the Neighborhood Community and Improvement Program. Um, it is a crown jewel uh, of democracy. It's a crown jewel uh, for the city of Monterey, and it still is uh, uh, the only program in the United States of America that ded dedicates uh, per char city charter 16% of the hotel tax to fund it. So that program uh, is is near and dear to all of us. Uh, we we passionately. Uh, uh, are grateful for all the accomplishments that, that we've seen in our city uh, and we are totally recognizing also our um, team members, the NCIP representatives, I mean by that, who have worked tirelessly on, a, on creating this program and filling it with life and sense, common sense and uh, creating uh, many good projects throughout our city. So I cut my, my remarks short now. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, Wednesday morning. And so with that, I punt it over to our Public Works Director, Steve Wittry, who will um, talk about uh, why we are proposing what we are proposing and what how we selected the projects in front of us. Yeah, be, uh, before you start, Steve, uh, as you know, I'm one of the founders of the NCIP along with Richard Wurcello. I'll tell you that story. You've heard it a number of times. And at the time that we put it in the charter, we did that for a reason because we wanted to make sure it, it remained a neighborhood and community improvement program. It wasn't absorbed into the capital improvement program. And at the time I can remember the meeting in about 84 or so when uh, it was recommended by the city at the attorney at the time, Bill Marsh, and probably the only one who knew him at this point, and he suggested a four-fifths emergency vote. And I, I would tell you at the time, I thought, no, I, I just not sure I want to go there, but he was persuasive. And so uh, over the 35-year history now, we've actually had to do this one and a half times. And in each case, it was difficult because we know it's such a pure program. It's uh, it's Athenian in, in that it's, it generates from the people themselves and goes, uh, who are at the top of the pyramid, and it goes down to the decision makers. And it was, uh, so it, it's something I've been super protective of over the years. I've attended a lot of the meetings. I'm extraordinarily grateful to all of the people over the years who have been NCIP members. And I realize um, when they say these projects that backlog projects, so to speak, I think that's probably where people have the most uh, questions is we know they've put in a, a great deal of time to get those projects formulated, passed through the staff, neighborhood buy-in, <clears throat> funding, and then, and they're important to them, very important to them. And so we understand that every project that is presented is super important uh, to a particular neighborhood. So I'm just gonna add my sense of gratitude to our NCIP members and until you ask the founder, uh, it's something that I, I'm very protective of. But I, once again, we're not the enemy. It's COVID-19 is the enemy. And we're in the most unusual circumstances. We think we were going to face a pandemic that would close down the United States and the entire world. No. 
So it's it's unusual times. So there's a tiny bit of history, and you said, I've heard that all before, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> okay, Steve. <laughs> that was a great intro, and, and I'll let uh, Nat to help me with the with the uh, the display here. He's got better skills with that process than I do, and you know, at uh, 12 o'clock at night, he's going to do much better than I could go through that process. Um, let's go ahead and go to the first slide, and, and really what this first slide speaks to, uh, Mr. Mayor, is exactly what you're talking about. These are um, you know, unprecedented times, and, and, and there's a lot of heart and, and heartache that went into getting these um, these items on the list. And I wanted to clarify for council and for the public what the actions do for us and what it does not do. Um, this item does transfer the 2021 fiscal year funding and suspends this year's NCIP project planning cycle. Uh, that's kind of was a, was a given, and we had kind of had a lot of conversation with different people about that process um, that that would be happening. The second thing that this item does is it asks to deappropriate funding from various CIP and NCIP projects to provide operational funding for the city of Monterey to get us through this time. Um, there have been a, some, some letters that have come through that, that assumed other things would happen by this process. Um, this item does not eliminate current projects that have been approved. The projects will stay on a list. They are there, they are approved, they are on the list, they are just not funded. And there's actually been some folks who have started, we've heard some things that this was going to eliminate the NCAP program in its entirety. And that's simply not the case. It, it's putting a pause button on the program so that we can make sure we have funding to keep the city solvent and move the city forward in a positive manner. Steve, Next on that, it would take a, a, a vote of the people to eliminate the NCIP because it is in the charter. Exactly that's correct. Very exactly reasonable. correct. And like I say, that's, there's there's been a lot of conversation that had come to my office about people concerned about the program and, and what we're trying to do and we are in no sense of trying to disband anything it's just a process that we have to do uh, uh, to make ourselves um, get through the next next little while here go in next slide now so basically what staff did was look at the projects that we have on the books right now and try to identify how we can move forward and identify what projects could be um, um, defunded for, for this emergency. Really what we did is look at four, four criteria. criteria. Um, only one of the criteria needed to apply to have it move to the essential list. Uh, under construction, if we had a project that's currently under construction, we have contract liabilities that we don't want to get into and end up costing ourselves more dollars. So if a project was under active construction, it's on the essential list. Mm -hmm. If a project is required by a grant that's already received, we want to make sure we don't lose those dollars. An example of that would be the Casa Verde, Del Monte uh, a traffic improvement situation there where we have about uh, $850,000 of grant money that's being supported by the local match by the NCAP. We certainly don't want to jeopardize those dollars um, for, by eliminating a project or its status. Regulatory, to, regulatory compliance. If a project has... A component that's necessary by regulations we want to make sure that goes through so we don't find ourselves in the hot water with different aspects uh be it the um water board or some other or other uh, governing agency so we want to make sure those projects move forward and projects that that will achieve public safety uh if a project is currently funded completely addressed as a document of safety issue we wanted to make sure that, that was addressed and was able to move through as well um, one other thing i wanted to mention on, on this particular slide is that um, you know we we really really value the the input from the NCAP committee um, and as we move through these processes if, pro if a project didn't stay on the um, the, the funded list uh, we will look to the NCIP committee for recommendations of how to bring those projects back when the cycle does return when funding returns to normal and to get some direction from them for priorities for those projects that have stayed on that list uh, just the funding was was removed. So that is key to our, our process moving forward. Uh, go over the next slide, Nat. Thank you. Uh, so here's a breakdown of, of what we've come up with for the process. Uh, from the Capital Improvements Program, we're looking at uh, nine projects to be closed or eliminated uh, and four projects for reallocation. Reallocation will take a different funding source to get those, those, those pushed through. An example of a reallocation for that would be what we acted on earlier tonight was the um, uh, Franklin Street pavement with SB1 funding. 
those SB1 funds will help us offset general fund dollars that were allocated for paving, and that way we can move that project forward and still perform that important work, but free up the general fund component. Moving to the NCIP projects, um, we have 26 projects that are ready to be closed anyway. They were completed, they were ready to be closed, and they, they will come off of our, our books and the funding will be returned to those um, and, and balanced out. There's four projects that, that were there as contingency, and NCIP contingency funds, which had a substantial balance in it. Um, and we're proposing to, or suggesting, that we reduce that balance and bring it down to about $100,000 from its current level of about $800,000. Um, property acquisition projects, uh, we're looking at those to be deappropriated as well for the time being while we can free up those dollars to, to bring those into city operations. Um, we're suggesting that 93 projects be placed on hold uh, and deappropriated. Uh, there's a little star there next to that aspect of it. Because if we place a project on hold, we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of any spent dollars that we have and putting them to a place where they can be put on a shelf and picked up again without losing a lot of effort. An example of that would be a project in the Don Dobby area where we have one more uh, environmental uh, cycle to look at for uh, uh, an animal to make sure that we haven't uh, got its, its nesting season. We want to make sure we spend those dollars, they're little dollars, but spend those dollars to make sure our environmental document can be complete so that when funding is returned to that particular project, we can pick it up and construct as opposed to uh, trying to restart some environmental process. That would be our habit for all those 93 projects to make sure they're in a place where they could be picked up when funding is returned and when the NCAP committee agrees that it's the time to go forward with that particular project. Then we have 66 projects that remain active and will proceed for completion those are the ones that met one of those four criteria from the slide previous. Um, it's a short presentation. It's a lot of uh, um, it's a lot of pressure with this. It's been a very long night, a very emotional night, and there's a lot of emotion that comes from the NCAP process as well. But this is kind of where we sit um, with this particular uh, recommendation. All right, that concludes your uh, presentation. Yeah, sure. yeah, that concludes. It's, it's pretty short and sweet. The 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 idea is is like like the report identifies is to identify uh, uh, about ten point six uh, that we could bring towards the city uh, operations funds. All right, thank you, uh, Nat. Are, do we have anyone um, who is uh, some of our very uh, our stalwart souls who are still with us and want to make public comment? Yes, we do. Uh, well, first public comment uh, will come from uh, extension or uh, 1532 is the number. So we'll go ahead and unmute them now. Okay, Welcome. thank you. You're live. Good evening, City Council. My name is Kimberly Craig. I am the president and CEO of the Monterey County Business Council. I just want to first and foremost acknowledge um, and thank you for your service to our community. I recognize that we are going into the next day and very much appreciate uh, your time tonight. That being said, I'd like to say that first, um, I would like uh, to encourage the council to adopt the resolution to appropriate the, the Neighborhood and Community Improvement Program Funds and also um, transfer, be appropriate and transfer uh, the $10.6 million of capital improvement program funding um, for the general fund. Um, secondarily, and I just want to take this moment to ask the council, actually implore the council to get to item number 10, um, partially because the Small Business Administration has stalled in their funding for small businesses and this particular program, the local economic stimulus plan that the city of Monterey is putting forward tonight is an immediate funding for those mom and pops here in Monterey. And so that's just what I want to ask is that if you'll take the extra 15 minutes to get to item 10, I would very much be grateful for it for those of us that have been on the line for nearly six hours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. Put a little guilt trip on us there, huh? <laughs> Great. Our next caller uh, is Rick Hoyer, and we will uh, entertain his comments right now. Mr. Hoyer, thank you for joining us. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Rick Hoyer, I'm the NIP chairperson. Uh, and 
Uh, we have not had a meeting to discuss this, uh, so I can't say I'm speaking for the commission. I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I understand why this all is occurring. I have some issues with the process that this has been done. Uh, you should, it would have been great to have had NIP involved in this when it was first being considered. Uh, then things like projects being called for to be defunded where they're actually complete wouldn't be on the list to be defunded. Uh, also, there'd be a chance to review what is being viewed as public safety because a lot of these projects go back a long ways before any of the existing city staff and public works was there or was involved. So it would have been helpful to have been involved in that. The other thing is, is we want to make sure that as it comes time now to figure out how we're going to handle these unusual scenario of projects that are still approved but have no money that was approved, which is an open question of whether you can even have that scenario, but how that those will be go about being funded in the future, because if you recall, it's the NIP that does the first pass of what gets funded not. So I would hope that you formalize a process of how that will be so that we all know going forward. Uh, again, as I said in the earlier this evening, I don't envy the situation. It is a unique time. So I think everyone in the committee fully understands the reasoning behind all this. I said uh, the process could have been a bit better. That's all I'd have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Next caller is 3678. You're now live with the Monterey City Council. Hello, this is Kurt Tipton. I'm the uh, downtown NIT representative. I did send an email uh, earlier, but I wanted to reemphasize how much I appreciate Hans and his staff. I'm sure they're doing 16 hour days, maybe even an 18 hour day today. And also to the council and the mayor for helping us through this situation. To kind of reiterate what uh, Rick said, I'm concerned about how the funding is going to be put back into these projects. I would like to see council put a priority on refunding the projects or at least laying out how they're going to be refunded. And the other issue is <clears throat> again, it would have been nice if the NCIP would have been involved in some of these projects. Other than that, I appreciate everybody and thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Time to go to bed. <laughs> Next uh, caller is Kevin Dayton. Kevin, you're live. Hello, City Council. Kevin Dayton on. Uh, first, uh, regarding this item, uh, it's a real thing that has to happen, uh, and I'm uh, sure many people are going to be upset about it, but uh, it's an emergency situation. And uh, also, I'm uh, taking a cue from Kimberly Craig. Uh, I heard earlier that uh, 10 Number 10 might be pulled, and I, uh, I hope uh, there will be a chance tonight to talk about that because I think there may be some implications of delaying it for eight days. Uh, so I wanted to let you know there was public interest in that item still. Thank you. Great. We have no other public comment, Mr. Mayor. All right. We'll then bring it back to the council. Are you ready to for action? Questions? Uh, I would move approval of the staff recommendation. Okay, that's a motion by Councilmember Allen. We have if a second. I, I'm sorry, if I could just interject with a reminder that we do have some disqualifications and we'll need to segment the voting process um, for the deappropriation component. So, um, no, it was within 500 feet or 1,000 feet, Chrissy. I'm sorry, say again? I thought no one was within... Uh, 500 or a thousand feet uh for cip there's um multiple projects with people within 500 and a thousand feet and i have oh, them all delineated. on the cip on the ncip there's none on the cip oh okay so how are we going to handle that are we going to do every go down each d appropriated project yeah, we have a, Mr. May, we have a list of those projects which I can read out and basically you would vote in a batch and I, I would read out where uh, the the appropriate council member has a conflict and that council member would refrain from voting at that time. 
Okay, so we'll hold off on our motion then and we'll just make uh, miniature motions as we go along. Don't you love bureaucracy? Could, could and then as, as a reminder, um, for the disqualified council member to just turn off the video camera and mute the microphone, they can still continue to listen to the, that portion of the meeting and then rejoin after that vote has taken place. Okay. Um, Mayor, may I make a, a comment or a kind of question to staff before we get this yeah, process? Okay. Um, there, there were a few items and, you know, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to even do this because I think that there's a lot of tension in regards to any of the projects in the process that um, we're going through, uh, particularly so with, with members of NCIP program. Um, but I think for equity purposes, there are things that I've noticed in looking at the list of things that aren't being um, un uh, unappropriated um, that I don't see as necessarily um, essential in the, in the sense of health or safety concern. And so I just kind of want to throw those out and kind of get a sense of why do we feel like those are still valid? I, I understood from the report, the classification, um, but when we look at making sure that we're providing, just make, make sure those essential things are being provided. So let me just kind of list some of them. Um, things like the green belt fuel, that all makes sense. Yes, absolutely. There's a um, fire risk with that. Um, things like planting trees, and, and I understand that that could be touchy. Maybe the tree is essential or needed in regards to um, creating um, uh, immediate protections. But um, 145, number 145, 149, 150, 151, and 159. There's also a bike rack in there. I'm not, I don't see how that's essential. 148. Um, there's also signage in there. And I saw a couple of signage. Some of them make sense. But one, the Beautify of Sister City Park signage. I, I'm not sure if that's essential. 155. Monocito artistic seating. Um, I think all these things are great, but again, I'm not sure if that's essential. 158. And then there's turf, um, 171, 172, and then dog amenities, 174. Okay, well, let's get an answer to that. It may be because they're under construction or uh, meet some of the other criteria. Uh, Steve, did you catch those? Hey, hey, Mr. Mayor, this is the answer. Uh, those projects are under construction. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tyler, for catching us. Absolutely. Thanks, Hans, for the uh, the answer there. You're welcome. Boy, nothing gets by uh, Council Member Tyler, I'll tell you. Yep. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, Alan, I'm going to turn over uh, number one to you as vice mayor because I obviously. Uh, well, I have a conflict, whatever. Okay. Yeah, so I'll make the motion to approve uh, the proposal with respect to number one as presented here. I'll second. Roll call. I'm here. It just takes a second to get the motion down. Sorry for the delay. Um, <laughs> Councilmember Smith? Uh, yes. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Councilmember Hoffa? Yes. And Councilmember Williamson? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So on item two, uh, Chrissy, our, uh, our city attorney, doing a marvelous job, by the way. Are you suggesting that uh, each council member, if they have a conflict, just turn their camera off? Is that what you said? Correct. So um, next in line, council member Smith would turn his camera off and mute his microphone. He can continue to listen during the vote and then rejoin after the vote. All right. Okay. So uh, let's see, do we need to drag the motion that we approve the deappropriation of uh, on relative to number two. Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Any discussion? No. Roll call. Councilmember Williamson. 
Yes. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Councilmember Hoffa? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes. Okay, now I'm with three of my, okay. Here we go. And this is where Councilmember Williamson is going to turn off his microphone and his camera, but is still going to watch as a citizen. And I'll make a motion to approve the projects on item four. We have a second? Yes, second. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. Roll, please. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Hoffa. I, I saw him leave the meeting and I think that's because um, we didn't vote on number three yet. Yeah. Sorry. So, so item number three, we jumped over that with the mayor, uh, which is Vice Mayor Hoffa. Uh, my, my bad. Okay, so we did four, right? I skipped three. You know why it was cut off? Let's go back to uh, let's go back to item three, please. Then I'll withdraw my motion on item uh, four. Okay. And is that right? Yes, yep. sir. Yep. Hey, a senior millennial doesn't stay up past midnight. I do stay up past nine o'clock. I have dinner at four o'clock, you guys. <laughs> but you're doing a great job, Mayor. <laughs> you're gonna wait till you see me tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna approve. I uh, move motion to approve uh, item three. Second. All right, roll call, please. Okay, and so this is Alan Hoffa refusal. Okay, um, let's see, Council Member Williamson. Yes. Council Member Albert. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. And that's a yes for me. So uh, Alan is coming back and and now uh, Tyler's gonna take a break. Do we have a motion for item four, please? Move to approve. And they, I'll second. Roll call, please. Um, Council member Hoffa. Yes. Council member Smith. Yes. And Council Member Albert? Yes. Mayor Roberson? And a yes for me. And so on item five, <clears throat> uh, Council Member Dan's going to mute and turn off his camera. And we have a motion on item five, please. Motion to approve. I'll second. Roll call, please. Um, let's see, Council Member. Uh, yes. Council Member Hoffa? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? And that's a yes for me. Item six, as much as it breaks my heart, as I said, as the founder of this program, um, I'm going to make a motion to uh, depropriate the uh, remainder of the list. Second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Hoffa. Uh, yes, and I also want to acknowledge the mayor, uh, the mayor's leadership on this, and I, I appreciate his leadership in starting this program, and I appreciate his leadership in recognizing the necessity of this difficult vote. So, yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes, I don't want to prolong it, but uh, if the mayor is awake, thank you very much for your <laughs> And uh, it means a lot to the entire community. And uh, this will be back hopefully soon. And it, this is an emergency that we just have to do. But uh, long live this program going through the forward. And we'll get back to uh, what it needs to be and hold on to something that's near and dear to everybody. Yes, thank you. Council. Councilmember Williamson? <coughs> yes. Councilmember Albert? Yes. Yeah. And Mayor Roberson? Yes, yes, too, for me. And, um, right, and I think the comments that were made, I appreciate the comments that were made by some of our NCIP members who phoned in. 
under normal circumstances, we definitely would have referred this to the NCIP so they could have gotten into have a meeting and so on. But all, all of our meetings are, uh, they're awkward. Uh, and so we're going to very much try to, even going forward, if we're still doing teleconferencing, we will uh, take their advice and come up with a process of how to refund, how to refund these projects. So I, I thank you for that and, and apologize that it's a little bit awkward, uh, but we do value you. All right, so uh, we'll need Mr. a motion. Mayor, regarding number 10, I, I know it's late. I have to teach a class at 9.30 and I haven't made the exam yet, to be honest. Yes. I really think the timing of it is so important that um, uh, I think we can do it quickly. I'm hopeful we can do it quickly and okay. I'm willing to stay another 15 minutes to get it done if, if we can. Thank you, appreciate that. Let's get items. Did we vote on item seven, please? And we need a motion and a second. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, roll call, please. Okay, Council Member Yes. Council Member Albert? Yes. Council Member Williamson? Yes. Council Member Hoffa? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes. And again, that's really painful for all of us, and we appreciate our NCIP and all our neighborhoods realizing once again, that the COVID-19, uh, it's its devastating. It's the word of the night, isn't it? Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, we're willing to tackle number 10. Back in the day uh, and when I was the mayor the first time, we often went to 2 a.m. We were doing a lot of hotel reviews and approvals. 2 a.m. Then, Alan, try this. Then you're going to school. You're going to do that tomorrow. You're going to be hitting your computer with all those students going, Professor, Dr. Hoffa, Dr. Hoffa, wake up. <laughs> I need you. <laughs> Thanks for their willingness to tackle this one. Okay, Hans, short and brief because I don't think it's too controversial. Yeah, thank you so much. When I was a student at the university, uh, we, we were part of a student parliament and our tactic was to outset the professors who fell asleep at 12 and after midnight, they didn't know what they were voting on, and uh, we usually got what we wanted as students. So with that, uh, uh, Lauren. We uh, know, Hans. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, the professor always knows. <laughs> Lauren, uh, if you go ahead, please. Yes, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. To be asleep, you know that. <laughs> I've got some very brief slides for those that are watching, and we'll keep it very brief and turn it back to the mayor. Thank you. <laughs> so um, tonight I'm very pleased to be the bookend of this evening's meeting, um, ending with a positive note about creative, innovative ideas in partnership regionally. The Local Economic Development Plan, LES, LED, um, I think it's supposed to be stimulus plan. Sorry, I was too tired when I typed it today. Um, so, <laughs> so this is a response to COVID-19. Um, it speaks to one of our core value drivers, which is economic vitality. Um, and we're going to talk about the principles real quickly. Primarily, it's to augment federal and state funding, to focus on small businesses, and utilize non-general fund revenues. Our value driver here is to ensure economic vitality so that we have sufficient revenues to support the quality of life and municipal infrastructures required physically and for human purposes. We are um, encouraged by the amount of one-time infusion we can put into this program. It's a million dollars, half a million from the Tidelands Fund and half a million dollars from the Parking Fund, both of which are non-general fund revenues and reserves. Importantly, also, is that if we're successful, we will be successful in um, retaining local businesses. Those local businesses will generate revenues that will then contribute back into the Thailand and the parking fund. So in many ways, we see a very good nexus to using these resources for economic stimulus. Objectives. Importantly, is that we're augmenting the federal and state aid. We're hoping that our finances will supplement city businesses. 
and support small businesses, reduce business closures, reduce workforce layoffs, sustain our local economic base, and importantly, our city character, and stimulate an early economic recovery in conjunction with the state and the federal government. We want to make sure everybody understands we're going to help all business sectors, not just focus on the hospitality industry. Partnership, it's really important for us to share our expertise, increase our reach, expand our network, and jointly share efforts regionally. We've mm -hmm. been partnering very closely with the chamber. We are also partnering with the Community Foundation of Monterey. We're hoping to bring other regional stakeholders into this effort. We're very hopeful that in coming forward with a million dollars in partnership with the Community Foundation, which has over a million dollars on this effort, it may motivate more regional financing and responses um, to a local economic stimulus response plan. We want swift actions because businesses are closing as we speak, massive layoffs have happened and furloughs, and so each and every day matters. In the resolution before you is this implementation plan. The LESP city team will be the city manager, the mayor, and the vice mayor. Tonight, if you so approve, this team will be working in partnership with the community foundation to achieve these specific outcomes. Develop the program, implement the program, have application reviews and selection, disperse funding, and in the end, have ongoing maintenance, monitoring, and reporting. So what we're hoping for is that you'll approve the resolution, appropriate the funding, authorize the team, and if you so wish, provide some broad guidance. I emphasize broad guidance because I do believe that the team members involved, not only in the designated team tonight, but also in collaboration with our partners with the Chamber and the Community Foundation, have decades of experience to make this successful. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Lauren. Any questions for Lauren at this point? Yeah, I just have two questions, Lauren. If, uh, I think this slide said it, but I just want to make sure this is for only cities, uh, businesses within the city of Monterey? Correct, correct. So our portion of this program will only be for the city of Monterey. Community Foundation will have its portion and it can distribute those foreign funds more broadly. Okay, so th they would, if they get funds for other areas, and then they would fund uh, other businesses. Exactly. All right. And the last thing is, what what are the sizes of the businesses? It can it can get can it be a very large business, or is there any? Oh, you're going to come up with that program. Never mind. It's too right. Late. Right. Too so we're asking for broad guidances from the council and leaving that level of detail for the collaboration. Never mind. I I just wasn't watching. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> late. Mayor. <laughs> Follow up on that. Yes, Council Member Tyler, please. I agree with um, the group being formed for the development, um, but I would request that it come back to Council for implementation. And part of why I say that is um, I have a lot more questions in regards to the program, and I, I would like to be um, aware of what those those elements that are associated with it um, prior to us moving forward with it, and so. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that we can get support on. Um, I, I would like to see the program before agreeing to um, fully moving forward with it. I don't want to create more bureaucracy and delay, but um, I think it's important for us to make that decision collectively. The, I have no problem with that. So The, the idea was, um, uh, frankly, to uh, eliminate uh, uh, overly bureaucratic process-oriented uh, application of those funds. And that's why we felt by putting the mayor and vice mayor into that committee uh, and relying on the community foundation who has the program already set up and successful running, that we have a balance for that as well. And uh, we felt it's important to, to basically um, get that those fundings out as soon as possible. Having said that, I just wanted to explain what our rationale was for the checks and balances that Councilmember uh, Williamson uh, just um, talked about. So, just FYI. And, and I would yeah. just we can do it at the point where if we have a program, we'll just uh, we can copy it to the council, 
and and uh, let you know what's going on. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, the, the idea basically is, if I may just say, we don't want to re, uh, reinvent the wheel. The Community yeah. Foundation has a successful program. They have a selection committee. For us, our job is to ensure that, that they are playing by their roles and piggyback with the Community Foundation. So that's, that's actually all what we are doing. Um, and again, it's at the pleasure of the council how much they, they like to be involved. Okay. Well, I didn't realize it was piggybacking on a program, so maybe that will raise uh, Tyler's comfort level on that. Well, if, if we're just piggybacking off of another program, it would it would have been good to know what that program looked like, I think, a little bit more specifically, if that was the case. Sure. This is the program that currently runs under the COVID-19 relief program by the Community Foundation. But, uh, like I said, uh, I'm... I'm uh, Happy to, to come back and explain it more. Okay. Um, so, Mayor, if I, I might add, I think that there is a, a, a bit of an urgency in getting this into the pipeline. Uh, I think under uh, Dan Baldwin's group at the Monterey Foundation in the chamber, the criteria is there. I think uh, we do want to know what the criteria is, but I think that if we delay this, this has the potential of, of, of causing some very um, heavy hardship for some small businesses in town that are still waiting for COVID-19 under CARES and may likely not get anything for months. This has an opportunity to get something uh, fairly quickly and to avert layoffs or closures of small businesses. So I, I would love it if we could push this to the mayor and the vice mayor and the city manager uh, to get faster action because there are small businesses out there that are in desperate need of relief to save uh, jobs and stay open. Thank I'm you. Wondering if maybe we can just, um, as part of the motion, commit to updating the council on actions that are taken and and uh, update them on the protocols for the allocations. No, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. All right. Do we have public comment, Nat? Anyone been waiting? Yes, we do. Uh, we have a few, in fact, and uh, we'll start off with uh, Rick Hoyer as our first uh, public comment. Rick, you're now live with the Monterey City Council. Greetings, Mayor and City Council. Rick Hoyer. I'm a business owner in the city of Monterey and a resident. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, I question whether this program will really be able to make a difference. Uh, the impacts are so large on the small business and the amounts that are needed are so large. Uh, this money is going to go so fast that I don't know how many businesses you're actually going to realistically be able to help. Or on the flip side is the amounts are going to be small, so small to get spread it out as far as possible. It's not really going to help at the end of the day. Would the money be better spent doing something to help promote the city of Monterey so we can make sure that the tourism that drives a lot of these businesses as their lifeblood comes back as fast as possible so that when things do reopen, they have the ability to generate as much revenue as possible. It would have been nice to know what the program is that the Community Foundation has so we can look at it and see and evaluate it. From my standpoint as a business, I probably would not be applying. I was lucky I applied for CARES and I've actually been funded through the PPP CARES program. So, but that ran out of money in about seven days, and that was three hundred billion dollars. That's how bad things are. So, uh, I applaud you for trying to do something. My question is, will it really do anything? Thank you. Our next public comment comes from Frank Geisler. Frank, you're now live. Good morning, um, Mayor and uh, Council Members and staff. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Frank Geisler, CEO of our residence at Chamber of Commerce. And I'm, I'm very, very pleased to report to you that we've been working on this now for uh, several days in partnership with the city and also with the Community Foundation. So there is a grant committee that's already been established. It's made up of uh, community leaders. There is a development committee that's also been established and that will formulate uh, together a set of guidelines and a protocol to administrate the grant request. Um, 
with with the best uh, within the best availability of time and present those approved to ratification to your designated representatives. I think the important thing to remember also is that Dan Baldwin has uh, done a similar thing uh, while he was in Iowa when there was a disaster there. He was able to actually execute such a program together with the local chamber and was able to distribute about $3 million at that time to small businesses. This is the difference between, you know, life and death for small uh, businesses. I think that uh, it will be very, very important to maintain the small business community that will support um, the, the hospitality industry when the when the tourism depends. It will be really important to have them, you know, support the uh, the activity and to support the uh, the tourism. Because let's say that somebody goes to the aquarium and everything is a ghost town on Canary Row, uh, chances are that they will not return or that this uh, will spread like wildfire, that uh, this is a ghost town. So I think it's really critical to support our small business and to not uh, participate in the collapse of the small business, uh, business community in our region. So I appreciate your, your efforts. Uh, the chamber is, supports the activity of uh, analyzing all the grants and uh, work in conjunction with uh, with you and with community foundation there are no fees from the foundation they waive all fees and uh, we certainly would like to see this coming through really quickly i appreciate your help thank you okay thanks frank thanks for staying up so late our next caller is kevin dayton kevin you're on the call Oh, Kevin, we already heard from him. Okay, so I guess he's he raised his hand twice, perhaps. Yes. Uh, let's uh, hear from Kimley Craig. Kimley, good morning. Uh, Kimberly already had a shot at this one. <laughs> Although um, that was, I was speaking on number nine and just happened to um, acknowledge that we needed to get to number ten, Mayor. So if I, I, I know Kimberly, you 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 uh, you're a, you're a council member. You get it. <laughs> I do indeed, and I will just say this. Um, I have been working uh, doggedly over the last several weeks with multiple businesses in Monterey County. Um, the SBA loans, the Paycheck Protection Plan Program, the Emergency Impact Disaster Loans have not been funded. Um, yeah. We have other cities in the county, Marina and Seaside, as well as Salinas, that are all looking at similar programs. This is not unusual, and we really ask that you support this program. It makes a lot of sense, and frankly, it will help some of those smaller businesses. So thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. Okay. Next uh, next caller is 5722. You're now live with the City Council. Hi, good morning. It's Laura Pratt again, GEM Chair and local resident. And although we all love our local businesses, our mom and pop, um, I urge you to vote no on this at this time while you're still considering layoffs of your employees, um, who are also a big part and a big driver of the local economy. And um, I, I think that this is premature, um, that you need to wait a little bit. And I noticed today that government is passing another large, I think, $480 billion package um, to address the SBA loans and things of that nature, as well as making sure that some of the larger corporations that initially took advantage of the SBA uh, and PPP programs are going to be asked to send that money back um, if they did not meet those requirements. Um, and or, or face just penalties. So there is a lot of help out there for small businesses. And uh, as a local citizen and as the GEM chair, I urge you to vote no on this at this time. We can always bring it back again at the next meeting. Um, but I think it's important to look at the big picture. It's hard to lay off 80 to 100 employees and then say, oh, we've got this million dollars for other people's employees. 
Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Right, thank you. Next uh, comment comes from Kevin Dayton. Kevin, you're now live on the call. Kevin, right. yep, are you there? Yes, Kevin, Kevin Dayton. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Kevin Dayton, Government Affairs Liaison Monterey Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. I'll just add to this that uh, many of the cities in California that have been very uh, proactive and uh, working aggressively to try to figure out how to help their own small businesses have already established funds like this. And I think Monterey is uh, among those cities which are proactively working to do things. My thinking about this is you're going to have some businesses that just aren't going to be able to apply for those SBA loans because of some of the criteria that are, that are done to do this, especially some of the little ones. And this might be your opportunity. I'm thinking this is, as you screen these applications, you're going to find some businesses probably aren't going to make it no matter what. And some of them, uh, you know, or, you know, if you don't figure those are probably going to make it. And this would be for that narrow window that the people who are going through the application are going to have to decide to say, is this money uh, here or something that would allow this business to survive that it might not survive if we don't give it? So uh, I'm thinking uh, this is uh, somewhat specialized for that type of particular business. And if you can save a few of them, I, I think it's uh, I think it's worth giving a try on it. I mean, uh, you know, somebody mentioned earlier this uh you know, this might not make a difference at all. But, uh, you know, there are people out there saying everything that the Chamber of Commerce is doing is futile because, uh, you know, it's, it's hopeless anyway. And I'm not going to subscribe to that. I think this is worth trying, and uh, it's going to change some lives out there. So I encourage you to do it. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and then we have the final uh, comment from uh, 2279. And you are now live with the Monterey City Council. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Monica. I'm going to echo what I've heard from my colleague, Frank Geisler. I also um, work at the chamber. I'm born and raised in Monterey and really appreciate the council members and your dedication to our community. Um, and I would like to say I'm on the phone all day with small businesses, many of which have won if they're lucky to employees and are not eligible for many of the large scale SBA, PPP loans, US Chamber of Commerce loans. And they would be grateful for this. This would be a lifeline. These are people who are frugal, who have reached out to their landlords, to their insurance agents, to their car loans. They're doing the right thing. They're looking at the long term and a little bridge of funds would make the difference. So I strongly encourage you to consider this seriously. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Monica. Great. And that concludes public comment. Thank Thanks, Nat. Back to the council. What is your pleasure? Um, I would move approval with the um, addendum that the, I can't remember the acronym, that the, the economic team that we're appointing will update the council on the procedures and awards that are made under this. All Second. Right. Second. And, I, and if I can, I'd, I'd like Mr. Mayor just to address a couple things. So I, I hear Laura Pratt, I, I completely, I can understand how she feels the way she does. I would just say that the reason I think this is so important is that our recovery is going to be, our recovery as a city and our ability to retain our staff is dependent on our underlying economic vitality. It's always been that way. And uh, we're seeing now with the collapse of, of our local hospitality industry in particular, but our economy in general, how dependent on it are, we are. That um, to be able to keep the services that we have, be able to keep the employees that deliver those services, we have to be able to have the businesses that generate the revenue. And so that's why I think this is so important that um, it isn't just that we're one, of course we care about the employees and those biz small business owners, 
but it's also that we care about the city staff and the city residents who depend on the services the staff deliver because we need the revenue generated by our our businesses so that's why i think this is so important rick hoyer you may be right i i i you know there's no way to predict what the ultimate impact of this decision will be but i think we have to try and um and i and i think kevin dayton hit the nail on the head that you know there are some businesses no matter what we do unfortunately are not going to make it there are others that are going to make it no matter what and hopefully we can hit the businesses in between the ones that are really on the edge that can make it but they just need a little bit of help and uh so that's why i think this is so important thank you alan uh mr mayor council member ed yeah i concur alan good points um i want to echo that also this fund is um coming from enterprise funds that are not the general fund um, we were able to get the state to agree with this concept from the Thailand's funds and the rest of it's coming from parking, not general funds. So if this was money that was coming out of the general fund, I would have a hard time supporting it because th I think this is uh, an opportunity for us to see some of those small businesses that, as has been said, did not qualify, probably won't qualify for the future uh, programs in um the CARES Act as it's modified going forward. And um, I've had conversations this week that, you know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars for a small business somewhere in Monterey could mean the difference for them to get through this and survive and have that one employee continue working and not have to give up their uh, location of business where they're contributing on their uh, business license, the sales tax, um, everything from parking to the to the impact that they make for uh, our community. So we don't want to have storefronts vacant. Uh, when we come out of this, we want to be able to be fully functioning. And the worst thing we could have would be uh, vacant businesses uh, that we've lost that we could have helped. So I, I'm supporting this and I think it's the best use of this money that's an enterprise fund money. Good, thank you. Other comments? I don't see anyone, so we'll do roll call, please. Council Member Albert? Yes. Council Member Williamson? Yes. Council Member Hoffa? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? Yes. Did we have a 5 0? Tyler, what was your vote? I was a yes. Oh, thank you. I, I know I didn't. Okay. You know, what we uh, inadvertently uh, forgot to do was to uh, deappropriate the CIP. Can that slide be put up or is it? Because we did NCIP, but we didn't do CIP, uh, evidently. Yes, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the, your task before you is to allocate uh, 1.2, 1, uh, 1,243,854 thousand dollars from the CIP back into the general fund. Is that okay. the correct number, Steve? Yeah, it is. And there was no contest on the, on the CIP. I would move that we deappropriate or reappropriate the CIP funds to the general fund as recommended. So I have public comment. Okay. Discussion? We're good. Roll call, please. We do need to see if there's any public comment. I think Tyler. Oh, was thank you. Was there public comment on that, Matt? Um, we didn't put the uh, Chiron up, but I, I don't see any public comment um, in the, during this period. So, okay. It was Eventually. part of the item when we did that public comment. So I think people had a chance. Right? Yes, we had the public comment there, and uh, we closed public comment. We just forgot to vote. Yep, got it. Uh, Council Member Hoffa. Yes. Council Member Williamson. Yes. Council Member Smith. Uh, yes. Council Member Albert. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. And I'm a yes. I, I want to thank everybody for uh, the meeting. We've had a lot of our staff members who didn't make any comments. And if we adjourn right now, we can do it at 1 a.m. 
And you said it would be 1 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, uh, with much appreciation for a really difficult uh, challenge, but I think optimistic night too, everybody working together. Uh, we're all adjourned. Have a great evening.